Chapter Seventeen of the Heel of Achilles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sir Rupert Honoret gave his secretary a great deal of work to do, but he left her free to do it in her own way and at her own time. He was very seldom in the study himself, except during the first hour of the morning's work. After that, he went off to the city. The time of his return was always uncertain and varied daily. Sometimes Lydia wondered whether his unheralded entries were occasionally made in the hopes of taking her by surprise. It was something not unconnected with this suspicion, perhaps, that made her, as soon as her work was over, generally by four o'clock in the afternoon, try to teach herself some typewriting. A big machine stood on a table in a corner of the room, and presently Lydia learned to manipulate it successfully. Sir Rupert never made any inquiries as to her progress, but the first time that she handed him a typewritten letter for signature, he scrutinized it very carefully, suggested one or two alterations in the spacing and placing of the lines, and gave her a look which she felt to be one of approval. It was a surprise to Lydia to find what a number of charitable organizations figured on the list of Sir Rupert's activities. He was on the committees of several hospitals, homes, and asylums, and a most regular visitor at one of the largest branches of the Burstall Institute. The money that he expended upon charity seemed to Lydia to be almost unlimited, and the appeals that poured in daily formed the major part of the correspondence that she was required to sort. No application was left unanswered, and all were to be filed, indexed, and elaborately referenced and cross-referenced. Lydia thought that she was beginning to understand why Lady Honoret had so glibly metamorphosed her dress expenditure into her charitable donations for Sir Rupert's inspection. Lady Honoret never penetrated to the study. She frequently sent messages by a servant to ask if Lydia would lunch with her, and these invitations Lydia always accepted. On other days, the footman brought a well-furnished tray to the study. At first Lydia was a prey to that curious terror of servants that appears to be inherent in those unused to their presence. She would arrange herself in industrious attitudes for the footman's benefit, her back carefully turned to the door by which she expected him to enter, and would scrupulously avoid looking at him while he arranged the tray on a side table or put more coal on the fire. Imperceptibly, however, Lydia's powers of adaptability made themselves felt. She said thank you to William in quite an audible voice, and one day asked for a fresh supply of ink. When William replied in a very matter-of-fact way, merely, Yes, miss, and the ink duly appeared, Lydia felt that she was really at one with her surroundings. The two pounds a week that she was earning gave her a sense of wealth, and her book went into a second edition, and continued to receive excellent press notices. She wondered whether Sir Rupert knew that he was employing as private secretary a novelist of undoubted distinction. It was only Lady Honoret and her friends who ever talked about Lydia's literary achievement. Sir Rupert, a silent man enough, only spoke to her in his dry little nasal voice about her secretarial work. Lydia, half suspicious of men after her adventure with Margoliath, half rendered so by the vague vulgarity of a hint received from Miss Forster, could not for an instant have deluded herself, even had she wishing to do so, that her employer gave even the most passing thought to her possible attractions. But the men who came to see him in his studies sometimes looked at her with less unseeing eyes. They were mostly old men, in Lydia's estimation at least, and the leering smile turned on her from time to time, or the occasional familiarity of a hand laid on her arm, afforded her but little gratification. There was a young and very good-looking clergyman, however, who once came to see Sir Rupert, and, in the midst of their long, low-voiced discussion of an East End family of Polish Jews, found time to glance at the slim figure of the private secretary, quietly writing in the far corner of the room. She was called presently to enter another appointment for him to see Sir Rupert the following week. Four o'clock on Wednesday next, then. I have no other engagement, I think. Miss Raymond? No, Sir Rupert. Put down Mr. de Merrill, the Reverend C. de Merrill, for four o'clock. Lydia made the entry, and the young clergyman looking at her said almost timidly, Thank you, Miss Raymond. His instant use of her name flattered her 
and he had a singularly attractive speaking voice, low and musical. On Wednesday, Lydia, with a half-smile at her own secretly acknowledged vanity, put on her most becoming blouse and a ribbon in her hair. At half-past three o'clock, Sir Rupert walked into the study and told her that she was free for the rest of the day and might go at once. It was the first holiday he had ever offered her. Lydia took advantage of the concession, since she could not very well do otherwise, and was in reality glad of it, but she wondered whether the good-looking young man would notice her absence. That he had done so was made evident in his third visit, when his eager gaze instantly sought the corner where she sat, and as their eyes met he smiled frankly. After that Lydia and he met frequently, although they seldom exchanged many words except one afternoon when Sir Rupert was late and Lydia had daringly offered the visitor a cup of tea. Over the intimacy of the small tea-table they had talked quite freely, and although Lydia had been a little bit disappointed at the very impersonal note maintained by one who so obviously admired her, she had attributed it to his profession. The impression chiefly left upon her mind had been of an extreme simplicity that was somehow mysteriously suggestive of good breeding. It puzzled her the more from the contrast with Lady Honoret and her expansive friends. London clergymen surely weren't anybody as a rule, Lydia reflected sweepingly. Lady Honoret, whom no one, least of all the observant Lydia, could ever have accused of simplicity, was somebody. So was each of her talkative, elaborate familiars. They, all of them, in various guise, proclaimed it of themselves. Their conversation advertised themselves and their importance incessantly. Can't stay one second, dearest. The Duchess is screaming for me to come and finish our stall for the fancy fair. Don't talk about Kalmar's new symphony. Wretched creature. He had the audacity to ask me what I thought of it, and I was perfectly frank. I said there's only one way in which it strikes me, and that is Rococo. Of course I designed the dress. The dear lady put herself entirely in my hands, and the result was that it was the only costume in the room that was really of the period. People raved about it. No, my dear lady, I haven't a moment. My time is not my own. It belongs to the public, the wretched reading, writing, advertising public. This last was Casella, the publisher. He came to Lexham Gardens more and more frequently in the rivalry between himself and his hostess as to new discoveries appeared to have fallen into abeyance. He had complimented Lydia very effusively on her book when it first came out, but after she had taken her place in the household as Sir Rupert's private secretary, he took very little notice of her, although he was almost always at lunch or in the drawing room whenever Lydia was invited to either by Lady Honoret. She seldom went to Lexham Gardens on Sundays, although Sir Rupert had once or twice claimed an hour or two's work from her in the morning. "'Will that interfere with your hour of worship?' he once inquired solemnly. "'I can go to church in the evening,' Lydia replied. "'Thank you, Sir Rupert.' As a matter of fact, Sunday spent at the boarding-house now seemed to her the dullest day of the week. There were no interviews with strangers demanding Sir Rupert and who might turn out to be good-looking and impressionable, like Mr. Demorel, nor brief friendly greetings from the habitues who came often to the study and knew Lydia well by sight. And there was no possibly exciting interlude in the middle of the day, when the people in the dining-room accepted her almost as a daughter of the house, Lydia sometimes thought, and very often made most flattering allusions to her novel. The guests at the boarding-house seemed to her now incredibly dull. How could she ever have supposed them to be of any importance in the scheme of existence? When Hector Bolteel, after numerous failures, at length passed his matriculation, and the event was celebrated with perhaps tactless insistence by the Bolteel's fellow boarders, Lydia joined civilly and even with a show of cordiality in their demonstrations, but at the back of her mind she was aware that the people with whom she now chiefly associated would look upon the achievement with a total absence of enthusiasm. Many of them, very probably, would not even know what matriculation meant. The boarders all read Lydia's novel, and Miss Nettleship actually bought a copy of it, 
for what she called the drawing room library, which consisted of half a dozen torn novels in sixpenny editions, a copy of Molly Bon, with the last pages missing, and several unbound and very old numbers of the ladies' realm. All of them liked Lydia's book, and Mrs. Clarence remarked with melancholy pleasure that she had cried over it to the extent of having to fetch a clean pocket handkerchief before she could finish the last chapter. But although Lydia was not less popular, the boarders were now a little bit more reserved with her, showing all that curious nervousness that assails the semi-educated mind coming into contact with accredited cleverness. Lydia's cleverness was an established fact now that she had published a book and secured the position of Sir Rupert Honoret's secretary for herself. Sometimes they ask her about her work. Mostly accounts, but I answer a good many business letters and file and index them. And you meet interesting people, don't you, dear? said Mrs. Bulteel hungrily. Oh, yes. But Lydia did not vouchsafe many details to these eager listeners, partly because she did not want to rouse Miss Forster's jealousy, and partly because she could never quite forget Grandpapa's old advice. Always let other people talk about themselves. It somehow seemed better to turn the conversation into the direction of that winter when the Bolteels had gone to Switzerland and made the acquaintance of an Irish viscount and his wife staying at the same hotel as themselves, or to let Miss Forster tell the story of the wonderful luck she had had playing bridge at her club with the Honourable Mrs. Harry Modesley as her partner. Lydia did not spend very much time at the boarding house now, although she had again begun to write a book in the evenings. She was often kept overtime at Lexham Gardens, and, coming in late, would find that Miss Nettleship had kept a plate full of meat and vegetables for her in the oven, which was put before her baked very dry and almost too hot to eat. But she was rather glad of the excuse for having the dining room all to herself and going straight upstairs to her bedroom afterwards, without joining the dull group in the drawing-room. When the summer was half over, Sir Rupert told Lydia that she could have a month's holiday. "'We shall spend all August in Scotland, and perhaps longer,' he said gloomily. "'You'll want me again when you get back to London, won't you?' asked Lydia quickly. "'Certainly. I'll let you know. Leave me your address.' The question of her address during that month of freedom was the very one that Lydia was beginning to turn over in her own mind. Of course, there was Regency Terrace, but then she had spent several days there only a very little while ago, and August was really an intolerable month for the residents at the little seaside town. Also, the society of Aunt Beryl and Uncle George with the Jacksons and Mr. Monteagle Almond for sole variety was not very exhilarating. Grandpapa was growing very old and had long since ceased to honor Lydia with any of his entertaining soliloquies. Indeed, his cynical pronouncements now had lost their originality and point, and become like the dim old-fashioned platitudes of the bygone age to which Grandpapa belonged. Perhaps a few days at the end of the month for Regency Terrace, but Lydia thought that her holiday as a whole could very well be spent in Devonshire, paying that long-deferred visit to Natalie Palmer. Her letters to Natalie during the past year had certainly been much less expansive than those written when first they had parted at the end of their school days together, but she had sent Natalie a copy of her book and had received a rapturous appreciation in reply. Lydia that evening wrote to Natalie, a letter no longer than those that she was in the habit of sending, but explaining that her work lately had taken up all her time, and that she had also begun to try and write another book. Sir Rupert and Lady Honoret were going away for August, and Lydia was to have a holiday, and was longing to get away from London and have a complete change and rest. Her plans weren't quite settled, however, because though Aunt Beryl would always love to have Lydia at home, at the same time Grandpapa was getting very old and must be considered, and people coming and going always disturbed him. But of course it would be nice to help Aunt Beryl, who certainly had more to do than she could manage. Lydia was rather ashamed of the conscious insincerity with which she wrote that last sentence, but she let the letter go. Natalie's eager invitation came by return of post. It was pleasant to tell the boarders when they had discussed plans for the summer, with a certain harassed enjoyment in the much-debated topic, that one had an invitation to spend a month with a school friend in Devonshire. Oh, how glorious! Is it more or seaside? 
Not far from the Dartmoor, I think. It's just on the borders of Cornwall and Devon. How lovely! I thought of the Cornish coast myself, said Mrs. Clarence casually. But on the whole, I think I shall stick to Cromer. It's not so much of a journey. Old Miss Lillicrap cackled disagreeably at this undeniable truth, and Mrs. Clarence grew very red. Shellness for us, I suppose, said Mr. Bulteel cheerfully. We've been to the same rooms for three years now. This'll make the fourth, and I don't know that we can do better. I've written a very plain letter to Mrs. Bett, though, said his wife sharply. She ought to know what we expect by this time. But you remember we had a fuss last year because she wouldn't give us a hot sweet on Sundays. I'm not going to have any more nonsense of that sort. If she can't do the little we require, then we must go elsewhere, that's all. I'm sure there's plenty of choice. Everybody looked rather admiringly at Mrs. Bulteel, who could afford to speak thus. Only Miss Forster made a spirited show of having a choice of her own, too. Of course, Scotland is jolly at this time of the year, but I've got a dear friend who's taken a wee cottage in the Fen country, and I may join forces with her, though of course I could spend August and September in paying visits, but that means such a lot of travelling. Too expensive, indelicately said the outspoken Miss Lillicrap. Look at what tips for the servants alone comes to. The illusion naturally closed the conversation. Lydia, however, had derived from it inspiration. Do you know what Miss Nettleship is doing for a holiday? She inquired privately of Miss Forster, who always knew everything. She wants to get away for a fortnight. If she can get a friend to come here just for the time, I'm sure she needs a change. She hasn't been away for nearly twelve months, and you know what a worry she's had one way or another. Miss Forster stopped self-consciously, obviously on the very brink of an allusion to the Margoliath episode. Lydia wrote to Aunt Beryl. Miss Nettleship really did want a change, and though Lydia hadn't said a word to her, she couldn't help thinking that if Auntie asked her down to Regency Terrace, it would be a weight off her mind and do her all the good in the world. She could have Lydia's room, and Lydia really would like to think of her there. She had always been so kind. And if things were arranged like that, then Aunt Beryl needn't worry about Lydia for a moment, because Lydia would simply accept the urgent invitation that she had so often put off or refused to pay Natalie Palmer a visit at the Devonshire Rectory. Aunt Beryl remembered Natalie, of course. Aunt Beryl remembered Natalie quite well, and it would be nice for Lydia to stay with her friend. A disappointment, of course, to all of them not to see her at home, but perhaps Devonshire would be more of a change, and Maria Nettleship had certainly been very kind. It would be a real pleasure to try and make it up to her a bit. So Miss Nettleship received and gratefully accepted the invitation to occupy Lydia's room at Regency Terrace, and Lydia herself, unable to stop feeling that everything had been arranged in the most masterly manner, was able to take her place in a crowded train in all the heat and smoke of Paddington Station, prepared to enjoy a new experience with no troublesome arrière pensée in the background to spoil things. She could not remember that she had ever been to the real country before, although Uncle George's Sunday walks had often taken them right away from the shore and tram line to charming little woods or picturesque farmhouses. But Devonshire, Lydia had learned from books and from Natalie's eager descriptions when she was a homesick little girl at Miss Glover's school, Devonshire was different. The country that the train was rushing through with so few stops grew prettier and more wooded, the soil richer, the green more luxuriant. Presently there was a stop at Exeter, and Lydia knew that she must be nearing her destination. The little station with the double name that Natalie had warned her would come almost immediately after the glimpse of Dartmoor. There was a sudden change in the character of the scenery, a barren and beautiful expanse dotted with grey boulders and with a tumbling stream foaming across it, and Lydia heard an old countrywoman observe to her neighbour, There's old Dartmoor, same as ever. She pulled her handbag down from the rack, feeling strangely excited, and hastily put on her gloves just as the train slowed down and stopped. Clist, Milton, and Ashloo! Would Natalie have changed? Would they even recognize one another? Lydia stepped out of the train for once inclined to nervousness. 
but reassurance was at hand. Natalie had not changed. There she was, come to meet her friend, with the same trustful welcoming shining in her blue eyes, and her fair hair twisted up under a plain straw hat instead of hanging in a slender little pigtail that had never attained to half the weight and length of Lydia's own two plaits. Oh, Lydia, I am glad you've come. So am I. You haven't changed a bit. Oh, my trunk, is it out? The train had begun to move already. Natalie turned composedly to the only porter. There's a trunk from London. Is that it? Lydia, down at the far end? Oh, that's it, Lydia declared, relieved by the sight of her neat yellow trunk standing solitary on the little platform. Badcock will bring it along. The trap's outside, Natalie said to the porter. Let's come. Lydia followed her, feeling slightly amazed. The old Natalie had certainly never possessed a manner of any assurance at all, and moreover it impressed the town-bred visitor to see that the railway porter actually knew Natalie, and said, Yes, Miss Palmer, as he lurched away to fetch the trunk. She was still more impressed by the sight of the trap, a tall four-wheeled dog-cart with a white horse between the shafts, its head fastened to the station railings. Natalie untied the piece of rope, stowed it away at the back of the cart, and climbed into the driving seat, talking all the while. Lydia, who had never climbed into a dog cart before, was not happy, but she performed the feat as unconcernedly as she could, having carefully watched Natalie's movements. The trunk was hoisted into the back. Natalie said, Thank you, Badcock, jerked the reins slightly, and drove off. An unusual and quite unexpected sensation of shyness caused Lydia to talk rapidly about the heat of the journey and the beauty of the steep lanes through which they drove, anything that was impersonal. Natalie responded happily and naturally, but Lydia thought that she, too, was feeling a little shy. What a pretty house! That's Quintmere. The Demerels live there. Lydia wondered where she had heard of the Demerels before. Then she suddenly remembered. Oh, is one of them a clergyman in London? Mr. Clement is. Why, do you know him, Lydia? How funny. He comes to see Sir Rupert Honoret on business. I've seen him sometimes. Does he live at that house? His mother does, Lady Lucy. She's nice, awfully old. The eldest son was killed out hunting last winter. No, the winter before. Don't you remember? I wrote to you about it. It was awful. Poor father had to go tell Lady Lucy. Lady Lucy? Then the young clergyman was somebody. Lydia was speechless. Natalie went on, speaking very seriously. Of course, the squire being killed like that was dreadful. He was only thirty-five. Luckily, he's left a son, a dear little boy. He and his mother, Mrs. Damerel, live with Lady Lucy at the Quintmere now. And what does the other son do, the clergyman? Does he live in London? He does now. I suppose he'll have the living when father retires. It's in Lady Lucy Demerel's gift. You remember father, of course, Lydia. Lydia said that she did, quite well, and presently they drove through Ashloe Village, where Natalie exchanged a number of greetings with the people they met, and then up a short, steep drive to the rectory door. It was not a very pretty house, but completely smothered in ivy, and with shabby, shins-furnished rooms, full of flowers and littered with papers, that seemed to Lydia's unaccustomed eyes very large and bright. She felt that somehow she had never expected Natalie to have a home so like a rectory in a book. The rector came in for tea, and his long, rather solemn face, crowned by a high forehead and sparse white hair, struck Lydia as resembling that of a horse. He spoke to her in the kind, slow way that she remembered, and asked questions about her book. Natalie poured out the tea, and it caused Lydia an unreasonable surprise to see her doing it. Somehow she had never imagined Natalie any older or more grown up than when they had parted at school. Natalie had just gone home and lived there ever since. She herself, in her letters, had often said that nothing ever happened at Ashloo, and Lydia had been slightly struck with the contrast to her own varied days, independent livelihood at Elena's, the boarding house, the publishing of a successful novel, the new position as Sir Rupert Honoret's secretary, even her experience with Margoliath had been a dramatic affair, although she had never written of it to Natalie. And yet here was Natalie, who had done nothing at all, sitting indefinably poised and grown up, 
and more at her ease, Lydia felt certain, than was her visitor. However, she enjoyed the evening and the novelty of sitting on the lawn with the just-arrived London paper after tea, while Natalie went down to the school on her bicycle, because Mr. Palmer said that the schoolmistress wanted to speak to her about the infant class in the Sunday school most particularly. She also enjoyed supper, which they had on a wooden table in the garden, just under the dining-room window, from which the pink-faced maid handed them out the bread, sauce, and peas and potatoes for their roast chicken, and the dishes of raspberries and clotted cream that concluded the meal. "'We must see what our country fare can do towards fattening you up, while you're with us,' said the rector. "'You look as though you were in need of a rest.' "'She works so hard, father,' said Natalie proudly. I know, my dear, we must try and make this a real holiday. Lydia was touched and gratified at their kind solicitude. She acquiesced gratefully when Natalie suggested that she must be tired and would like to go to her room early. The room was a very pretty one, seeming enormous after number 17 at the boarding house, and with a comfortable deep armchair near the bed and a little vase of red-scented roses on the dressing table. "'Oh, it's lovely!' ejaculated Lydia in spontaneous delight at so great a contrast to any surroundings that she had ever known before. "'I'm next door,' said Lydia, "'and the bathroom is beyond the landing. Only I'm afraid the water's not very hot in the mornings. Breakfast at eight, but don't hurry. Lydia, dear, I won't stay and talk to you tonight, but it's splendid to think I've already got you here at last.' The enthusiasm of Natalie's words and good-night kiss assured Lydia that her adoring junior at Miss Glover still survived in the youthful lady of the house of Ashley Rectory. She went to sleep at last in the unaccustomed silence, a little bewildered and surprised still, but happily confident that here, as elsewhere, she would very soon regain her usual serenity of outlook and find her rightful place. End of chapter 17 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter 18 of The Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lydia's rightful place at the rectory was found even more quickly and easily than she had hoped. She helped Natalie with her blanket club accounts. She contributed most valuable garments made by herself quickly and deftly during the long, pleasant evenings to the maternity bag and she begged to be allowed to relieve Natalie sometimes by reading aloud at the meetings of the Mother's Union. It was gratifying to see how much the mothers appreciated it when the rector told them that this was his daughter's friend, who was taking a well-earned holiday from hard work in London. The rector and Natalie could hardly say enough of Lydia's eagerness to join in all the activities of their large and straggling parish and both expressed a naive admiration for her wonderful aptitude over details, which must be so new to her. But Lydia enjoyed it all, and also enjoyed her own quickness that admittedly so far surpassed Natalie's rather automatic performance of her many duties, and the sense of being a great success, and really helpful to the kind and hospitable Palmers. The old intimacy between herself and Natalie had revived very quickly, and it surprised and flattered Lydia to see the eagerness displayed by her friend to hear all about her life in London. But she did not tell her a very great deal. It was always a mistake to talk very much about oneself, and the rector had seemed to think it rather a pity that Lydia should be working for the Jewish Sir Rupert Honoret. More successful, somehow, to keep the conversation to the great novelty that she found in a country life, and her enjoyment of the Saturday afternoon cricket matches attended by Natalie always, and her father whenever possible, as a matter of course. I suppose I'm so used to them, and it's very slack of me, but I do get rather tired of always getting the tea ready, Natalie confessed. Do you give the tea? The cricket club funds are supposed to provide it, but Lady Lucy lets us have the crockery, and Mrs. Damerel often comes down to help. The squire used to play, you know. And Mr. Clement de Merrill sometimes plays when he's down here. We may see him this afternoon. Lydia felt rather pleased and put on a new pink frock that she had copied from one of Natalie's neat prints because her customary long skirts and frilly blouses had somehow seemed out of place at the rectory. 
She went down with Natalie to the cricket ground in the middle of the village early in the afternoon. We call it the post office for the key of the cricket pavilion, said Natalie, quite matter-of-factly. The postmaster gave them the key, and they also called at the baker's for a very large basket containing long loaves of yellow saffron cake. The pavilion was a small, match-boarded erection, painted in green, and with a little wooden fence all around it. Within this enclosure, Natalie and Lydia erected a trestle table, and from inside the pavilion they extracted a quantity of enamel mugs and plates, with two knives for cutting up the cakes and spreading butter on the splits, as Natalie called the round white buns that Lydia had taken for scones. That's splendid, Lydia. How quickly you do it. You see, we hand out the tea over the paling, and then they eat it on the grass outside. The urns will come down presently from Quintmere. What fun it is, said Lydia. I wish you were always here, cried Natalie. You make anything fun, and I sometimes get so tired of it all. Nevertheless, she went on spreading butter rapidly, and the splits were piling up on the enamel plates. Here's Mrs. Damerel, said Natalie presently. Lydia looked up curiously and felt rather disappointed at the sight of the squire's widow. Mrs. Damerel was very tall, dressed in a short black skirt and a black shirt made very plainly indeed. A small black veil hung from her hat, denoting her widowhood, and she had the red, weather-beaten complexion of the hunting woman, with a very much turned-up nose and prominent teeth. She did not look more than thirty, but as a pathetic young widow, Lydia thought her appearance a failure. "'Good afternoon, Natalie,' she said in a short, clipping way. "'What a lot you've done. "'Billy and I came down to see if we could help. "'Thank you, Mrs. Damerel. "'This is my friend Lydia Raymond, who's staying with us,' said Natalie shyly. "'How do you do?' "'Mrs. Damerel shook hands, which Lydia had somehow not expected her to do. "'Quite well, thank you,' she replied politely and there was a pause while Mrs. Damerel pulled off her gauntlet gloves, revealing an unexpectedly white pair of hands. She gave the two girls very efficient help, and the dishes of food were all ready and set out in the shade, covered with clean cloths before the match had even begun. The urns are coming down at four o'clock. Lady Lucy will be driving down, said Mrs. Damerel. Where's Billy? They left the cool shelter of the little pavilion and went outside to find Billy a fair child in white flannels, better looking than his mother. The other team has just arrived, he shouted excitedly, and a wagonette crowded with men and boys jolted slowly to a standstill outside the ground. It was all new to Lydia, and she sat in the brilliant August sunshine and watched the groups of men on the ground, the rosy Devonshire school children rolling about the grass under the shade of some great elm trees, and the arrival of a number of village folk who took their places on forms conveniently placed for watching the match. Mrs. Damerel spoke to many of them, and presently sat down on one of the benches, with Billy on the ground at her feet, playing with a big dog that seemed to belong to them, and of which Lydia felt rather nervous. Natalie said to her apologetically, I must go and score, Lydia. We're a man short because Bert Greenaway isn't here and the man who generally keeps the score has been put in first. I don't suppose he'll stay in long, though, and then I can come back. We've won the toss. She went to sit at the little table under a blackboard in which a few figures, incomprehensible to Lydia, were chalked up and busied herself with an enormous sheet of heavily scored paper. Lydia tried to remember all that she had ever heard about cricket from the Senthovens. What a long way off the Senthovens seemed, and London and the girls at Elena's, and even Sir Rupert's study. As she smiled at the thought, a voice beside her suddenly recalled to her with surprising vividness the very atmosphere of the Lexham Gardens house. How do you do, Miss Raymond? I never expected that we should meet down here. It was Clement Damerel, looking unfamiliar in dark grey flannels. Lydia flushed with surprise and jumped up. They shook hands. I never saw you arrive, she said rather naively. I've been talking to Miss Palmer. She told me you were staying with her and that you'd been kind enough to remember our meetings in London. You're having a holiday, I suppose. Yes, 
Sir Rupert and Lady Honoret have gone to Scotland. I've got a fortnight, too. Isn't this glorious after London? Have you met my mother yet? No. I've only seen her in church, and then I was up in the choir, because Natalie, Miss Palmer, was playing the organ. Lady Damerel had gone when we came out. Lydia had heard Natalie and her father speak of Lady Lucy, but she felt sure that in a stranger this would sound like impertinent familiarity. My mother would be down here presently, said Clement de Merrill. She doesn't often miss a cricket match. He stayed beside her on the grass, watching the game, eyes screwed up against the sun. That's a good bowler they've got. He'll have Davy out in a minute. You'll see. No, that's the end of the over. The man at this end is a good man. If he's wise, he'll block every ball until he gets his eye in. Are you interested in cricket? I'm enjoying this very much, Lydia said, but I don't know much about the game. I used to play with some cousins. Mr. Damerel was certainly not at all like the Senthovens, the only other people Lydia had known who were very much interested in games. Although he watched the match and called out, Well hit, Mr. Yeo, well hit, when a boundary was scored, and although he clapped generously when a slow ball unexpectedly sent Davy's middle stump flying, he was all the time attentive to Lydia, addressing his conversation to her, and seeming really interested in everything she said. When Davy walked sheepishly away from the wicket, unfastening his pads as he came and handing them to his successor with the bat, Natalie was set at liberty. I'll put myself down for a duck's egg, Miss Palmer, said Davy, grinning ruefully. Natalie laughed and came to join her friend. Lydia was on the whole not sorry to welcome her. Although at Regency Terrace it might be considered bad form to break in a tete-a-tete -tete between any girl and any young man, her experience at Lexham Gardens had shown her that this rule was not by any means universally prevalent, and moreover she was beginning to find it a strain to show herself as consistently charming and intelligent as Mr. Clement de Merrill quite obviously considered her to be. With four o'clock there came a break. Two large urns were lifted on to the trestle table by a man in groom's livery, who touched his hat to Natalie, and Clement de Merrill got up and made his way to a small, old-fashioned pony carriage, just drawn up under one of the further elm trees. Shall we make tea, Lydia? Little muslin bags of tea leaves were at the bottom of each urn, and boiling water was miraculously procured from immense kettles that appeared to have spent the afternoon over a fire of sticks concealed behind the pavilion. Natalie emptied milk and sugar with a practiced hand into the tea urns. We always give it to them ready mixed, she said with finality. Lydia felt no inclination to criticize. Everything at Ashlew, imbued with the immemorial traditions of a country parish, seemed as much beyond criticism as might be some age-old law that had remained unbroken throughout the centuries. They handed mugs of tea and plates of cake and splits across the wooden palings, and Billy de Merrill came to ask for some tea for his mother and carried a brimming mug carefully away with him. Mrs. de Merrill remained seated between two village matrons, talking to them in her abrupt yet unembarrassed manner, but the old lady in black, whom Lydia had vaguely discerned in the pony cart, presently descended and came slowly across the grass, leaning on her son's arm. If Mrs. de Merrill's appearance had been a disappointment to Lydia, that of Lady Lucy de Merrill was an even worse shock. She was small and old, with wisps of untidy white hair blowing round her face, under a big mushroom hat of black straw, whereof the edges were unmistakably frayed. Her black dress was of a cut and antiquity that even Aunt Evelyn, who reputedly had no time to think about appearances, would have disdained, and she wore a large pair of clumping black boots. Lydia thought of Lady Honoret's ruffled tea gowns and picture hats and innumerable sparkling, jangling rings and chains and lockets, and felt that Lady Lucy Damerel really could be no one so very important after all. Even her voice, as she greeted Natalie by her Christian name, had not the peculiar distinction that was noticeable in her son's. "'Is your father coming down?' she asked Natalie. "'I'm afraid he won't be back in time. He's had to take a funeral at Clist Milton Halt this afternoon.' 
Is that the beer baby? Yes. Ah, oh, poor Mrs. Beer. I want to get over and see her one afternoon, but it's a long way for the old pony. They sent over the eldest boy to ask for some flowers yesterday. Lady Lucy sat down on one of the wooden benches and began to talk amiably to Lydia. Is this your first visit to Devonshire? Yes, I think it's lovely. There's no place like it, said Lady Lucy with the calm of conviction. My son tells me that you work in London. Do you find that interesting? Very interesting. Lydia gave a few details shyly, and Lady Lucy listened with the same attentive interest that her son had shown, and which Lydia in her found even more surprising, remembering the scant courtesy accorded by Lady Honoret and her friends to one another's discourse. Finally, the old lady said to Natalie, Have you a free afternoon next week, my dear, when you can bring Miss Raymond up for some tennis? We should like to very much, Lady Lucy, thank you. Any day except, let me see, Friday is choir practice, and on Tuesday, I suppose, Mrs. Damerel will have the GFS girls at Quintmere. So she will. What about Monday, Clement? Splendid, said her son. Then about four o'clock, my dear, and tell your father I'll try to see Mrs. Beer as soon as I can get down along to Clist Milton Halt. She made use of the Devonshire idiom with the utmost naturalness. Lydia, who had thought it provincial from Natalie and her father, was again very much surprised. Goodbye, said Clement de Merrill. We shall meet again on Monday, then. They met again on Monday, and on several other occasions. Lydia inwardly commented her own foresight of long ago in letting the Senthovens bully her over innumerable games of tennis. She might, and indeed did, lack practice, but she had only to say so, and, thanks to Bob and Olive, she knew that her style was good. She played as often as possible at the rectory against Natalie, whose game was an admirable one, and her strokes improved every day. It was satisfactory to write to Aunt Beryl, knowing that the information would filter through to Miss Nettleship, and thence to all the boarding-house people. Yesterday, Natalie and I went up to Quintmere again and played tennis. The clergyman's son, Mr. Clement Darrell, plays awfully well. He and I won a set against Natalie and another man who is staying there. The old lady de Merrill is awfully nice. She doesn't seem to know anybody much outside Devonshire. She didn't even know who Lady Honoret was. I like her better than her widowed daughter-in-law who lives with her, called Mrs. Damerel. I am having a ripping time, Auntie. Nothing could be more appreciative than Aunt Beryl's reply. Although not apt to be eloquent in correspondence, for which she rightly said that she had no time, Aunt Beryl, prompted evidently by Aunt Evelyn and the Fashions Paper Society Supplement, was quite expansive about the Damerels. Auntie was so interested in what you say about the Quintmere family, she wrote. A girl she had for a short time at Wimbledon was in service at young Mrs. Damerel's home before she was married. She was the Honorable Joyce Poutney. Quite a well-known old Devonshire family. So glad you're meeting nice people and getting plenty of fun, dear. Make the most of your time. You'll only be young once, as the books say. Auntie asked me to give you her fond love and olives. The latter is still very seedy and as thin as a lath, poor girl. Aunt E. also wants me to say that the old lady is Lady Lucy Damerel, and was the daughter of some Lord Somebody or other. Excuse details, as you know my poor memory. It would be considered quite a solecism to call her Lady Damerel. Hope you don't mind me mentioning this, dear. Lydia did not mind at all. Hers was never the trivial vanity that resents criticism, and she was only too pleased to find herself guarded from possible future errors. She was enjoying her visit to Devonshire more and more. The weather was fine almost all the time, but Lydia found to her surprise that Natalie went out just the same whether it rained or not. We couldn't let it make any difference, you know, the rector's daughter explained. In the autumn down here it rains nearly every day, a sort of wet mist that's just the same as rain anyway, only your boots aren't very thick, Lydia. They were not, in fact. It was very obvious that Natalie only spoke of the thin patent leather high-heeled things as boots, 
by courtesy. Lydia remembered Lady Mary Damerel's substantial footwear and bought a pair of thick country shoes the next time they went into Clist Milton. When she had been nearly three weeks at the rectory, Clement de Merrill returned to London. I hope I shall see you there sometime, he said to Lydia. She felt flattered, and she hoped so too, but Mr. Damerel was a slight puzzle to her. She supposed that it was because he was a clergyman, that, although he obviously liked her society, he did not suggest taking her out to tea some Saturday afternoon, which surely he could easily do in London. However, he had definitely given her to understand that his business with Sir Rupert Honoret was likely to be of indefinite duration, and Lydia knew that they would meet again. She was attracted by the young clergyman by something in him which she inwardly described to herself as high class, by his good looks of the fair athletic type, essentially opposite to her own, and by his deferential courtesy to herself. She thought that it was a pity he should be a parson. Clergymen were all very well, but apparently they were unable to let themselves go quite as other young men might have done, to the pleasant cultivation of a passing attraction. Lydia gave no thought to anything more enduring than a passing attraction, partly because the Margoliath episode had confirmed her strongly in the belittling view of sexual adventure that was hers by temperament, and partly because, although her imagination had been slightly stirred by Damerel, her emotional capabilities were as utterly undeveloped as her strong and ambitious mentality was overmatured. Before she went back to London, the rector spoke to her gently and kindly of her life there. You are very young to be living by yourself, if I may say so. Natalie tells me that this lady in whose house you lodge is a friend of your aunt's. Yes, she's very nice. Yes, yes, I'm sure of it. And she takes care of you, sees that you eat enough, and don't sit up too late at night writing those clever stories. She takes great care of me, said Lydia, smiling. The rector was old-fashioned in particular, and she did not want him to think his daughter's friend reckless or over-independent. I'm glad of that, very glad. Natalie and I must claim the privilege of being a little bit anxious about you sometimes. And what about your work now? Lydia had guessed what was coming, and willfully pretended to misunderstand it. I'm writing another book, and the people who published my first one have already asked me about it, so I hope they'll take it. Ah, indeed. Well, no doubt, they will be only too glad, I hope so. I hope so. But I meant your daily work, my child, the secretaryship. I shall begin again next month, as soon as Sir Rupert and Lady Honoret come back from Scotland. What are these people like, may I ask? Lady Honoret writes, and knows a great many clever people. And Sir Rupert is in the city, and gives a great deal to charity. Does he? Does he? But now, forgive me, my dear child, are these people altogether desirable? Is the tone of their house quite what it should be? Lydia, genuinely astonished, could only reply, I think so. I don't know. I've never thought about it. No, indeed. How should you at your age? But your acquaintance with this lady came about very casually, I understand. And, and, in short, my dear Lydia, I have lately heard one or two things which disturbed me and led me to think it my duty to utter a word of warning. Natalie has so much affection for you, and you have so identified yourself with our little daily round of life here, that I, I could no more let you go into danger with your eyes shut than I could my own daughter. The good rector's voice held emotion as well as great earnestness, and Lydia said with perfect sincerity, It's very kind of you, Mr. Palmer, and I can't be grateful enough, but my post is a very good one. And really, and truly, the work I do is almost all connected with charities, the hospitals and institutions and things of which Sir Rupert is patron. He is a very generous man. Is that so? There are many most open-handed members of the Jewish community, I know, indeed. Many a professed Christian might be put to shame by them. But that brings me to another point. Should you not rather employ your capabilities your great capabilities, 
in some service other than that of an alien faith? But Sir Rupert gives to religious objects, too, said Lydia quickly. At least, I mean, he makes no distinction between denominations. There is a Roman Catholic hospital on his list, and he has sent money to Mr. Clement de Merrill's Church Lads Brigade. I know, and several other things. Yes, yes, Demerel certainly described him as a most generous man. But the rector still looked thoroughly uneasy. I have no shadow of a right to coerce you in any way, my dear child, he said at last, but I do implore you to look upon me as a friend, and if at any time you should feel perplexed or doubtful as to your position with these people, write to me quite freely. Your confidence will always be treated as sacred, and I might be able to help you, you know, said the rector wistfully. There are a great many branches of work in our own church that would be only too glad of help and brains like yours. I could easily make inquiries as to a secretarial post with the church army or the YWCA in London. I am obliged to think of my salary, said Lydia, not without intention. My aunt and uncle have done a great deal for me, and it makes a difference to them that I should be able to keep myself comfortably. I get two pounds a week from Sir Rupert Honoret, and my lunch and my tea every day. That is good, said the rector. And the thought crossed his mind just as Lydia had intended that it should, and found semi-expression in his murmured words, Yes, I don't know that the YWCA can afford quite that scale of pay. On the whole, Lydia, thinking it over afterwards, could not feel the conversation in any way to be regretted. It had established her on the footing almost of an adopted daughter, as regarded the kind old rector, and Lydia felt that she hardly needed Natalie's assurance, warmly given on the night before she was to return to London. Of course you'll come to us again, Lydia dear, whenever you can get away, won't you? Father does to hope you will. I've never seen him take such a fancy to anyone as he has to you. And you've been so good and dear about helping us and joining in all our dull ways down here. Lydia protested affectionately and said how much she would love to come and stay with Natalie again, only, of course, there was Aunt Beryl to be thought of and Grandpapa. They must never be allowed to think that Lydia preferred to spend her holidays elsewhere. In fact, if it wasn't that she'd been at Regency Terrace for an unexpected visit after leaving Madame Elena's, she ought to have gone there at least for the last week of this month. Of course, I quite understand, said Natalie, and it's very good of you, Lydia, always to think of them first. Only, you know, a long journey like the one from London here is hardly worth while unless it's for a real proper visit, is it now? Aunt Beryl, oddly enough, had written very much the same, in reply to Lydia's letter explaining that she would have to go straight back to London when she left Clist Milton. So evidently no one's feelings had been hurt and Lydia could enjoy the Palmers and their comfortable rectory until the last possible moment quite freely. She went away at last, able to look back upon her Devonshire month with a delightful feeling of happiness and success. Her friendship with Natalie was more firmly established now that they had met again, both grown up, and that Natalie's childhood admiration for Lydia had been reinforced as it was impossible not to know that it had, from its enthusiastic endorsement from Natalie's father and from Lydia's own triumphant adaptation of herself to her surroundings. She had learnt a lot of new things. How one dressed in the country and wore heavy boots and went out in all weathers and climbed backwards out of a dog cart. And she had made acquaintance with Lady Lucy Damrell which would silence Miss Forster once and for all with her perpetual Sir Rupert and Lady Honorettes. The recollection of the Honorettes gave Lydia the slightest moment's pause. After all, Lady Lucy Damerel seemed never to have heard of them, and all that Lydia had reported of the literary and theatrical society that came to Lexham Gardens, and the great publishers, Mr. Casella's constant visits there, had apparently conveyed nothing at all to the people at Quintmere. But another thought also struck Lydia quite suddenly, and woke in her an amused mingling of resentment and gratification. 
Only one person could have spoken to the old rector of the Honorets in such a fashion as to make him wonder whether, as he had said, the tone of their house was such as to warrant Lydia's spending her days there. And that person was the Reverend Clement de Merrill. End of chapter 18 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter 19 of The Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield The return to London seemed like a return to another life. Even the weather changed suddenly. No more waking to the sound of hens clucking below the open window, to the sight of nodding ivy leaves, and to the cheerful anticipation of such novelties as a school entertainment in the village, or an all-day cricket match with luncheon provided for both teams at Quintmere as well as the usual Saturday afternoon tea at the pavilion. Fogs began very early and seemed to pervade the boarding-house, together with the perpetual smell of cabbages cooking in the basement. Omnibuses lurched and rumbled through the wet streets, and the elephant and castle that took Lydia daily to the corner of Lexham Gardens seemed always to be full of shiny mackintoshes and dripping umbrellas. There was a change in the atmosphere of the household there that Lydia could not altogether define. For one thing, Sir Rupert's taciturnity seemed to have given place to a spasmodic, unpleasant sort of garrulity when he would ask his secretary abrupt and apparently disconnected questions that certainly did not concern her work for him. You been in here all day, Miss Raymond? Yes, it was too wet to take my little walk after lunch, I thought. Do they bring your lunch properly in here? Yes, thank you. You didn't go to the dining room today, then? No, Sir Rupert. A pause while Sir Rupert gave his habitual choked sounding snort, as though in a useless attempt to modify the ugly nasal intonation with which he always spoke. I suppose her ladyship wasn't in for lunch, was she? He always spoke of his wife as her ladyship, and Lydia inwardly resented it. I don't know. She doesn't tell you her plans, eh? I haven't seen Lady Honoret for the last day or two. No, I don't suppose you have. She's more often out than in, by all accounts, said Sir Rupert with a disagreeable, meaningless laugh. Another day when he asked Lydia the same question, she was able to reply that Lady Honoret had invited her to luncheon in the dining room. There were some people here, weren't there? Only one or two. There was an old lady whose name I didn't hear, and Mrs. Cohen and Mr. Casella. Hmm. And I suppose they stayed on all the afternoon? I don't know, said Lydia. I came back here at half-past two. Sir Rupert gave her a very sharp look, almost as though he were wondering whether or not she were speaking the truth, and Lydia felt vexed and uncomfortable, unable to imagine any reason for these interrogations. Still more disconcerting did she find it when Sir Rupert took to making sudden appearances in the course of the day, always at hours when he had hitherto been in the city. Is her ladyship in? I don't know, Sir Rupert. Just ring the bell, will you? And Sir Rupert would sharply question the footman. What time did her ladyship go out? I couldn't say, Sir Rupert. I'll inquire, Sir Rupert. The footman was always obliged to disappear in order to collect the information that her ladyship had gone off in a handsome cab at half-past two o'clock. Didn't she order the carriage? I believe not, Sir Rupert. Why not? What do I keep a couple of fine horses for, eating their heads off and fellows in the livery and all? Anything wrong with the horses, eh? Not as I'm aware of, Sir Rupert. Send her ladyship's maid to me. No, don't. That'll do. You can go. Very good, Sir Rupert. Then the little Jewish financier turned to Lydia, pretending to be absorbed at her writing table in the corner. Why don't her ladyship use the carriage instead of a low, dirty cab? I don't know at all. Perhaps Lady Honoret went out in a hurry. Sir Rupert snorted again. Perhaps, after all, old Palmer's warning had not been without reason. Lydia began to feel that she did not much like the atmosphere of the Lexham Garden house nowadays. Her relations with Lady Honoret were changed, too. The excitement that the publication of her books had momentarily caused in these literary circles was now apparently forgotten, and although Lydia resolutely told herself that she had expected nothing less, she could not help noticing that instead of being introduced to visitors as the new Discovery, she was now either left unpresented 
or referred to as my husband's secretary who does sums so very very marvellously poor little me can never add two and two together you know sometimes lady honoret brought a request to lydia that she would juggle various items of expenditure on dress or jewellery into an appearance of charitable generosity but this she only did in her own drawing-room she never so far as lydia was aware entered sir rupert's study whether he was there or not clement demerall did not come to lexham gardens for some time after lydia's return there and when at last he did so it was by appointment and sir rupert was waiting for him lydia was not at all sure what the etiquette of her position demanded but mr demerall appeared to have no such doubts he shook hands with her although flushing a little and told sir rupert that miss raymond had spent her holiday with his next-door neighbours in devonshire sir rupert expressed no interest in the coincidence and the two began at once to discuss business sir rupert however did not seem quite so much interested in east end crochets and orphan asylums as he had been in the summer very often the instructions that he gave lydia were self-contradictory as though he hardly knew altogether what he was saying it came as a relief to lydia when one day he told her that an old friend of his was coming to stay a man i knew abroad said sir rupert gruffly quite a rough diamond you understand and i don't want him to bother her ladyship he'll make this room his headquarters i'm afraid i may be in his way ventured lydia no he's got plenty of writing to do over here on business lydia pictured a colonel but sir rupert's friend proved to be a very quiet unmistakably english middle-aged man who talked a good deal about big game shooting in africa and was more prolix of reminiscences than was his host sir rupert indeed rather shocked lydia by his absence of cordiality toward his old friend he did not interrupt his daily excursions to the city on mr cod's account and in fact appeared rather to discontinue his recently acquired habit of making unexpectedly early returns mr cod was left to entertain himself all the morning which he very often did by reading the newspapers in the study or making entries in a black memorandum book that he kept in his pocket as an old traveller i may be writing my reminiscences one of these days he jokingly observed to lydia i've always kept up the habit of noting my impressions as i go along you'll find that a very useful thing to do miss raymond as you write yourself lydia felt gratified how do you know that i write she asked rather shyly i've not yet had the pleasure of reading your novel but lady honoret has told me all about it and the success it enjoys so lady honoret at least did take a little trouble to entertain the neglected guest lydia felt quite relieved mr cod was very nice and had quite good manners but she had somehow imagined that he did not see very much of his hostess certainly he must lunch in her company but lydia had a vague idea that he generally went out by himself in the afternoons and she was obliged to admit with a certain inward appreciation for her own discernment that mr cod evidently a practical matter-of-fact man whose chief idea was sport and whose life had been passed largely in the wilds could hardly have very much in common with cultivated expensive little lady honoret and her artistic circle of friends from these considerations it was easy to pass to a friendly feeling almost amounting to a sense of responsibility for mr cod's unoccupied morning hours Lydia was not very busy, and Mr. Cod was always ready to talk. For all his quietness of manner, he was a gregarious soul. Lydia had once entered the study after a protracted absence and found him in friendly intercourse with William, the footman. Quite evidently, Mr. Cod was lonely. Lydia asked him one or two questions about his travels, and he gave her some very interesting information, in a manner that somehow reminded her a little of Uncle George and then in return as it were for her interest in his concerns mr cod asked lydia about her own work had she been long with this old friend sir rupert lydia explained that she had not mr cod said that sir rupert might be a little taciturn perhaps but that was only his manner a heart of gold in fact a rough diamond mr cod called him oddly selecting the very expression by which sir rupert had described him before his arrival our little friend lady honoret now said mr cod smiling is quite different the most warm-hearted and enthusiastic lydia assented 
explaining that to Lady Honoret's kindness she really owed her present position and the success of her novel. Just like her, Mr. Codd declared enthusiastically. But still, we mustn't forget that it gives her real pleasure to discover genuine new talent. And besides, no doubt you've done many little things to help her, perhaps almost as a daughter might have done. Lydia could not help liking the expression, although she knew that it overstated the case. Almost as a daughter. Where were Miss Forster's pretensions now? Oh, I've not had the chance of doing much, she said modestly, though of course I'd like to. But she added, lest Mr. Codd should suppose her inability to be of use to Lady Honoret greater than it really was. Of course, I've always been very fond of figures, and I can do accounts easily. Sometimes I've helped Lady Honoret that way. Very rare to find a young lady who is really good at accounts, said Mr. Codd respectfully, almost as Mr. Monteagle Almond might have spoken. Quite a faculty apart. I suppose you've mastered accountancy pretty thoroughly. Lydia told him while he listened with great interest and attention of her experience at Madame Elena's shop. Ah, yes, of course, after that, Lady Honoret's straightforward little accounts must seem to you like child's play. Lydia laughed a little, secretly amused at the singularly inappropriate adjective that he had selected for describing Lady Honoret's system of dealing with her expenditure, but she did not say anything. Mr. Codd twirled his grey moustache and declared that it was a shame to waste her time by talking, but if he might say so, it was a surprising relief to find a young lady who had other ideas in her head than dressing up or going to the play. Lydia remembered Margoliath, but after all, she thought that she had changed a great deal since those days. In fact, she must have done so, since she could attract men like Mr. Clement de Merrill and even Mr. Codd himself. The liking that he evinced for her conversation was so unmistakable that Lydia began to allow herself to place possible interpretations upon it. She was not attracted by Mr. Codd as she was by Clement de Merrill the only man who had yet touched her imagination in any romantic sense. But Mr. Codd, some instinct that she could not doubt, assured her of it, belonged, for all his polished manners and his old friendship with Sir Rupert and his extensive travels, to the classification roughly described by Lydia as her own sort, although he might be and probably was a rich man. Clement de Merrill, the young London parson, and certainly not rich at all, was different. He might be attracted by Lydia, but an indefinable gulf separated the worlds to which they respectively belonged. It was entirely characteristic of Lydia's eminently practical outlook upon life that she should attach an importance to Mr. Codd's mild attentions, which she had absolutely denied to her own perfectly recognized inclination towards the good-looking, diffident young clergyman. Mr. Codd's visit continued for a whole fortnight, and appeared likely to extend even beyond it. He explained to Lydia that he had no relations in England now, and but few friends, and so Sir Rupert had kindly bidden him make the house at Lexham Gardens his headquarters. Perhaps it was because he wished his old friend to feel himself at home, that Sir Rupert took so little pains to entertain him, Lydia reflected, but she did not feel that such a consideration would in any way account for the extreme brusqueness of the Jewish financier's manner from time to time. Stop that damn foolery, Lydia overheard him growl when Mr. Codd had made an innocent and friendly allusion to some adventure shared in the past upon the west coast of Africa. Mr. Codd remained smiling and unperturbed, but he said to Lydia soon afterwards that he was afraid the city was a strenuous place and told upon the nerves of many. Our poor friend, now, I dare say you notice a little irritability. Of course, meaningless, he merely lets himself go with those who are quite certain not to misunderstand him, but there's a certain tension about him that I don't quite like. It looks to me very much like overstrained nerves, probably from overwork. I don't like it, said Mr. Codd emphatically. Lydia did not like it either. Sir Rupert's nerves, Lady Honoret's flightiness, even Mr. Codd's bland, observant presence, 
all combined to create an atmosphere of which Lydia became more and more uneasily conscious. She was oddly reminded of the uncomfortable weight hanging in the air, the general sense of electricity experienced on the seashore at home just before the breaking of a heavy thunderstorm. Shamrock can smell the thunder about. Grandpapa had been wont to claim such prescience for his favorite. Regardless of the inelegance of the simile, Lydia felt inwardly as though she too could smell the thunder about. In a phrase much affected by Aunt Evelyn, she realized that things were getting on her nerves. She had less work to do for Sir Rupert than ever before. If he chanced to return eagerly, he generally said to her, You can leave all that, Miss Raymond. I'll look at the letters. Just let me have the room for half an hour or so. This was Sir Rupert's fashion of intimating that Lydia should leave the study. He himself remained there, fiercely picking at his teeth and emitting that harsh downward snort. Mr. Codd remained also, and once as she left the room, Lydia heard him say very soothingly, Well, a few more days we'll see the end of it. We've got pretty nearly all we want. That was the very day Lydia remembered afterwards that emerging into the hall she met Lady Honoret coming in all alone from some expedition that had left her with a white face and glittering eyes behind the thick veil she was wearing. Oh, you startled me, she said shrilly at the sudden sight of Lydia. Is Sir Rupert there? He's just come in. He's in the study with Mr. Codd. I don't know what he wants with that awful man, said Lady Honoret pettishly. He's never had anyone to stay before, though I'm not only too, too thankful for anything that'll put him in a good humor. But does that cod creature mean to stay here forever? With the recollection clearly in her mind of the words that she had just overheard, to which she had definitely attached the implication that Mr. Cod's visit was drawing to a term, Lydia nevertheless obeyed some obscure instinct entirely unintelligible to herself, and only answered, I don't know. Afterwards she could not understand why she had done so, and the discomfort unusual to her of finding complexities in her own conduct, to which she held no clue, added to Lydia's unease. It was less than two days later that enlightenment came to her. She arrived at Lexham Gardens as usual, to have the front door opened for her with an instantaneous alacrity that was in itself a hint of deviation from the normal. Not only William, but two maids were in the hall hovering about the foot of the stairs with white, excited-looking faces. Lydia wanted to ask, what is the matter, but disliked the idea of questioning the gaping servants and prepared to go silently upstairs to the study on the first floor. Better not go up just yet, miss, if I were you, said William the footman. Why not? Lydia asked quickly. There's her ladyship in the study with Sir Rupert hesitated the man. Of course I'm going in, said Lydia quietly. Her heart was beating violently with some apprehension that she could not define, but not for worlds would she have taken place amongst the hovering, whispering crew of waiting domestics. As she reached the first landing, the door of the study flew open, and Lady Honoret came out. Her little dark face was distorted by violent weeping and by an emotion which Lydia, with an abrupt physical pang, recognized as sheer terror. She put out her hand involuntarily as Lady Honoret dashed past her, and then turned back with a stifled, hunted exclamation at the sight of the servants below. Milady, gasped a frightened voice from above, and Lydia looked up and saw Lady Honoret's own maid, a smart, ugly little Frenchwoman, halfway down the second flight of stairs. Lady Honoret stumbled upstairs with a sort of rush, and the woman led her away. Almost simultaneously, Sir Rupert's voice shouted from inside the study, Shut that door, will you? And Lydia, finding herself shaking all over and not knowing what else to do, went into the study and shut the door behind her. Sir Rupert and Mr. Codd stood side by side on the hearth rug, the little Jew with a face like parchment and hands tearing nervously at a silk handkerchief, and Mr. Codd, suave and imperturbable. At the sight of Lydia, however, he came forward and pulled a chair towards her. Sit down, he said benevolently. You saw? It's been a shock, of course. But what is it? Lydia wailed, feeling bewildered. What is it? sneered Sir Rupert. I suppose you haven't been in my lady's counsels all the time, 
helping her to deceive me with her accounts, and what all have you. The room reeled round Lydia, and she heard as from an immense distance the remonstrating voice of Mr. Codd. Sir Rupert, I have already assured you. Could all this be about the accounts and the money Lady Honoret had spent? Lydia asked herself wildly. Be quiet, you fellow. Sir Rupert was bellowing at Mr. Codd. You've done your part. I don't want to hear any more from you. I make allowances, Sir Rupert, said Mr. Codd with dignity, for the shock you have sustained. But really, your manner to this young lady to say nothing of myself. Sir Rupert drew a shaking hand across his face. He said nothing, but his habitual sudden snort seemed designed to express a return to calm. Mr. Codd turned to Lydia. Sir Rupert will hardly require you today. This has come as a complete blow to you, I see. But what is it? Lydia asked again. Mr. Codd glanced at the financier, as though the words served to corroborate some statement of his own. Miss Raymond, have you had no idea of what has been going on in this house? Sir Rupert demanded suddenly. I don't understand, Lydia said blankly. Do you know why Mr. Codd is here? You ask him to stay. Ask him to stay? What do you suppose I ask him for? Mr. Codd interposed again. I assure you, Sir Rupert, that no one in this house has had the faintest idea of the purpose for which I have been here, yourself accepted. Secrecy was essential to our scheme, and this young lady was completely duped. It would be strange indeed, said Mr. Codd, with a slight superior laugh, if a private inquiry agent of my experience were to betray himself like a mere tiro. A private inquiry agent? Lydia had seen in the papers the advertisements of firms offering to supply the services of such. Mr. Codd, Sir Rupert's old friend, who had hunted big game with him in West Africa, a private inquiry agent. But, of course, the West African reminiscences were only part of a necessary pose. He wasn't a friend at all, but a paid spy. Then who... Wave after wave of sick enlightenment broke over Lydia. Has Lady Honoret... She began, hardly knowing what she said. You scarcely understand even yet, said Mr. Codd compassionately, and yet with an underlying streak of satisfaction in his voice as though at the entire success of his disguise. It's like this, Miss Raymond. Sir Rupert here had to find out, to put the matter in a nutshell, whether he had adequate grounds on which to file a petition for divorce. He very wisely put the matter into the hands of a most eminent firm, which I have the honor to represent. Lydia, like many another girl of her age and standing, seldom read a newspaper. She had been taught that divorce was a shocking word, not mentioned among decent people. The occasional gossip at the boarding house arising from paragraphs in so-called society papers constituted the nearest view that she had ever had of the ugly phenomenon. Shaking all over, she burst into tears that were an actual physical relief. Do you mean to tell me that you had no idea at all of her ladyship's little games? said Sir Rupert almost threateningly. I thought you were as thick as thieves. No, cried Lydia, wildly repudiating she knew not what. You've seen that damn fellow Casella hanging about. Lydia nodded her head, barely understanding the implication. I told you so, Sir Rupert, Mr. Codd said. I was certain that Miss Raymond could know nothing but we shall have plenty of witnesses without her. The word witnesses, associated in a vague, muddled way in Lydia's mind with the barely apprehended horrors of the police court, filled her with panic. I don't know anything about it, she gasped and rose to her feet. Let me go. Not so fast, said Sir Rupert with sudden renewed suspicion. How am I to know that you aren't concealing valuable evidence? I tell you, I am going to see this thing through if I have to drag the lot of you through the courts to do it. Mr. Codd shook his head and put a fearless hand on the Jew's trembling shoulder. Now, now, Sir Rupert, this is most natural, but you're frightening the young lady. When the proper time comes, she will conceal nothing that is necessary for the pursuit of justice. But I assure you that last night's testimony will, will do the trick in vulgar parlance. 
we have more than enough evidence to institute proceedings at once as i have told you already lydia wrenched at the door handle and found herself she scarcely knew how out of the room with its echo of horrible words shaking from head to foot she went downstairs what had happened was no longer incomprehensible to her but her ignorance inspired her with terrible fears as to the result to herself of the cataclysm could they put her into a witness box perhaps try her for having falsified lady honoret's accounts the innate provincialism in lydia rose up and turned her almost sick with the thought of a publicity that must shame her so unutterably in the eyes of her relations aunt beryl the senthovens uncle george mr monteagle almond all of them their names rushed to her mind in a chaotic bewilderment of horror with a new sudden pang in the midst of so much that stabbed lydia remembered old mr palmer and his kindly hesitating inquiries as to the tone of the household where lydia had chosen to work after all then he had known best it seemed to her shaken perceptions almost a natural continuation of the thought that she should hear a voice speaking to her in the hall connected with all the infinitely distant and regretted piece of her devonshire visit something has happened can i do anything she saw clement de merrill and realized with distraught passionate gratitude that the solicitude in his kind anxious face was for herself crying and sobbing in an abandonment such as she had never known even in the days of her already self-controlled childhood lydia pushed him into the empty drawing-room out of the way of the prying servants it's frightful frightful she sobbed there's been a detective and i never knew and sir rupert is going to divorce lady honoret and he thinks i know about it and can be a witness don't let me take me away help me somehow oh you poor child said clement de merrill and he put lydia into an armchair and knelt down on one knee beside her End of chapter nineteen recording by c j plogue Chapter Twenty of the Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Never could Lydia forget the nightmare horror of the hours that followed. The only comfort to be found, but it was a very substantial one, was in Mr. Damerel's kindness, almost tenderness. It was he who took her away from Lexham Gardens in a cab and drove with her to the boarding house, where he saw Miss Nettleship himself and explained that Miss Raymond had had a great shock and ought to stay quietly in her own room for a day or two if it could be managed without too much trouble and not be worried to talk to any one that'll be quite all right i quite understand how it is miss nettleship repeated certainly without any grounds for the last assertion but evidently with the kindest intentions and her hand clasping lydia's while her round brown eyes were fixed anxiously upon mr damerel's face she was very kind to lydia and came and sat with her that evening and lydia completely unnerved told her the whole story miss nettleship confined all her comments to pitying ejaculations on lydia's behalf poor dear how dreadful for her to be mixed up in such a thing and how abominable of that sir rupert honoret to pretend that he thought she knew anything about it she had been most dignified and brave miss nettleship was sure while that horrible man was insulting her and how right to trust that kind gentleman like young clergyman and tell him all about it miss nettleship's championship and her praise of lydia's discretion made lydia feel much more composed if only by presenting to her a new aspect of the case at first she had only been conscious that she might yet find herself held partly responsible for wicked lady honoret's minor peccadilloes at least and inclined to reproach herself bitterly for not having listened to old mr palmer's advice now she saw that it was possible for her venture to be viewed as that of an innocent victim placed in a most difficult and dramatic position through no fault of her own in the eyes of mr clement de merrill and miss nettleship she was the heroine of the situation lydia had adjusted herself to this role without difficulty when two days later aunt beryl made an unexpected appearance maria nettleship wrote to me dearie you mustn't be vexed with her but she really felt the responsibility too much for her and that mr damerel the clergyman advised it 
You'll come home and have a good rest now, won't you? Lydia could really see no alternative. Without a salary, it would be Aunt Beryl and Uncle George who would be paying her expenses at the boarding house, and she realized for the first time that neither from the honorette establishment nor from Madame Elena, infuriated at the manner of Lydia's departure from the shop, was she likely to receive a reference that would enable her easily to obtain another post. Moreover, she still felt that it would be almost intolerable to hear the affair at Lexham Gardens discussed, as it must be, by all the boarders. Lydia agreed to go back with Aunt Beryl to Regency Terrace. It was understood that Miss Nettleship would convey to the boarders that recent events had caused Lydia to leave the service of Sir Rupert Honoret with every credit to herself, and that her aunt had taken her home for a much-needed rest. Clement de Merrill came to say good-bye to her at a time when Aunt Beryl, to Lydia's secret relief, was out. Lydia, much less self-confident than usual, asked nervously whether any further developments had taken place at Lexham Gardens. I have seen Mr. Codd again, and he assures me there is nothing for you to be afraid of. I practically got a definite assurance from him that there would be no question of your name appearing in the case. Of course he was cautious, as those people must be, I suppose, but I think you can set your mind at rest. In any case, if there is any idea of calling you as a witness, he has promised to let me know in good time, and I will do everything, anything, to shield you from anything so painful said Mr. Damerel with agitation. I think influence could be brought to bear. Thank you very, very much, said Lydia. She felt shaken and tired and almost childishly grateful for his companionship. Will you let me know how you are and, and your plans later on, asked the young man gently. When I know myself, I will write to you, said Lydia rather mournfully. I feel as though I'd failed. And I did want to do some work, and do credit to my aunt and uncle, and perhaps be of a little help to them. Clement de Merrill would not let her despond. She had been splendidly brave, and proved herself to be a most efficient worker, and other opportunities would come to her hand. The sense of failure was only a natural reaction after the shock she had undergone. There might, Clement de Merrill hesitated, he felt sure there would be opportunities, undreamed of for the exercise of her splendid gifts. Might he write to her from time to time? Perhaps he could put work in her way. Lydia thanked him again and gave him the Regency Terrace address. Goodbye, and let me know if there is anything, anything, said Clement de Merrill, and went away after wringing her hand. As Lydia recovered her poise of mind, she was not unaware of a private wish that he had told her rather more as to what had happened at Lexham Gardens after her summary departure, and taken it less for granted that her only preoccupation was that she should be spared the possibility of an appearance in court. After all, it was an exciting affair, and likely to prove notorious to a high degree. If one had to be so closely connected with the scene of action, it seemed foolish not to know more than other people of the steps that had led to the cataclysm. Lydia came to this point of view by degrees, partly ashamed of herself for so coming, and yet urged on to it by Aunt Evelyn's perfectly shameless absorption in every detail that she could extract from her niece bearing upon the forthcoming scandal. The case won't come on for another six months, I dare say, exclaimed Aunt Evelyn, suddenly become an authority by virtue of her protracted perusal of all that a little bird had to say in the society columns of her favorite journals. Of course, I quite understand about your not wanting to talk of it, dear, but I'm afraid it'll be one of those regular society cause celebre that the illustrated papers and all will take hold of. And Evelyn proved a perfectly true prophet. In rather less than six months, the Honoret divorce case was figuring in flaunting headlines throughout the press. Aunt Evelyn and Olive were again staying at the Osborne, and the former, at any rate, seemed never to be without a printed sheet fluttering in her hand. Fancy they've got a photograph of the house. I suppose they think it'll interest people, but it seems morbid, too, in a way, doesn't it? Which is the window of the room you worked in, Lydia? It was at the back of the house, said Lydia briefly. Nevertheless, a sort of fascination brought her to Aunt Evelyn's side to gaze at the smudged outline of the steps and area railings, which was really all that could be distinguished on the page. 
Just fancy if they got at you, Lyd, and wanted your photograph or something. They might, you know, said Olive. Wouldn't it be frightful? What would you do? She'd enjoy it very much, my dear. Nearly as much as you and your mother, said an unexpected voice in acid falsetto. They had forgotten that Grandpapa was in the room. Lydia would have liked to protest indignantly, but for one thing it would have been without any effect upon Grandpapa, and for another she had a lurking and almost unpleasing conviction that he was speaking the truth. Quite insensibly, during the monotony of the last five months at Regency Terrace, she had come to depend for her only excitement upon the local importance attaching to her as a first-hand authority upon the prevalent topic of gossip, the big divorce case of the moment. There were even times when she could have wished for that very contingency that at first had struck such terror in her mind, her own summons as a witness in the case. She hardly cared on which side. In any event, she would make a good witness, she knew, clear-headed, with an excellent memory and untroubled by nervousness. But Mr. de Merrill had written a great many times to assure her that she need not be afraid of being called, and in his last letter had said how very thankful he was to be able to reassure her once and for all on the point. As things were going, he had been told on good authority that Miss Raymond's testimony would not be required. Mr. Damerel's congratulations, which he applied to himself almost as freely as to Lydia, so much did he seem to have taken the question to heart, were very pleasant. Lydia liked receiving his letters, written in a small, rather meticulous handwriting, and she even liked the careful inditing of her own replies. But life seemed to have come to a standstill, and the return to the monotonous Regency Terrace routine, hardly varying from that which had prevailed there in her twelfth year, was depressing to Lydia. Grandpapa took hardly any notice of her, and had grown much older. He now sat in silence for hours at a time, only brightening into momentary gleams of his old elfish humor when Aunt Beryl or Uncle George reported some fresh eccentricity of the irrepressible shamrock. He seemed to have forgotten his old predilection for Lydia's society, and though she tried to talk to him and amuse him, it had become much more difficult. When she gave him an ironical account of Miss Forster's perpetual boasting of her friendship with Sir Rupert and Lady Honoret, Grandpapa remarked crudely, She may thank her stars at any rate that she didn't force herself into the house as their paid dependent. And when she tried to interest him with an account of all the new activities in which she had taken part during her visit to Devonshire, he replied coldly, I can quite believe that you helped your friends in their parish, my dear, until they hadn't a leg to stand upon between them. Lydia was so much annoyed that she most unwisely inquired, with great indignation in her voice, what Grandpapa meant. "'You're a situation snatcher, Liddy,' said her grandparent solemnly. "'That's what you are. You always were, even as a little child. Whatever the situation may be, or whom it may belong to, you'll always manage to snatch the best of it for yourself.' After that, Lydia gave up attempting to revive her old alliance with Grandpapa altogether. She spent that spring and early summer rather drearily, missing the regular work to which she had become accustomed, and above all the many new people she had been meeting. Her second book proved more difficult to write than had her first, and she worked at it indifferently and without much satisfaction. Most of her days passed in making clothes that she saw no opportunity of wearing, and in listening to Olive Senthoven's grumbling talk about her short, incessant cough. Towards the middle of the summer, Aunt Evelyn went home, and Olive came to live altogether at Regency Terrace, because the sea air was supposed to be good for her chest. Otherwise, the monotony of the days remained unbroken. The greatest surprise of Lydia's whole life was the proposal of marriage that she received at the end of that uneventful summer from Clement de Merrill. She had not seen him since the debacle at Lexham Gardens, and, although his letters were frequent, she had come to look upon them as mere impersonal expressions of the interest taken by a clergyman in someone whom he had befriended at a trying crisis. Otherwise, Lydia had argued, he would have suggested coming to see her, or even that she should go up to London for the day and meet him for lunch or tea. But when the Honoret case was over and Sir Rupert had been granted his decree, Mr. Clement de Merrill really had nothing further to write about, 
and Lydia was not surprised to receive from him a very brief note saying that he was going to Devonshire for a week to see his mother. Lydia wished languidly that Natalie Palmer would invite her to the rectory, and felt a momentary gleam of hope when she received a letter with the Ashloo postmark. Her eyes widened as she read, Mr. Demerrill is at Quintmere, and the other day I went up for tennis. We talked a lot about you, and he seemed so frightfully sorry for you about that dreadful lady on Arette, and said you had behaved splendidly. I think he likes you awfully, Lydia, and I'm sure he's been talking about you to Lady Lucy, because she asked me a whole lot about you afterwards, and seemed so interested. Of course, I told her heaps of nice things, and she said Mrs. Damerel had read your book and liked it, but she never reads novels herself. Father went up to Quintmere yesterday and was there ages, but he didn't tell me what it was about. Only he was frightfully absent-minded all the evening, and after supper, though we hadn't mentioned your name, he suddenly said, How old did you say little Lydia was, my dear? So I can't help guessing that he and Lady Lucy had been talking about you, too. I hope Father wouldn't call this letter schoolgirls gossip but I expect he would, so I'll stop. Lydia had hardly had time to attach all the various implications possible to Natalie's surprising statements when she received another note from Mr. Damerel. He was coming back to London the next day and hoped that he might be allowed to see Miss Raymond. Could he run down for the afternoon from town and call upon her? Finally, and significantly, instead of being hers very sincerely as hitherto, he asked Lydia to believe him hers ever, Clement de Merrill. Lydia's spirit woke from the lethargy that had crept upon it during that long, dull spell of months at Regency Terrace. She felt excited, but also perfectly calm and alert. She decided instantly that she did not want Mr. Damerel at Regency Terrace. Aunt Beryl might be all very well, and Uncle George, but who knew what Grandpapa might elect to say or to do, and Olive was impossible. No. She had no desire to exploit her home life before Mr. Damerel, who had only seen her as the Palmer's guest at Ashloo Rectory, or else as the quiet, reliable, and self-reliant young secretary at Lexham Gardens. She preferred that their next meeting should take place upon neutral territory. Aunt Beryl, said Lydia that evening, shall you go up to London for the day before the sales are over? Not this time, dear. There's nothing I really want, and Aunt Evelyn is kindly going to see about matching that sewing silk for me. It was the only thing I had on my mind, such a difficult shade. Aunt Beryl continued to darn her second-best tablecloth, and Lydia, who was never impetuous, waited quietly. If you thought of going up yourself, dear, it would be quite an idea. It would be a little outing for you and Olive, if she's not afraid of the bad air. The tubes are very stuffy, and the trains are always so crowded nowadays. I'm sure Bob would be too delighted to meet you somewhere for lunch. Lydia was quite sure of it, too, and equally certain that she should not avail herself of Bob's escort. Mr. Damerel wants to see me, I think. I don't know what it's about. He may have another post in view for me, perhaps. Anyway, I think perhaps if it isn't unkind, I'd rather go up without Olive. You know what she's like about things, Auntie. Certainly, she's one for getting ideas into her head, is Olive. Aunt Beryl admitted thoughtfully, sucking a piece of thread. But is it all right, dear, you going up alone like this? He's quite a young man, isn't he? Though I suppose it's all right as he's a clergyman. Of course, said Lydia energetically. I shall simply go up by the ten o'clock train and do a little shopping. Better take advantage of the sales as they are on, after all, and then probably see him after lunch and find out what he wants to say, and come back quite early. It's just business. Well, that seems all right, Aunt Beryl doubtfully agreed. I suppose, as he's a parson, he wouldn't have asked you to come without it was necessary. Lydia forbore to explain that this was not what Mr. de Merrill had asked her to do, because it was exactly what she had hoped that Aunt Beryl would think. She wrote a business-like note to Mr. de Merrill, explaining that she should be in London on the following Monday, and offering to make an appointment with him at any time and place convenient to himself. In answer, de Merrill telegraphed that he would meet her train. 
Lydia considered it fortunate that she encountered the telegraph boy on the very threshold and received her missive direct. Otherwise she would certainly have had to explain the contents to the household, for telegrams were not common at Regency Terrace. She told herself that it was very foolish and a great pity to let her relatives attach significance to small events which, after all, did not in any way concern themselves, but she was all the time aware of a certain excitement growing within her. When Monday morning came, and she stepped into the train, Lydia felt that infinite possibilities might lie ahead of her. When Clement de Merrill, after greeting her eagerly at the station, asked whether he might take her to lunch at the house of an uncle and aunt, my mother's unmarried brother and sister, who would be delighted to make her acquaintance, she felt a shock of astonishment. He could not have much to say to her if he thus deliberately avoided a tete-a-tete, when he could so easily have suggested a lion's restaurant or a quiet tea-shop. Lydia accepted the invitation, but said that she had shopping to do and would find her own way to Eaton Place later on. She was never afterwards able to recapitulate her impressions of that visit. She knew that the aunt seemed old and kind and very like Lady Lucy, and that a still older uncle sat at the head of the table, and had to be shouted at before he could hear anything at all, and that the courses were much plainer and less numerous than those that had figured at Lady Honoret's luncheon parties. She also felt, rather than knew, that Clement de Merrill was nervous, and this perception, together with a subconscious preoccupation as to the reason for his nervousness, made her feel more shy than was usual with her. When the aunt and uncle drifted away after lunch was over, the old lady, saying kindly that she knew Clement would like to show Miss Raymond the pictures in the library, her head was almost swimming, and she felt absolutely frightened lest she should be about to faint. The revulsion of feeling when she actually heard his gentle voice speaking to her and knew that she had been right, and that he was asking her to be his wife, came to her as a positive relief from an almost unendurable physical tension much as she would afterwards have liked to recall every word of their conversation in the library where they spent almost the whole of that afternoon uninterrupted lydia could never do so the utmost that she was able to recapture was her own sense of bewilderment that she was not yet merged in triumphant realization and the sense of clement de merrill's extreme gentleness and consideration for her he would not even ask her for an immediate answer I know it can't be with you as it is with me, dearest. The first moment I saw you, I knew I'd found my ideal. That, at least, Lydia could remember. And again, you must think it over, not only whether you can care for me a little bit, but whether you can face the life of a dull country parson's wife. That's what it'll end in, Lydia. When dear old Palmer retires, my mother wants me to come home, and there's work, even there. Besides, I must think of her. She's growing old, and my brother's death was a fearful blow. Lydia, I should never had the courage to think of this, I don't suppose, if I hadn't seen you first at work. Not afraid to take up employment for the sake of your own independence, and the people who'd taken care of your childhood. Lydia listened to him almost as though she were in a dream. I don't think I'm good enough, she once faltered and the ardor of his protestations startled her afresh. But I never knew, never guessed for a minute that you felt like that. She found herself voicing the amazement that possessed her. Didn't you? said Damerel wistfully. Sometimes I thought you couldn't help guessing. But it wouldn't have been fair to say anything while you were so much upset about that horrible affair of the honorettes. And then, well, Lydia, you'll let me call you that, won't you? It's such a dear little name. I'll be honest with you and tell you that I couldn't have helped coming to see you, at least if my dear old mother hadn't implored me to keep right away for a time and make perfectly certain of my own feelings. She guessed, of course, that time last summer when you were with the Palmers, but she's old-fashioned, and though of course she couldn't help seeing how, how wonderful you are in every way, one has to make allowances for the novelty to people of her generation, of ones wanting to marry anybody who isn't either a more or less distant connection, or else Devonshire born and bred. You do understand. Lydia understood very little. 
she gathered a vague impression that Lady Lucy was surprised, perhaps even distressed, at her son's choice, but she would make no opposition to it, and Clement de Merrill repeated again and again that his mother had only to know Lydia rather better in order to love her. Dear old Palmer went up and talked to her last week. I asked him to, and he couldn't say enough of your cleverness and the wonderful way in which you'd helped them in the parish down there, just as though you'd been born to it. It did make me hope, Lydia, that perhaps after all you wouldn't mind a lifetime of that sort of work. Clement de Merrill said a very great deal more, but he would not press Lydia for a definite promise, and she was slightly relieved not to find herself bound, although the conviction was growing within her that she meant all the time, as soon as the first shock of surprise had left her, to accept his devotion proudly and joyfully. It was like nothing that she'd ever experienced or imagined, and though the response invoked in her by his ardor was more in the nature of mental appreciation for his methods than anything else, she felt an increasing satisfaction glowing within her. Still as though she were in a dream, she rose when the old aunt, with a great deal of preliminary rattling at the door, came in and obeyed her gentle bidding to come upstairs for a cup of tea before going to the station. It was only afterwards that she became aware of having noted, with surprised approval, her hostess's total lack of any apparent curiosity as to the result of the long conference in the library. Certainly Aunt Evelyn's eyes, to say nothing of Olive's, would almost have been starting from their heads with sheer eagerness to hear what had happened. Even Aunt Beryl was not above the extremely transparent device of having come to meet Lydia at the station on her return and they had hardly passed the ticket collector's little barrier before she said, Well, Lydia found it simplest to explain that she was really rather tired, and she could talk it all over with Auntie tomorrow. It? Well, yes. Mr. Damerel had really had something special to say to her, but she didn't feel able to talk about it. She must have time to think things over. By a final inspiration, Lydia suggested that Aunt Beryl should be really kind and prevent Olive from bombarding her with questions as to the way in which her day had been spent, thus successfully precluding the very obvious possibility of Aunt Beryl's joining in the bombardment herself, as well as propitiating her by the suggestion of an alliance between them. Whatever else Aunt Beryl might be, she was loyal. Lydia was able to register a fleeting mental acknowledgment of the fact in the days that followed. And in the end, she actually found herself almost asking counsel of this faithful relative, although she knew inwardly that her mind was already made up, and had been so from the first word of Clement de Merrill's proposal. But it was reassuring to hear Aunt Beryl's outburst of unhesitating satisfaction. Nothing could be nicer than a clergyman, declared Aunt Beryl almost as though she supposed her niece to be in need of reassurance as to her suitor's social standing. And the people you knew at the Palmers and all. I must say, Lydia, I always thought you'd settle down early, though even Aunt Beryl didn't agree with me, saying you'd get no opportunities, working and rubbish of that sort. And, after all, you'll be engaged and married before poor Olive, let alone Beatrice and that scallywag of a young swain. I'm afraid he's nothing else. Well, I am pleased, dearie. Then you think it will be all right? Lydia asked eagerly, wondering whether Aunt Beryl had altogether realized the difference between Mr. de Merrill and anybody to whom Beatrice or Olive Senthoven might have aspired. Why shouldn't it be all right? You're the very girl for a parson's wife. So energetic and all, and look at the way you've enjoyed helping Natalie Palmer last summer. And if he goes to a country living, as you say, it's just what you'll like very different to a London curate. Nice for the old lady, too, to have you both settle down next door to her, said Aunt Beryl calmly. You mean Lady Lucy. You know she has her daughter-in-law and little grandson living with her at Quintmere. That's the widow, is it? Poor thing. It's very nice him being so well connected. Your mother would have been well pleased at that, Lydia. Her own people were county, she always said, though I never knew any of them. That was the way Aunt Beryl looked at it. The simplicity of her point of view did but little, however, towards counteracting Lydia's annoyance at the way in which others of her little circle expressed themselves when she was able to announce to them that she was really and definitely engaged to be married quite shortly to Mr. Clement de Merrill. Uncle George, indeed, merely said, 
Well, it's a great stroke of luck, my dear, but you deserve it if ever a girl did, and I consider him a lucky young man, even though you haven't got a handle to your name. Mr. Monteagle Almond was more decorous, though Lydia, self-trained to other standards, hoped that Clement would never hear his grandiloquent references to the sacred calling that was all too seldom dignified by the members of our ancient aristocracy. Aunt Evelyn wrote an excited letter that might almost have been a page from Burke's landed gentry. So many details did it contain as to the family into which her niece was marrying, and Olive, in lady's opinion, was quite as impossible as she had always been. Fancy you sly thing going and getting engaged like that before either of us, whatever will Bob say. We always used to chafe him about having a soft corner for you in his heart, you know, Lyd. As for poor old B sticking to her Stanley without a dog's chance of ever being able to marry him, you've put her nose out of joint all right. I'm only rotting out, you know. Old girl, we're all awfully pleased. I'm sure that you've done so well for yourself. What's the old lady like, Lyd? Shall you get on with her? Fancy you with a ladyship for your mamma in law But of all the congratulations that Lydia received, with feelings that were, to say the least of it, mixed, those which disconcerted her most thoroughly came from her grandfather. Going to be married to the Reverend Damerel, are you? said Grandpapa. And hobnob with all sorts of fine folks, your aunt tells me. I'm not at all surprised to hear it of you, Liddy. I quite expected you'd do something of the sort. Then Grandpapa began to chuckle, and something almost sinister crept into his tone, although he had turned away from Lydia and pretended to be addressing himself to Shamrock. What was it we always used to say, little dog? Eh? There's no such thing as can't? That's it. No such thing as can't. End of chapter 20 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter Twenty One of the Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield. Lydia Raymond was Lydia Damerel. She had been Lydia Damerel for a year, for five years, for ten. It had all slipped by with inconceivable rapidity. She had been twenty and married to a young man whose social antecedents were entirely different from her own, who was very much in love with her indeed and of whom she was both rather fond and very proud. Her wedding had not been spoilt by Grandpapa's death. On the contrary, it had simplified things very much, and as neither Aunt Beryl nor Uncle George would hear of any postponement, Lydia's marriage had taken place from the rectory at Ashlew, and Natalie and the Demerals themselves had pitied her greatly for having no relations of her very own at the quiet wedding. They were very sorry about Grandpapa, too, and Lydia told them of his shrewd wisdom, and Clement regretted very much that he had never seen him. Indeed, as things fell out, he saw none of Lydia's relations. After they were married, they went to live in London for a year, at the end of which it was understood that old Mr. Palmer would retire and Clement take his place at Ashlew. Uncle George and Aunt Beryl remained on in the house at Regency Terrace, and because it was too large for them, as Aunt Beryl put it, but you see Grandpapa's pension went with him, as Aunt Evelyn mysteriously murmured, they received a paying guest in the person of Mr. Monteagle Almond, so that it would not have been any easier for Aunt Beryl to leave the house, even for a little while, than it had been in the old days. The Demerels went down to Quintmere for the birth of Lydia's baby, and arrived just in time to hear the rather sudden announcement of Natalie Palmer's engagement to the young officer's son, home on leave from India, of an Exeter solicitor. Lady Lucy, who was fond of Natalie, took a great interest in it all, and in the many discussions as to whether Natalie could marry at once, as Captain Kennedy urged, and go out to India, and if so, what would become of the old rector left all alone? She had never shown greater warmth to her new daughter-in-law than when Lydia suggested, very modestly, that Mr. Palmer should remain at the rectory and let Clement act as his curate during his lifetime. Clement thinks there is more than enough work for one old man and one young man, and energetic one. Indeed, yes. But, my dear, you've only been married a year. Could you really be happy without having your home to yourselves? 
Natalie ought to have her chance, said Lydia thoughtfully. And though she will be so dreadfully missed, I would try and take on her work. Dear child, it's very good of you. It must be a sacrifice to share your first home, even with the dear old rector. Everyone was very grateful to Lydia. Good-looking Captain Kennedy wrung her hand and her eyes still shadowed by the tears she had shed at the thought of letting her Jack go to India by himself for another three years, could only tell Lydia and Lady Lucy that all her happiness would be owing to them. To Lydia, my dear, said old Lady Lucy, the suggestion was Lydia's. Natalie would never have left me all alone, said the old rector simply, and I couldn't have borne to feel that I stood in the way of her happiness. I hope I shall be very little in your way, Lydia, indeed. But it is very good of you, my child. So Natalie was married, in haste, because there was so much to be done before the young couple must sail for India, and the only shadow cast upon the day was Lydia's absence. She was ill, and Lady Lucy could only give half her attention to the bride, even at the ceremony, and Clement de Merrill, none at all. Of the Quintmere people, only little Billy and his nursery governess came to the rectory for the wedding breakfast, and the governess frightened many people by whispering that Mrs. Clement had been taken ill the day before and that the doctor was anxious about her. Attention was much divided between this rumor, distracting to many people to whom Mr. Clement's pretty young wife had made herself charming, and the bride herself full of distress at the news. Natalie's last injunction, indeed, was that her father should telegraph news of Lydia. That night Lydia's daughter was born, and there was no further cause for anxiety. Lydia had wanted to call her Ivy, but it was easy to see that old Lady Lucy disliked so fanciful a name. Now, Mary, my dear, that's the name I should have chosen for my daughter if I had ever had one. Or why not some family name, Margaret, or my dear mother's name, Jane? though I know that's out of fashion nowadays, but there's a very pretty substitute, Joan. Or I hear that Dorothy and Marjorie are favorite names nowadays if you want something a little bit romantic. Lydia had known too many Dorothys and Marjories at school to think either name in the least romantic, but she said amiably, I think Jane is quaint. I could call her Jane. She was very desirous of pleasing her mother-in-law, and she had wanted a boy so much that it hardly seemed to her to matter what a girl should be called. "'Are you really going to have the baby christened Jane?' said Joyce Demerel in her abrupt fashion. "'I think it's very hard on her. She won't like it later on. People always laugh at Jane nowadays. Plain Jane.' Lydia did not like her sister-in-law, although she never said so to anyone and gave no sign of her dislike. But Joyce's protest turned her half-serious suggestion into a resolution, and the baby was christened Jane Lucy, to the great contentment of its grandmother. And Joyce Demerel's prophecy came true. Later on, Jane did not like being Jane. She disliked it so much as a determined little grey-eyed thing of nine years old that she announced an intention of becoming Jenny. Lydia, already frightened at certain of her own characteristics reproduced with an astonishing vigor in her daughter, combated this on principle. But Joyce Demerel supported her niece, and she and Billy called her Jenny. The servants said, Miss Jenny, because otherwise they could get no attention from the little rebel. The villagers took to calling her Miss Jenny. Everyone called her Jenny, even most illogically, Lady Lucy. It was Lydia's first defeat, and took place before Jenny was ten years old. Lydia had been married nearly twelve years. She seldom let herself own that marriage had been a disappointment to her. Indeed, it was only sometimes that she realized it, for her position, her energetic life in the country parish, the liking and respect that she had certainly won for herself from all these people amongst whom she had come as a stranger from another world, all brought her a very real satisfaction and contentment. Sometimes, however, the change that had crept gradually and almost imperceptibly over her husband obtruded itself before her notice and vexed her. Clement had ceased to make any demands upon her. Why? It was unjust. Lydia knew that she had never failed to smile in response to a caress from him, to express interest in anything of which he spoke with enthusiasm, 
even when her judgment sometimes told her that the enthusiasm was misplaced or exaggerated, and to take her due share and sometimes more of the work to which he gave his life. Yet it was impossible for her shrewd perceptions, developing yet more as the years went on, to fail in perceiving that her husband mysteriously, unjustly, she could not help feeling, was failing her more and more in spontaneity of intercourse. Clement, you never told me the mare had behaved so badly this afternoon. Billy says you came off. It was up again in a few seconds. Nothing to worry about, dear. I wish you'd told me. Always let other people talk about themselves, Clement laughed as he made the quotation of which Lydia had told him long ago. But that's my rule, cried Lydia quickly. You know I always do let the other people talk about themselves. It's a sort of habit now. I don't talk about myself, do I, Clement? Please tell me if I do. But you don't, dear. Why should the quick assurance leave one so vexed and dissatisfied? Twelve years married. It had all gone by very quickly. The old ridiculous boarding-house days seemed like something read of in a book long while ago and half forgotten. Lydia had never seen Miss Nettleship or any of the boarders or any of the girls at Madame Elena's since her hasty departure from London and the House of the Honorettes. At first, Miss Forster had written to her occasionally, gushing, reminiscent letters that never failed to hold broad hints of Miss Forster's readiness to be invited down to Devonshire. Clement had urged Lydia to send for her friends, any of them. Wouldn't she like Rosie Graham, the little pale cashier girl about whom she had told him, or some old school friend from Regency Terrace days? Anyone. But Lydia explained that none of them had really been friends, and it wasn't at all necessary for them to be invited. Clement, she added to herself, might be nice to everyone. In fact, it was part of his job. But what would old Lady Lucy, conventional and narrow-minded, think of some of those old associates, when she had really only just begun to like and cordially accept Lydia herself. So the old associates, who had none of them really been friends, were allowed to disappear altogether from the life of Mrs. Clement de Merrill. She did see her Senthoven relations after a long interval of years. Uncle Robert died rather suddenly, and very shortly afterwards Aunt Beryl wrote and told Lydia that Beatrice had married Stanley Swain, much against her mother's wishes. Bob, taking most of the little capital left by his father, had gone to Canada. Olive and Aunt Evelyn had left Wimbledon and had gone to live at a flat in Earl's Court. It was there that Lydia, taking nine-year-old Jenny to London in order that a really good dentist might give advice about a plate, met them in the street. Aunt Evelyn was unaltered, but Lydia would hardly have recognized Olive in the stooping, emaciated woman with a hard-looking flush burnt into either cheek. Lid, old girl, I don't believe you've grown a day older. Well, married life has suited you all right, that's clear. Come and have tea at our little hole. Do now. You must, dear. It's years since I've seen you. And dear little Jenny there. Come along, it's quite close. They went. The two-roomed flat was tiny and dingy, and perpetually lit by incandescent gas. Olive got the tea ready, and whilst they heard her clattering about in the adjoining room, which apparently served the purposes of double bedroom and of storeroom alike, Aunt Evelyn said anxiously, "'She's altered a bit, hasn't she, poor girl? It's an awful thing, this tuberculosis. Goodness knows how she started it. They were all healthy children enough. It's the Senthoven side, of course. Whatever you do, Lydia, take care of that child there. She looks splendid, and of course living in the proper country must make a difference. But one never knows. Look at me. If anyone had told me that Olive would go the way she has, or Beatrice marry a fellow like that Stanley, poor Aunt Evelyn broke off with tears in her eyes. May Jenny go and help with tea? Aunt Evelyn nodded speechlessly and pointed to the door. When Jenny had gone, Lydia took her aunt's hand in hers. I do feel so sorry. I never knew. Aunt Beryl didn't tell me how bad poor Olive was. Oh, Beryl, 
She's been good to us, I must say, and had Olive there again and again, but one gets used to things, I suppose. I do myself. It was just seeing you unexpectedly like Lydia brought things back a bit. And poor Robert and all, and with that dear little child. She's like you in face, only sturdier, isn't she? But you've improved in style, you know, dear. There's no denying, said Aunt Evelyn candidly. Money does make a difference. I never thought we should come to what we have come, Olive and I. You remember that nice house at Wimbledon? This place is dreadful in the summer. It must look puny to you, too, after living in a real house in the country the way you do. Poor Aunt Evelyn. Lydia saw the furtive, eager look at the tea tray that Olive presently carried in, and noticed a shade of relief sweep across her face. Evidently, she had wondered if the resources of the flat would be equal to unexpected visitors. Does Jenny like bread and jam? That's right, dear. It's good homemade blackberry, Lydia. It won't hurt her. She can eat right the way through that dish if she likes. Sweet things are good for children. Jenny is never ill, said Lydia proudly. Don't you think she looks very strong? My goodness, yes. Aren't her legs sturdy? And she's more color than ever you had as a child. You ought to see poor old bee's kitties, said Olive gloomily. How many are there? Three. No, four. Isn't it, Mater? It's awful. Simply. And another one. Aunt Evelyn frowned and hushed, looking in the direction of little Jenny, who was staring at her new relations with big round eyes. The visitors did not stay very much longer. I better not kiss that kitty, I suppose, said Olive abruptly, and looked at Jenny's plump, freckled face with a sort of angry regretfulness. My word, she's a big girl for nine years old. They knew Jenny's age and her birthday, and all sorts of things with which it surprised Lydia very much to find them conversant. Aunt Evelyn said, You've never written any more books since the one story, have you? No, said Lydia, never. You see, I married very soon afterwards, and a clergyman's wife has plenty to do, always. I did begin a second book, but I never finished it. There were other reasons besides the one alleged for the non-fulfillment of Lydia's literary ambitions, however. Nobody at Quintmere had seemed to think it particularly praiseworthy that she should have written and published a successful novel, and Lady Lucy had once owned, in ignorance of Lydia's proximity, to an old-fashioned prejudice against women who scribbled. Clement, indeed, was proud of her novel, but he showed no disposition to tag an announcement of its existence on to her name whenever he introduced his friends to her, as Lady Honoret had done. Moreover, Lydia, perhaps more than she was aware, had been influenced by a violent reaction against Lady Honoret and all that her patronage had stood for. At all events, she wrote no more, and had very soon ceased to regret even the unfinished story begun just before her marriage, when it became clear that all the literature in existence would never, in the eyes of her new relations, count for anything at all besides the physical achievement of having brought into the world a healthy, handsome child, even although of the inferior sex. She would gladly have repeated her success, but Jenny remained an only child, and to Lydia's secret jealousy, Joyce Damerel's son Billy accordingly remained the only male representative of the younger generation. Lydia told Clement of her meeting with the Senthovens. He had never seen them, and Aunt Beryl but seldom, although on the rare occasions upon which Lydia was in London she made a point of taking little Jenny down to Regency Terrace to spend the day there. Poor things! I wonder if the girl has a good doctor. Get her down here, Lydia, for a couple of months. Good air and feeding up must make a difference. And couldn't her mother bring her? Then we could all talk things over. But it appeared that Lydia was nervous on account of Jenny. People said there was no danger, but one never knew. Anyhow, she couldn't risk having her in the same house as the child. But she had thought, if Clement agreed... What about a really good sanatorium and helping with the expense of sending Olive there for as long as the doctor recommended? Clement did agree, and took a great deal of trouble to arrange for Olive's admission to a big sanatorium not far from London. 
so that her mother can easily go and see her, poor thing. It was Lydia who went up to London and saw the Senthovens and begged Aunt Evelyn to let them do this, and soothed Olive's pride, which at first seemed likely to prove an obstacle in the way of the kind plans, by promising her that when she was quite cured and able to earn money for herself, she should repay all the expenses incurred. Because we aren't cadgers like that Stanley Swain, who's tried to touch every relation he or Beatrice have in the world for money said olive with a flaming face olive don't talk like that dear cried aunt evelyn bursting suddenly into tears lydia is a perfect angel and you don't know what it'll be to me to have you in proper surroundings of course olive gave in if only for her mother's sake and she too said that she had never meant to be ungrateful and that lydia was an angel their acquiescence was a great comfort to Lydia. Olive went to the sanatorium, and Aunt Evelyn gave up the flat and joined her sister and brother at Regency Terrace. Aunt Beryl, who never failed to send Lydia a weekly letter, wrote to her. Aunt E. can't say enough of your kindness. She was a wee bit hurt, I fancy, after your marriage, at your not seeing more of her and the girls, though I told her, dear, that you were very busy. But everything's quite forgotten now, and the reports from poor Olive v. Cheering. Such a lot, Aunt E. has to say of Jenny, calls her a splendid child in the picture of health. So glad, dear. Everyone was glad, and everyone was grateful. It was all most satisfactory, and helped Lydia to master her increased inclination for lying awake at nights, and wondering why Clement should have altered so much in the last four or five years why his reserve should extend to his wife who only wished to be sympathetic and how it would be possible to curb that obstinate self-will of jenny's little jenny who was idolized by her father and tacitly upheld by her aunt joyce lydia much vexed could foresee already that jenny was to grow up into the kind of girl who doesn't get on with her mother twelve years married I am a widow, reflected Lydia de Merrill, almost with the same secret complacency with which an intelligent and precocious little girl of twelve years old she had said to herself, I am an orphan. Clement had been seized by the new illness, the terrible appendicitis that had caused the postponement of King Edward's coronation a few years earlier, and after the operation, which the doctors called an entirely successful one, he had only lived forty-eight hours. Everyone said that Lydia had been wonderful. She had never left her husband, never broken down. She had shown thought and tenderness in the midst of her racking anxiety for poor, heartbroken Lady Lucy and for Mr. Palmer, the rector, very old and shaken. She had sent Jenny to Quintmere so that the little girl might have no frightening recollections of that closed door with the hospital nurse moving swiftly in and out bringing with her that faint unforgettable whiff of ether jenny should only remember her father lydia told lady lucy steadily as she had seen him last the grave pleasant companion who took her everywhere with him her hand clasped in his before he died clement said to his wife where's jenny at quintmere Joyce will look after her, and it was better for her. Did she want to go? It was better for her, repeated Lydia inexorably. One had to think of that, what was best for the child, and for many reasons Lydia would have dreaded Jenny's young, tempestuous presence in the house of death and mourning that the rectory speedily became. But when Jenny's father was dead, taken from them all in the midst of his work and strength and usefulness, Lydia had to tell his child of her loss. Keep her at Quintmere, she entreated of Joyce de Merrill, and let her come with you this afternoon and then go back again. Don't you want her here with you? Joyce asked, frankly disapproving. I don't want her to get frightened of this house and remember her father in connection with tearfulness and terror. And I don't want childish, noisy grief here, said Lydia in a low voice. My poor little Jenny. I ought to have taught her self-control earlier, perhaps. 
but after all, it did not seem as though Jennie lacked self-control, when her mother, in the shaded drawing-room, told her with gentleness and without tears that she was fatherless. Lydia herself had broken down and wept violently that day, alone with old Lady Lucy, but she had purposely prepared herself to break the news as colourlessly and unemotionally as possible to Jenny, dreading an outburst of the child's undisciplined grief. At first she was reassured. Jenny looked at her mother hard, as though to ascertain that she was not weeping, and then said nothing at all. You understand, my darling. God wanted father with him, and took him away, and we have to be very brave now and comfort one another. Then Jenny suddenly said angrily, There, I knew father would die. Nurse said not, and was angry with me, but I knew he would when they said he was ill. She actually stamped her foot. Hush, said Lydia mechanically, but inwardly she was infinitely relieved. Jenny was too young to understand. There would be no agonizing sorrow such as she had instinctively dreaded. Then she saw that a different look, frightened and puzzled, had come over Jenny's round baby face, babyish even for nine years old. Shan't I ever see him again, mother? Not here. You will when you go to heaven, said Lydia, speaking as though to a much younger child. But, but I didn't see him to say good-bye to. There was sorrow enough and to spare in the sudden cry. It was as though realization had just come to the tardy childish mind. Poor father, he was far, far too ill. Come here, Jenny. Lydia held out her arms, although demonstrations were very rare with her, and Jenny herself had never seemed greatly disposed toward any show of outward affection. She came towards her mother now almost reluctantly, and although she leaned against Lydia's shoulder, she did not put her arms around her neck. Jenny, you'll be a good child, and remember that we have no one but each other now. Yes, Mama. Jenny's voice was very low, and Lydia could not see her face, but she felt all at once that the sturdy little body pressed against her was shaking from head to foot. Poor little thing, said Lydia tenderly. She waited for the storm of tears that should follow, but none came. Oh, Jenny, Jenny, cried Lydia, and herself burst into tears, weakened by many sleepless nights. Mama, did you see him to say good-bye to? Didn't you? whispered Jenny presently. He wasn't all alone. I never left him for an instant. He was holding my hand all the time. Why couldn't I see him? wailed Jenny. He was too ill. And you were too little, darling. There was silence. Presently Lydia heard the sound of carriage wheels on the drive outside. Aunt Joyce is coming to take you back to Quintmere for a little longer, and in a few days I shall come too. Can't I stay here, Mamma? No, darling, it's better for you to be at Quintmere. Will Granny stay with you still? Yes. Now wait here quietly while I go out to Aunt Joyce. Lydia went into the hall, closing the drawing-room door behind her. Now you are quite sure you really want me to take Jenny back, or would she be of any comfort to you here? said Joyce. No, no, it is better for her to go with you. Oh, Joyce, she's too little to realize it. She hasn't even been crying. I'm very, very thankful. Joyce Damerel raised her brows in a quick, characteristic movement. She adored him. I wouldn't count too much on her not realizing, Lydia. Jenny may be slow, but her feelings are terribly violent. Lydia particularly disliked the suggestion, and inwardly resented the truth in it that she suspected. Please take her now, Joyce, if you're ready. She went into the drawing-room again and found Jenny sitting on the floor, her eyes dry but her face strangely white. The means of self-expression, either physical or mental, available to childhood, are curiously limited to the primitive, after all. "'I'm very sorry, Mama," said Jenny in a feeble, bewildered voice. "'I don't think I've been eating anything naughty, but I'm almost sure that I'm going to be sick.'" End of Chapter 21 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter Twenty Two of the Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield. 
this librivox recording is in the public domain in her heart lydia never quite forgave jenny for the three days illness that followed on her father's death it was joyce demerel who nursed the child and expressed to all inquiries her complete conviction that the violence of jenny's grief at her loss was alone responsible for a physical collapse unprecedented in her whole healthy childhood poor little girl people said it so often and with so much wonder and compassion that it almost seemed as though they forgot or minimized lydia's supreme claim to bereavement involuntarily she could not help remembering the resentment that had invaded her long ago at her own father's death when she had heard grown-up people say that she was too young to realize her loss when they had told her that her one thought now must be for her widowed mother jenny's youth was allowed rights that had never been conceded to lydia's with her mother's strength of will and personality it became more and more evident that jenny had inherited her father's depths of feeling if at nine years old she had been a personage not an appendage at seventeen she was a force during the years between lydia battled with her was unaware of ultimate defeat such as she had never experienced in her life before and grew to accept as part of herself an inward bitterness such as the efficient progress of her self-advanced early years had never dreamed of before she had reached the age of forty she felt sometimes as though the endless struggle to dominate jenny which she perfectly acknowledged to herself had worn her out sometimes she remembered words spoken to her long ago by the little pale london girl who had worked with her in the faraway time at madame elena's shop you never loved anyone i'm sorry for you when you do love you won't know how to set about it she loved jenny with a sentiment far more poignant than any that she had ever known for jenny's father she dimly realized that her love possessive and tyrannical was embittering both their lives you ought to send jenny away from home said joyce demerel once when jenny was of schoolgirl age home now was a very small house not more than a few miles away from quintmere no it might be hard on her but it would be the best thing for her joyce you don't seem to understand jenny is all i have and my one thought in the world now i had to let billy go when he was much younger billy is a boy jenny will outgrow this phase of thinking that she can't get on with her own mother lydia said this but she did not herself altogether believe it old lady lucy said that jenny was only a very young child and that lydia took a little self-will and naughtiness far too seriously but lady lucy never saw jenny at her worst when she was violent and rebellious and self-assertive only lydia saw that and she was beginning to realize that it was only she in whom lay something antagonistic that jenny apparently found in no one else sometimes jenny was contented and easy to live with for months at a time she loved the country and the country people whom she had known from her babyhood and she had magnificent health lydia would have liked her to form friendships such as her own with natalie amongst the contemporary daughters of squires and small landowners she thought jenny's independence of these a sign of self-satisfaction and unacknowledged to herself she felt a secret dislike of jenny's sturdy comradeship with her cousin billy and of her unfailing popularity with billy's friends the world was changing and the young womanhood of the new century exemplified in her daughter failed utterly to commend itself to lydia she had herself formed friendships in devonshire now and natalie kennedy and her husband were established not far from clist milton lydia knew that they and others amongst her own generation sometimes commented with wonder on jenny's inability to live at peace with a mother who so earnestly desired to make her happy the knowledge soothed her a little sometimes jenny it was only too evident did not require soothing she was except when in one of her undutiful fits of defiance calmly and arrogantly content sometimes lydia wished that her only daughter were pretty 
Sometimes she felt that beauty would have been such an additional asset to Jennie's already overweening claims on life, that it was almost a relief to know her devoid of it. She was not, except for a healthy complexion marred by tiny freckles, as good-looking as Lydia was even now. Of the square Damerel build, Jenny lacked her mother's grace, and her eyes were grey and very direct-looking, instead of sombre and slightly shadowed as were Lydia's. Her face was round instead of oval, and her thick hair was as straight as Lydia's own, and of a very much lighter brown. The only family likeness to be discovered in her, to Lydia's amused vexation, was to a faded old daguerreotype of Grandpapa Raymond as a young man. I suppose we're going to the cricket match this afternoon, Mama. If you like. Who's playing? Only Ashlew. Married v. Single. Billy's going to play. Well, we can go down after lunch. Put on a clean frock, please, Jenny, if you have one left. I haven't. Jenny said, without any regret in her voice. Lydia herself wore a crisp black-and-white foulard, and wished that Jenny appeared to be more aware of the contrast presented by her own stained and crumpled blue linen frock, made very short and with a black patent leather belt fastened with no attempt at trimness round Jenny's substantial waist. Her blue straw hat swung from her ungloved hand. Lydia took in every detail of her daughter's appearance, as she always did, but she made no comment. To nag was not only against her principles, but would have given Jenny a definite grievance of which to complain, and she was not altogether averse from letting Lady Lucy and the Kennedys and Joyce and Billy Damerel see for themselves to just what lengths Jenny's carelessness of her mother's known wishes would go. Jenny's arrival, however, was greeted with more enthusiasm than censure when they reached the little enclosure round the green-painted cricket pavilion. Hello, Jenny! Her cousin Billy, a fair, handsome boy a few years her senior, called out to her instantly. Who do you think's coming here tonight? And how do you think he's coming? Oh, not someone by aeroplane. Got it in one. It's Roland Valentine. Jenny's unrestrained shriek made her elders look round, but whilst Lydia studiously turned her head quickly away again, Lady Lucy said indulgently, Billy has been frantic with excitement all day. It seems that this young Canadian flying friend of his really does mean to come over here in his machine. I am really very curious myself. I hope he will arrive without accident. It will be a great event for these parts, placidly said Natalie Kennedy. She had lost her color in India and had not kept her figure like Lydia. She sat in the tea enclosure just where she had made the tea so often as a girl and watched the young and energetic daughter of the new curate making it now. The mania for flying is on the increase. Our boys talk of nothing else, her husband added. There may be something in it, Lydia said stiffly. She was really thinking of Jenny's incomprehensible passion for machinery, about which she was now talking to Billy with an assurance that Lydia found it irritating to listen to. Something in it, echoed Colonel Kennedy. But the whole future of the world may lie in it. Just think what it would mean if... Lydia had often heard the Colonel express his views before, and she did not pay much attention to him now although she wore her usual air of graceful attentiveness and kept her eyes intelligently raised to his face. The cricket match began, and presently the colonel stopped talking, and Lydia let her eyes stray round the familiar field, remembering that first summer that she had seen it, Sir Rupert Honoret's private secretary, taking a holiday with the kind people at the rectory. Lady Lucy's old pony cart was drawn up in the old place, just under the great elm tree, and further on a group of schoolchildren played and shouted, clambering over a pile of heavy wooden hurdles that were stacked together in a heap. Just as Lydia was looking at them, a very little boy of not more than five years old succeeded in clambering to the summit of the pile, and stood there triumphant, precariously straddling from the top of one hurdle to another. He ought not. It isn't safe flashed through Lydia's mind, and almost at the same moment the outermost hurdle slipped, and half the stack came crashing to the ground, 
bringing with it the little climbing boy. There were screams from the children, loudest of all from the child who lay pinned to the earth by the heavy pieces of wood. Lydia sprang instinctively to her feet, quicker of thought as of movement than either Natalie or her husband. The much-abused quality of presence of mind had always been essentially hers. But she was pushed on one side as a young, tall figure dashed out from behind the pavilion and tore with incredible speed across the grass. By the time the colonel's long legs had hurriedly reached the group of screaming children, and the men on the pitch had turned round and broken off their game, and the village spectators on the benches had understood that there had been an accident, Jenny's strong arms, unaided, had lifted the weighty hurdles and raised the shrieking child into her lap. Where does it hurt, Jackie? She was calmly running her hands over the little boy's limbs with all the air of an expert as Lydia approached. Ow, my leg! Jackie yelled. His mother, an untidy, slatternly woman, looking terrified, hurried up. Oh, Jackie, didn't I tell you, you naughty boy! she cried with a white face. She made no attempt to take the child, but Lydia said sharply, Here's Mrs. Madge, Jenny. You better give Jackie to her. Jenny simply shook her head. I'm afraid it's his leg. Hush, Jackie, now. The doctor will be here directly, and he'll put you right. Lydia stepped forward resolutely, quite devoid of any confidence in the handling of broken limbs by her careless, inexperienced child, and subconsciously indignant that this want of confidence did not appear to be shared by the spectators. Let someone take him at once who knows something about children, she said low and scathingly to Jenny, and knelt on the ground beside her. Don't touch my leg, roared Jackie as he saw another unfamiliar pair of hands hovering above him. Mrs. Madge, will you take him? said Lydia clearly. But Mrs. Madge shrank away. Oh, he didn't ought to be touched, Mrs. Damerel, not till doctor comes. He'll be here this instant. He's only just gone off the field. Keep still now, Jackie. Don't touch my leg, reiterated the little boy, sobbing more quietly. He lay still on Jenny's lap. However did it happen, said somebody curiously. Several people began to explain volubly, and most of them appeared to have seen the child's fall and the astounding rapidity of Jenny's rescue. Them heavy hurdles, too. However her did it, they said admiringly. You're pretty strong, Miss Jenny. I pulled two of them off of him, said Jenny complacently. She looked pleased and proud of herself and her promptitude. Here be Dr. West. Lydia had to move to make room for the doctor who took her place kneeling on the ground beside Jenny and made his rapid examination of the child lying across her lap. Right leg, I'm afraid, Jenny indicated. The temerity of Jenny, the self-assurance. Lydia actually felt herself flushing with vexation. Keep back, she said to the people around her. Keep back and let the child have some air. She did not want everyone to hear ignorant little Jenny taking upon herself to bestow information upon Dr. West. Quite right, said the doctor. Now we'd better get him to the surgery, and I'll set it up in no time. All right, little chap. All right. Mother shall come with you to my house. His keen eyes sought Mrs. Madge's white, frightened face with professional appraisement. Now then, my dear soul, pull yourself together. Be thankful the boy isn't killed. I'll set his leg at the surgery, and then it's only a step home. We'll see about getting him to Cliss Milton Hospital later. Now, if Lady Lucy Damerel would let us have the pony cart. He looked round inquiringly. Of course, of course, anything, said old Lady Lucy tremulously. Poor little boy. Won't it jolt him terribly? Not with a very careful driver going slowly. I'll drive if you like, said Jenny confidently. The pony is used to me. Be quiet, said Lydia very low. Stop putting yourself forward like that. Jenny. I am ashamed of you. But the fates themselves seemed determined in a conspiracy towards Jenny's uplifting. While little Jackie was carefully laid on the cushions along the length of one seat in the cart, with his head on his mother's lap, he clung obstinately to a corner of Jenny's dress and would not let her go. Without a glance at her mother, 
but at a nod from Dr. West, Jennie climbed into the cart and took the reins. The doctor, walking slowly, led the pony down the field and out into the lane that gave on to the village highway, at the end of which stood the surgery. Jackie screamed as the pony cart moved off and could be heard again screaming more faintly at intervals. Well done, Jenny, ejaculated Joyce Damerel. The players walked back onto the pitch again. How she could have lifted two of those great things all by herself, I can't imagine, said Lady Lucy. Surely they must be dreadfully heavy. I should think they are, the Colonel exclaimed, raising and dropping one as he spoke. Those children ought never to have been allowed anywhere near them. Most dangerous. It's a mercy there weren't half a dozen of them killed. By Jove, little Jenny can run. I never saw anything like the way she covered the ground while the rest of us stood there like stuck pigs. Lydia remembered her own instant impulse to dash forward and the push that had almost sent her over as Jenny swept past her. She said nothing. But she saw Natalie Kennedy's eyes fix upon her face with a rather puzzled expression. We mustn't scold Jenny any more for being hoyden after this, must we? said Natalie with rather a doubtful little laugh. Lydia made no reply, but smiled quietly. She remained on the cricket field until the end of the match, wondering all the time what was happening at the surgery and in what intolerable mood of exaltedness Jenny would return to her that evening. "'Bring our little heroine up to dinner this evening, my dear,' said Lady Lucy graciously. "'Billy is most anxious that she should meet his friend with the aeroplane. I will send the carriage at half-past seven. There was never any question of a pre-engagement at Lydia's cottage. Just before six o'clock the pony carriage came back to the cricket ground, driven by Dr. West himself. He came straight up to Lady Lucy. Poor little fellow, I've set the leg. It's a simple green stick fracture, and he ought to get on nicely. There's no need whatever for him to go to hospital. Is Nurse Hopkins there? Going tonight. I've seen her, and she's not very busy just now. So she and the eldest Meiji girl can manage him nicely. Where's Jenny? Joyce Demerel made the inquiry that was in Lydia's mind. She very kindly went home with the little boy, and she asked me to tell you, the doctor turned courteously to Lydia, that she would walk home. Good girl, ejaculated Lady Lucy, but isn't it rather far for her? I hope she didn't strain herself with those dreadful hurdles. Lydia, if she seems tired, you mustn't let her come tonight, though Billy will be disappointed. Jenny is very strong, Grandmama, said Lydia gently. I don't think she'll be tired. Nothing could be less tired-looking than Jenny Damerel when she walked into her mother's drawing-room less than ten minutes after Lydia's own return. Nurse Hopkins has come, she said volubly. And Jackie's asleep, and it's only a green stick fracture, and so... Yes, I've seen Dr. West, and he told us just what I suppose you heard him say at the surgery. Lydia was not going to allow Jenny to impart all this information as though it were her own discovery. Are you tired? Grandmama wants us to dine at Quintmere tonight to meet Billy's friend, but the carriage won't be here till half-past seven. Go and lie down, Jenny, and I'll bring you some tea. There was a tone of urgency in Lydia's solicitude. If only Jenny would have been a meek and delicate child, allowing her mother to wait upon her, how gladly Lydia would have displayed her unselfish devotion. I'm not a bit tired, Jenny declared gaily. Mama, do you know Dr. West said I was a born nurse, and Jackie was far quieter with me than with Nurse Hopkins? Really, he was. Before you can talk about being a born nurse, darling, said Lydia tranquilly, you would have to learn not to drop everything you touch and break it. I'm afraid I should feel sorry for your patients, especially if you went near them with hands like those. Jenny burst into an angry laugh and colored all over her fresh face, looking down at her dirty hands. Surely the doctor knows best, she said defiantly. It's not very likely he was in earnest, a little hoyden like you. I was quite ashamed of you this afternoon. 
pushing roughly past older people and tearing across the grass like that to interfere with what you knew nothing about everybody was laughing about it afterwards about the schoolgirl thrusting herself forward when there were women there who knew all about children before you were born if it hadn't been that mrs Magee is a helpless fool i should have made you give up jackie to his mother at once now try and keep quiet and rest a little before we go out this evening lydia picked up a book and jenny flounced out of the room muttering below her breath when she had gone lydia put down the book of which she had not read a line she knew that she had been unsympathetic and yet jenny's arrogance seemed to her intolerable and produced in her a greater sense of irritation than anything she'd ever known it was nothing less than necessary to snub her surely lydia's eyes suddenly filled with tears she would have liked so much to pet jenny to make a baby of her and know her to be dependent on her mother for everything she made many sacrifices for jenny when jenny really was a baby and everybody had acknowledged her devotion to her only child but jenny had from some obstinate rather inarticulate and backward child slowly developed into a self-sufficient self-assertive girl asking only to go her own way and perfectly satisfied with her own crude efficiency she did not want beautiful sacrifices to be made by her mother on her behalf she would have resented them violently lydia was far too clear-sighted not to realize that jenny had inherited her own strong instinct for impressing her personality upon her surroundings but looking back on her own youth lydia felt that nothing was subtle nothing restrained about jenny she was blatant where lydia had been astute boastful where lydia had dealt in half implications thinking over the perpetual fret of their relations lydia felt suddenly tired and hopeless she went up to jenny's room and inspected her black net evening frock the only one that she possessed since she was not yet considered to be grown up you really can only wear it this once more jenny your things never last i can remodel the whole of the top though with some fresh tool i'll do it for you tomorrow it was always a satisfaction to lydia to feel herself working for her undutiful daughter oh please don't mamma said jenny wriggling i do hate people to know that you make my things that is a very ungracious thing to say don't you think i can work well enough for you mamma you know it isn't that it's a shame to pretend you think i meant that it's only because it sounds as though you were always working yourself to death for me and i let you do it and it isn't true end of chapter twenty two recording by c j plogue chapter twenty three of the heel of achilles this librivox recording is in the public domain he's come billy excitedly told the guests as he met them in the hall at quintmere came all the way without a break where's the flying machine said jenny as excitedly in the four acres field i told him most carefully exactly where to land and he made a glorious descent oh why didn't i see it can't we go and look at it after dinner all covered up with a tarpaulin and stuff for the night two of the men are going to watch it in turns all night fancy jenny the pilot's here too he's having supper in the housekeeper's room the two young things looked at one another with glowing eyes and lydia involuntarily smiled in sympathy incomprehensible to her though their enthusiasm was her smile died away when to jenny's agitated whisper at the drawing-room door oh i feel as if i was being introduced to royalty billy replied reassuringly you needn't be nervous grandma must been telling him about you pulling the hurdles off that kid this afternoon and he was fearfully interested really lady lucy spoilt both her grandchildren lydia reflected here was mr roland valentine treated as an honored guest staying in the old house to which so few visitors were ever invited just because billy had known him at oxford and had gone mad about his experiments in aviation he struck lydia as rather a common young man good-looking in a bold well-set-up fashion 
and with a faint, unfamiliar twang in his speech. And Grandmama was just as indulgent of Jenny as she was of Billy. She inquired with solicitude if the girl were tired, or had felt any strain from her exertions, and she recapitulated, with the iteration of old age, the story of Jenny's prowess in the afternoon. I wish I'd seen you. It sounds as though you'd been a regular heroine, said Mr. Roland Valentine, rather too familiarly, Lydia thought. It wasn't anything. I've heaps of muscle. Jenny thrust out a white, solid forearm, pushing the black net sleeve away from her elbow. By Jove, said Mr. Valentine admiringly. All through dinner they talked about aeroplanes, and Jenny asked questions that elicited long, technical-sounding replies from Valentine, who kept his eyes fixed upon hers across the table. I say you've been reading all this up, he challenged her at last. No, I haven't cried Jenny, unresentful of the assumption, but eager to display her credentials. I've been keen on machinery and especially on flying for ages, haven't I, Billy? Rather, said Billy heartily. Can't we go out and look at the machine tonight? It's all covered up. You won't see much. I don't care. Just the shape would be something. Mayn't we, Grandmama? If Mr. Valentine will take you, said Lady Lucy placidly, but why not wait till tomorrow morning? I'm afraid I have to be off good and early, said the young airman, but I hope you'll all come and see the start. The naive egotism of the invitation almost made Lydia laugh, but she was vaguely glad that Mr. Valentine was to leave the next day. She altered the trend of the conversation by asking him whether he had always lived in America. Something in his intonation, though scarcely to be called an accent, prompted the suggestion. I've spent my life in Vancouver, but I don't know the States. Vancouver? cried Jenny. Oh, Mama, perhaps he knows Cousin Bob. Jenny did not herself know any of the Senthovens excepting Aunt Evelyn and Olive, and her sense of clanship was a continual source of vexation to Lydia, by whom it was not shared in any degree. Canada is a large place, she said, laughing a little. Your cousin Bob is on Vancouver Island, not on the mainland at all. What's cousin Bob's name, anyway? said Mr. Valentine encouragingly. It's Senthoven. Not a bit a common name, said Jenny eagerly. Oh, do you say that you know him? Well, I'm afraid I just don't. But I tell you what, Miss de Merrill, I'll make a point of looking him up as soon as I get back and telling him he's got a very charming relative in England who's anxious for news of him. Nonsense, said Lydia, laughing. My daughter doesn't even know this cousin. I don't know what this sudden interest in poor cousin Bob is about, Jenny. Jenny colored. For all her schoolgirl forwardness, it was always easy to make her blush, and Lydia was not sorry for it. Jenny is just like her father, said Joris de Merrill. Clement always took an interest in anybody belonging to him, however distant. Don't you remember? I've heard heaps about Cousin Bob from Aunt Beryl and Aunt Evelyn, and seen his photograph when he was a little boy, said Jenny, casting an openly resentful glance at Lydia. The young airman was looking from one to another with unabashed, almost openly amused interest and curiosity. Joyce de Merrill turned the conversation to Mr. Valentine's exploits with his machine, and he dilated upon them with a sort of simplicity that just saved him from blatancy until the end of dinner. Then Jenny said, Oh, may I? And without waiting for any permission, rushed into the hall in search of the old carriage lantern. As the expedition started, Lydia heard her eager voice begin again. But if the shaft of the propeller was at that angle... Shall you go with them, my dear? said Lady Lucy to Lydia. Do if you want to. Though there is very little to see now, Joyce and I watched the machine come down. A most wonderful sight. No, thank you, said Lydia. Perhaps I shall see the start, and they don't really want anyone with them. They're still talking machinery. The young people of today are able to dispense with chaperonage, said Grandmama calmly. They are all so impersonal. Well, said Joyce Damerel, with curt matter-of-factness that Lydia so much disliked, I shouldn't dispense with it too much in Jenny's case, if I were Lydia, for 
To my mind, she's extraordinarily attractive. Lydia felt an odd mingling of annoyance and gratification. They sat in the lamp-lit drawing-room, just as they always did at Quintmere after dinner, and the placid routine that Lydia knew so well took its accustomed course. Coffee was brought in, and Lady Lucy lamented that the careless children had taken Mr. Valentine out before he could have had any. "'Are Solomon's biscuits there, Joyce?' The old Aberdeen Terrier's biscuits were always there, in a little silver box with a chased lid. "'Solly, Solly, come along, then.' As the small and aged dog shuffled slowly up, an old recollection stirred in Lydia, and she gave a fleeting thought to the memory of Grandpapa's shamrock. There had been a great deal of talk about getting rid of the obstreperous shamrock after Grandpapa's death, but after all Aunt Beryl had kept him, and for weeks he had faithfully shadowed Mr. Monteagle Almond, the solitary paying guest of the Regency Terrace house, and a notorious hater of dogs. Lydia could smile a little at the memory of prim Mr. Monteagle Almond, disgraced in the town where he was so well known, by the antics of his companion, by Shamrock's raids upon perambulators and butcher shops and nervous girls on bicycles. Shamrock's fate at the end had remained uncertain, for after a severe and much overdue thrashing at last bestowed by a righteously incensed Uncle George, this Sealyham had rushed out of the house with every appearance of being still entirely unsubdued and had never come back again. I don't believe that dog could ever die, Aunt Beryl had remarked simply. Honest to goodness, Lydia, I believe he was possessed. They had all of them left it at that. Poor Solomon is getting very blind, I'm afraid, said Lady Lucy. She said it every evening. Joyce Damerel sat very upright by the open window and knitted something silken. She was not a needlewoman, but Lydia knew that she would have thought it waste of time equally to sit unoccupied or to read a book. Lydia herself picked up an illustrated London news, and Lady Lucy softly rustled the sheets of the Times. "'Have you heard how that poor woman is at the hospital, Joyce, my dear? There was always some poor woman or other to be inquired after. Oh, dear, these suffragettes again!' That was Lady Lucy's contribution to the agitating problem of the day. The clock on the mantelpiece, chiming ten, startled them all in the drowsy silence. Where are those children? They must have come in and gone to the billiard room. Then the footman brought in a tray with glasses, and a decanter and siphon, and a large jug of cold water. Are the young gentlemen in the billiard room, Charles? No, my lady. Talking with the pilot person. "'And where is Miss Jenny?' said Lydia quickly. "'I don't think Miss Jenny has come in from the Four Acres Field, madam. "'It's too late for her without a cloak or anything, silly child. "'I shall go and see,' said Joyce Damerel. "'She rose with her decisive movement and left the room. "'Lydia was left again to the drowsy silence of the drawing-room and old Lady Lucy. She knew that Joyce had only gone out because she did not want Jenny to be scolded by her mother for the indiscretion of her escapade. Did they all think her such a tyrant, then? Lydia smiled rather bitterly, realizing vividly at the moment that she did not at all feel herself to be amongst the Olympians, the lawgivers, and lookers-on at the game of life. Rather was she unable to feel her place to be anywhere but in the arena itself, in the very forefront. But since the tragically early death of Clement, and the evanescence of the momentary luster of pathos surrounding his widow, it seemed to her that she had been relegated into the background, a background, moreover, that was merely expected to throw into relief other and younger personalities. Joyce Demerel might accept a place in that background. Lydia herself could not do so. She felt herself to be far more alive, far more real, than was little Jenny, and it angered her that other people did not seem so to feel her. The door opened and Billy came in. Hallo! Aren't the other two in? I thought they were just behind me. I say, Aunt Lydia, we've a great plan. 
Can't Jennie stay the night here, so as to see Valentine start to morrow morning? He's got to be off early." Lydia looked at Lady Lucy. "'Delighted to have dear little Jenny,' said the old lady placidly. "'It really is an opportunity not to be missed. And she has always been so interested in these strange machines. I was struck by her knowledge tonight.' "'So was Valentine,' said Billy, in an awed voice. "'You should have heard them in the field, jawing away. "'Why, she knew nearly as much about it as did he.' "'Wonderful,' said Lady Lucy. "'Ring the bell, my dear boy, and tell them to get the little blue room ready at once.' "'And may I have the carriage, Grandmamma? "'It's later than usual,' said Lydia. "'Certainly, my dear.' I'll put the child's things together just for tonight and tomorrow morning and send them back in the carriage. I won't keep it waiting. You are always so thoughtful, my dear, declared Lady Lucy affectionately. She was very fond of Lydia nowadays. Good night, Grandmamma. If I don't see Jenny, tell her that I shall expect her home in time for lunch tomorrow. But Lydia did see Jenny. Joyce de Merrill and the young airman and Jenny herself were coming into the hall just as she left the drawing-room, politely escorted by Billy. Grandmamma has suggested that you should stay the night, Jenny, and then you'll be able to see the start tomorrow morning, said Lydia. Oh, your shoes! She looked down in dismay at the satin slippers soaked with dew. They're very old, said Jenny perversely. I don't suppose it'll hurt them. I'm thinking of your catching cold, began Lydia severely, and stooped to feel the damp edges of Jenny's black evening frock. In her usual ungracious fashion, the girl twitched herself away, as she always did at such demonstrations of her mother's solicitude. Lydia almost involuntarily looked up to see the impression that might be produced by her daughter's ungrateful reception of the maternal thoughtfulness. Roland Valentine was gazing at Jenny, and there was more than a suspicion of laughter in his bold eyes laughter that as lydia quickly felt was wholly sympathetic of her youthful ingratitude i fancy you're a pretty strong girl aren't you it's rather a waste of anxiety to fuss around you isn't it yes it is as i'm always telling mamma i've never been ill yet boasted jenny i'd rather be ill and have done with it than have to be always thinking of taking care the way some girls do and fellows too if they're mollies affirmed the airman or having someone else taking care for one, murmured Jenny under her breath, casting a half-deprecating, half-impudent glance at her mother. You ungrateful little cat, cried Joyce Damerel, but she laughed as she said it and put her arm around the shoulders of her recalcitrant niece. Lydia, with an angry insurgent feeling that they were all against her, compressed her lips slightly and said nothing for a moment. Here's the carriage, Billy announced. "'Good night, Mama," Jenny murmured in accents that sounded rather contrite. She came forward into the restricted circle of light cast by the old-fashioned standard lamp, and Lydia saw that her face was flushed and her eyes shining like stars. An untidy bunch of heavily-scented syringa was thrust into her belt. The syringa had not come from the four acres field where the aeroplane was. The great blossom-laden bushes stood at the furthest and darkest end of the lower drive at Quintmere. Liddy looked at the syringa and glanced at Jenny, but Jenny's gaze remained unembarrassed, only curiously dilated and unusually brilliant. Lydia could read nothing there. Good night, Joyce. Good bye, Mr. Valentine, and bon voyage. They clustered at the hall door as Billy ran down the steps and spoke to the old coachman. All the servants at Quitmere were old. Lunch time tomorrow, I shall expect you, said Lydia to her daughter. I am going to put your night things together as soon as I get in and send them back in the carriage. The softness vanished in an instant out of Jenny's eyes. Do let Susan do it, Mama. She'll know quite well what I want. I hate you to tire yourself fussing about my beastly things. Never had Jenny been quite so outspokenly defiant of Lydia's tenderness. Was it the presence of that rather common young colonial, with his too evident enjoyment of her revolt, that gave such assurance to her display of bad taste? 
Lydia drew the child towards her and kissed her with calm decision. Don't be a silly little thing. You know I like to do things for you myself. Then I know you're properly done. Besides, said Lydia very clearly, you know very well that I always pack for you. She got into the carriage as she spoke, but she had seen Jenny flush to a quick, angry scarlet, and although she could not hear what the girl said as she flounced around, it was easy enough to guess. Yes, and I hate Mama to pack for me, and do all that sort of thing. Jenny had hated it, and crudely and ungraciously voiced her hatred ever since her fourteenth year, but she was as naturally unhandy as Lydia was methodical, and had never been encouraged to wait upon herself. Lydia had always preferred to sacrifice herself, her own time and her own strength. Jenny's few and bungling attempts at doing her own packing, her own mending, her own tidying, had been merely ludicrous. No wonder that every such spasmodic effort generally undertaken in angry opposition to her mother's toil on her behalf had merely led to a double share of work falling upon Lydia, patiently repairing the effect of Jenny's blunders far into the night. But the thought of past justifications did not come to Lydia's help now. She leant back in the dark corner of the little closed carriage, helpless and puzzled. What had that impossible youth said to little Jenny under the syringa bushes in the dark drive? Why had they taken that way home? That was no way at all from the Four Acres field. It must have been at Jenny's suggestion, for how could Mr. Valentine have known anything about it? How long had they been alone when Billy, the foolish boy, left them together? Roland Valentine was the sort of young man who would take advantage of Jenny's inexperience, her ignorant, youthful daring. Because Jenny was a hoyden, to whom flirting was unknown, because the allurements of her youth differed absolutely from Lydia's own, because she was not pretty, and most of all because Lydia thought of her always as a child and never as a young woman, it had been almost impossible to her ever to believe that Jenny could prove attractive to men. Joyce Demerel's insistence on the possibility had merely irritated her, but with a mingling of gratification and dismay. She had gradually come to admit the possibility of such a thing when Billy, and actually three or four of Billy's friends, had successively fallen victims to most unmistakable attacks of calf love for the youthful charms of Jenny between the ages of fourteen and seventeen. One of them, six months ago, had even proposed marriage to Jenny, and it was not Jenny, but the disconsolate lad himself who had confided to Lydia Jenny's unflattering reception of the proposal. It's awfully nice of you and all, but don't you think love and proposing and all that sort of thing rather spoils the fun? She's simply a child, the rejected one had informed Lydia with all the desperate solemnity of twenty. She doesn't a bit know what love means. Lydia had agreed with a sincerity to which a strong inward sense of relief added force. Jenny was a child, still undeveloped and uncomprehending. It would be her mother's part to shelter and protect her for many years yet. In this train, Lydia had talked to Jenny's first suitor, oddly reassuring herself at the same time as she impressed upon him the deep intensity of her maternal role. The boy had been very young and very easily impressed. He had accepted the value of Lydia's maternity just as she had offered it to his uncritical gaze. Had they been older, and Jenny less obviously untouched by his innocent, clumsy love-making, Lydia could almost have wished them to marry. Jenny's husband must be a man who would recognize her foolish rebellion against her mother's love for what it was, the ill-regulated ebullitions of youthfulness that was wholly unfitted for the independence that it craved. Lydia remembered the secret assent to all Jenny's folly that had been so obvious in the eager eyes and nodded head of young Valentine, and came back to the disagreeable consideration of the immediate past. They ought not to have been allowed to go out alone together after dinner like that. Of course, it had all been an accident, 
Billy had been stupid and careless of conventional proprieties, and neither Jennie nor her escort were likely to recall him to discretion. Mr. Roland Valentine was quite obviously the sort of man who would always, in the phrase of Lydia's youth, take advantage. She moved uneasily in the dark corner of the carriage as she remembered Jennie's great grey eyes, shining like lamps, and her round, flushed face. Had the colonial Lydia so designated him to herself with contemptuous intent, perhaps even tried to kiss her? Although Lydia could look back upon episodes in her own youth, unprotected as Jenny's had never been, and feel intimately convinced of her own powers of dealing with any awkward or even dangerous situation, of conducting to a successful issue even such unsavoury incidents as those in which the Greek Margoliath or Mr. Codd, the detective, had figured, it was utterly impossible for her to credit Jenny with the like capabilities. Jenny could not take care of herself. Little Jenny. The carriage stopped, and Lydia went up into her daughter's untidy bedroom and packed a small handbag for the return journey of the Broman to Quintmere. She did not feel as though she could sleep, and before seeking any rest, she carefully put in order all the tumbled contents in the plain chest of drawers and dressing table. It partly assuaged her vague sensation of anxiety to be occupied, and partly caused her to feel certain a slight amusement at the thought of Jenny's indignant protests, could she have seen her mother at work. It was all unreasonable enough, too, Lydia reflected dryly, for slatternly little Jenny was only too glad to let Susan, the maid, tidy up after her, and brush and mend her clothes. But when it came to her own mother, Jenny apparently could not brook to be served. Involuntarily, the remembrance flashed across Lydia's mind of the defiant unthankfulness that had found vent in Jenny's exclamation of the previous evening, I do hate people to know that you make my things. It sounds as though you were always working yourself to death for me, and I let you do it, and it isn't true. Lydia sighed and went to her own room. She had long ago grown used to the quiet of the country nights, and it seemed almost like a dream to her now that as a girl she had once worked hard in London, and lived by herself, and counted as friends people who had passed out of her life as completely as though they had never existed. The impermanence of these relations troubled her not at all. Stepping stones, that was all. Lydia often felt quite surprised at the fidelity with which Aunt Beryl and Aunt Evelyn and Olive Senthoven kept their charms on her attention alive. Olive had long ago left the sanatorium, reported cured, and certainly not breaking down in health more than once or twice in every few years. She had even, much against Lydia's will, repaid a part of the sum dispersed by the demerals on her behalf. She wrote Lydia slangy, uninteresting letters at regular intervals, giving discouraging accounts of Beatrice, with a husband who drank, and an overlarge family of unhealthy children, and boasting of her own ability to earn a meagre allowance by means of typewriting. She seemed to take for granted Lydia's continued interest in her uneventful and uninteresting life of drudgery, in Aunt Evelyn's sciatica and increasing deafness, in the sordid struggles of Beatrice and her indescribable swains, even in Bob, who had married a Canadian woman and wrote that he should never return to England. Lydia commented politely on these pieces of information that varied so seldom, and in her replies wrote, in return of the garden, and of the first prize taken at the agricultural show by Jenny's sweet peas, and of the letter she herself had just received from Aunt Beryl. The letters of Aunt Beryl came just as regularly, and even more frequently than those of Olive, but they were less difficult to answer. The old associations of childhood made it seem natural enough to write to Regency Terrace, even though one felt no real interest whatever in the deficiencies of successive girls and the smashing by them of successive household gods. That's the last of the green teacups gone, that you'll remember from a long way back, dear, though Grandpapa never would have them used, only in less weed people, if you recollect. Lydia might or might not remember the green teacups. 
but she always responded sympathetically, and it was really no effort to write and tell Aunt Beryl what she and Jenny were doing, while they still met at least once a year. And Aunt Beryl had even been to stay at Lydia's college one summer when Lady Lucy and Joyce had been abroad. But tonight Aunt Beryl seemed almost as remote and unreal as did the strange people who Lydia had once known at Miss Nettleship's boarding house. The only living reality was Jenny. Lydia lay awake in the semi-darkness of the summer night and thought intently and passionately about her child for a long while. Clear thinking as she had been all her life, she could not adjust the focus of her mind to an unbiased vision of herself and Jenny. It was as though for the first time a strong personal element governed her life and strangely deflected her powers of judgment. She waited for Jenny's return the next day with a certain anxiety, desirous of hearing a full account of the previous evening and of Jenny's walk under the syringa bushes, but in full possession of the self-control which never allowed her to cross-question her child. Cross-questioning, indeed, was unnecessary with Jenny, always ready to talk only too freely about her own exploits. Miss Jenny should be here for lunch, Susan. You might make castle pudding. She likes those. Yes, ma'am. The eldest Magy boy left a message this morning, ma'am, to say if Miss Jenny would go and see little Jackie. He'd be so pleased. They can't say enough in praise of Miss Jenny, can they, ma'am? Susan's homely face beamed with simple pride. However she did it, pulling up those heavy hurdles, and they say she handled the little fellow so knowingly, too. Dr. West was praising her up at the Magy's like anything they said. I hope Jackie is getting on all right, said Lydia rather austerely. I'll go down there this afternoon myself. Miss Jenny isn't very famous for carefulness, is she, Susan? And I was rather afraid she might have done more harm than good. End of chapter 23 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter 24 of The Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oh, Mama, I quite forgot to tell you before. The casual note in Jenny's voice was overdone to an extent that must have awakened suspicion even in a listener far less acute than was Lydia. Well, he'd like to stop here just on his way back next week. He who? Lydia did not make this inquiry for the sake of obtaining information. She had no doubt whatever as to the identity of the forthcoming visitor, but Jenny was making her thoroughly uneasy, and she wished to test the grounds for the vexed anxiety that had now been with her for nearly a week. Oh, didn't I say, said Jenny, more elaborately casual than ever, and, picking up the kitten, began to try and make it bite its own tail. I meant Billy's friend, the one who had the aeroplane. Lydia's mind automatically registered her daughter's avoidance of Mr. Roland Valentine's name. Do you mean he wants to go to Quintmere again? I'm not at all sure that Grandmama would care to have him. He's not quite, well, not exactly a gentleman, is he? Oh, pussy kitten, you've scratched me, cried Jenny in tones of reproach. Not Quintmere, but here. He's going back to London, and he thought of getting out of the train at Clist Milton Junction and walking here, and then he could go on by the 3.30 from Ashloo. But he could go straight on to Exeter, like anyone else does. What does he want to stop here for? To... to break the journey, suggested Jenny feebly. He's leaving the aeroplane at Plymouth. There was a silence, during which the kitten, inwardly approved by Lydia, made its escape. Deprived of this defense, Jenny lifted a very pink face and faced her mother. There was something at once defiant and childlike in her expression that secretly rather touched Lydia. He really wants to see me, Mama. And I... I didn't think you'd mind. And when he suggested coming, I asked him to have lunch. You always say you like me to have my friends here. Mama, you don't mind, do you? I don't mind anything so long as you're open with me, darling, said Lydia, making use of an unwanted term of endearment. But I don't know that I altogether understand how you and this youth could have made friends in such a very short time. 
don't you?" said Jennie vaguely. She appeared to think that the conversation was ended. Lydia wished, as she had wished at ever shortening intervals since Jennie's ninth year, that her daughter would confide in her, appeal to her. The protective instinct surged within her strongly. Tell me, Jenny dear, I'll help you as much as I can. There isn't anything to tell, said Jenny, in the same vague, unsatisfactory manner. He'll turn up on Tuesday, I should think. Ask Billy to come over, if you like. Oh, he'll be gone away by then, don't you remember? said Jenny quickly. Lydia said nothing more. She was conscious of preoccupation during the rest of the week, and noticed for the first time that signs of care were beginning to show in her face, round her eyes and mouth. Several times she went with Jenny to the Magie's untidy cottage. Although the girl made no attempt to conceal the fact that she would have much preferred to make her visits there unaccompanied, Lydia listened with a little kindly smile to Mrs. Magie's incoherent declarations that Jackie was never so good with anybody as with the young lady, and quietly gave Mrs. Magie several hints from her own experiences as to the management of children. She also provided an occasional milk pudding or custard, and presently shared with her daughter in the voluble, incoherent gratitude of the slovenly woman. She also said to Jenny that it was a great pity that Jenny's old toys and picture books had been so maltreated and destroyed by a tomboyish owner that none of them could serve to cheer poor little Jackie's idleness now. There really was so very little to amuse a sick child. Lydia herself went and read stories aloud to the little boy from time to time, a kindness entirely beyond the compass of Jenny, who hated books, mispronounced many of her words in slipshod fashion, and gabbled like a schoolgirl. I don't believe I'm good for anything except perhaps gardening, said Jenny, in cross, resentful accents. You would be good for a great deal, if you would only take pains and let yourself be taught, said Lydia serenely. She was far from disapproving of this most unwanted mood in her usually self-assertive daughter. It was quite true that Jenny was in no danger of displaying the efficiency that had been Lydia's at nineteen. She was very clumsy with her fingers, except when dealing with either plants or animals, and, although she was not stupid, a certain slowness of development and inability to express herself very often made her appear so. She could neither sew nor write with any facility, nor did she show any signs of having inherited her mother's business aptitude. These deficiencies should have made her very dependent upon Lydia, and the services that Lydia was only too ready to devote to her. But then Jenny did not like being served, although she would not take the steps towards learning such independence as might be conceded to a daughter in her mother's house. Perhaps she had not learnt these things young enough. A French governess had given her lessons and had taught her French, far superior to the unsatisfactory amount assimilated by Lydia long ago at Miss Glover's school, but French was not in request at Sist Milton or Ashlew, and Jenny's proficiency was wasted after Mademoiselle left. She was unmusical. She could not draw. On the rare occasions when Jenny lamented her lack of accomplishments, Liddy consolingly reminded her, You have a faculty for arithmetic. It's not often found in women, the mathematical mind. As an old friend of Uncle George used to tell me when I was a girl, you've inherited the mathematical mind from me. Lydia refused to see that the last words always made Jenny scowl furiously. On Sunday they went to church at Ashlew, and to lunch at Quintmere afterwards, after a fashion that had grown to seem almost immemorial. Lydia never discussed Jenny with Joyce Damerel, whose trenchant judgments, always abruptly and unhesitatingly spoken, seldom coincided with her own. But she had decided to mention the affair of Mr. Roland Valentine to old Lady Lucy, whom she suspected of appraising the young airman at much the same valuation as she did herself. Lydia had no definite intention of breaking her old rule and of talking about herself, but her mother-in-law would hardly fail to notice the unwanted expression of fatigue that worry had given her face. The day was an unusually hot one, 
and the slight fatigue engendered by the walk across the field and by a lengthy and rather tedious sermon had not detracted lydia felt from her already strained appearance outside the church lady lucy made her usual pause at the twin adjacent stones consecrated to the memory of william and of clement de merrill and the older monument to their father joyce never stood beside her there but lydia joined her mother-in-law for a few moments lady lucy spent a briefer time than usual at the graves she turned unfurling her shabby black silk parasol and lydia moved away beside her oh my dear said lady lucy in distressed accents and lydia turned her encircled eyes full upon her have you heard what they seem to be saying in london billy is full of it there is to be war between germany and france and they say that england can't honourably keep out of it lydia was confounded all through luncheon lady lucy would talk of nothing else joyce damerel was sturdily optimistic and said that there would be no war the germans were too civilized billy predicted war in a week a war that would be ended by the british navy in three months and the aeroplanes cried jenny oh billy it'll be a chance for the aeroplanes at last of course said billy loftily he was very much excited and was going up to london that night they talked about the chances for and against a european war all afternoon and lady lucy sent jenny to find maps and then poured over them tremulously appealing very often to her grandson billy the only man present was uplifted and instructive and lydia was rather surprised at the deference which his mother and grandmother accorded to what they apparently considered to be his superior knowledge she said to joyce quietly why billy can't even remember the boer war you and i can of course but these children who are so excited they don't know what war means we do joyce looked at her strangely don't you understand lydia that if there's a war it won't be ours it'll be the children's our generation won't count at all it's billy and jenny that'll count now the boys of billy's age england won't go to war said lydia sharply she intensely disliked to hear the anguished note that had suddenly come into joyce demerel's voice as she looked at her only son if england went to war joyce would see billy go away to fight lydia had only a girl and there would be no supreme sacrifice for her to make joyce had said that only the children would count now but lydia thought that the mothers and wives who gave of their nearest would be held to count too those who could not go themselves and who had no one to send would be the ones that would not count the thought roused in lydia a deep and impassioned resentment that she did not attempt to analyze she put the thought of war from her as far as possible but jenny would talk of nothing else betraying a childish eagerness and excitement that almost made it seem as though she would be disappointed if nothing happened after all couldn't i go as a red cross nurse she asked babyishly and lydia patiently explained that entire lack of training would make such a thing impossible in her heart she thought that even if jenny did attend the red cross lectures that natalie kennedy was organizing she was much too young for her services to be accepted in any serious emergency but she engaged that both jenny and herself should attend the class on tuesday mr roland valentine came no one will think of anything but this war now lydia warned her daughter not without a certain inward satisfaction in making the prediction very likely mr valentine won't turn up one can be surprised at nothing and a young man of that sort might be very useful with his aeroplane of course said jenny and her voice held no clue as to whether she were acquiescing in the former or the latter half of her mother's dictum soon after twelve o'clock however lydia made the unwelcome discovery that jenny was gone out gone out without any hint as to her intentions and as lydia felt no doubt whatever for the express purpose of meeting mr valentine on his way to the house 
Nothing was to be done, except to wait luncheon time, and to hope, in the interests of maidenly discipline, that Jennie would presently return crestfallen without the Canadian. Just before one o'clock, however, they came in together. At first, Lydia's discouraging prediction to her daughter seemed about to be fulfilled. They talked only about the war. Mr. Valentine was decided in his expressions. He believed in a short but terrible war, perhaps three months, perhaps longer. The war would be fought in the air, not on land and not on sea, although there might be an immense naval battle in which the German fleet, seeking to invade England, would certainly be crushed. But everything would really be settled in the air. He was on his way to London to offer his aeroplane and his own services to the war office authorities. He had already held a pilot certificate. They would certainly send him to the front with other aeroplanes and other airmen as soon as an expeditionary force was organized. That said, Mr. Valentine might take a week, might take a fortnight, impossible to tell. Every hour must count, and no doubt the authorities would act as rapidly as possible. Then you think war is certain? Absolutely certain, Roland Valentine declared. Oh, said Jenny suddenly, we can't stay down here where we hear nothing and know nothing. Mama, we must go to London. Can you speak French? Mr. Valentine abruptly asked Jenny. Yes, yes. They'll want women in Belgium. Nurses, you know. I'd go, Jenny said with shining eyes. She has no training and is too young. I don't suppose they would accept her, said Lydia calmly. Dr. West said I was a born nurse, Jenny cried. Only the other day he said that. A born nurse. And Mr. Roland Valentine, who could know nothing whatever about it, looked across the table and said with emphasis and conviction, I'll bet you are. Will you have some cherry tart, Mr. Valentine? said Lydia prosaically. And some of our Devonshire dish, junket? She herself had never taken kindly to the Devonshire junkets, and disliking stewed fruit, sat with an empty plate before her. I'm not going to be alone, surely, said the Canadian bluntly. Oh, no, this is Jenny's favorite pudding. That's why I ordered it, said Lydia, smiling. I wish you wouldn't, burst childishly from Jenny. It's horrid to see you eating nothing while I'm stuffing. Why didn't you order something we both like? My dear child. Lydia's tone conveyed a half-humorous rebuke for Jenny's exaggerated vehemence. Well, said the child pettishly, I can't bear people to sacrifice themselves for me. It makes one feel beastly, doesn't it, Mr. Valentine? She applied to him boldly. Why, yes, that is so, agreed the youth heartily. When my young sister first went out to dances, I used to take her, my mother being a bit of an invalid. But the dear old lady would insist on sitting up for us and heating milk on a spirit lamp for Dorothy and truck of that sort. Oh, cried Jenny, glancing at her mother. Roland Valentine glanced at her, too, with impudent laughter in his eyes and yet a hint of apology in his voice. Of course, you know, it was kind of rotten for Dorothy. It simply spoilt all her fun for the whole evening. But why? Lydia said. I should have thought she would have been grateful, I must say. But gratitude is such a beastly feeling, cried young Valentine in candid dismay. Jenny burst out laughing, half nervously. Oh, Mama, isn't that what I'm always saying? One would so much rather be a little bit uncomfortable, or tired, or hungry, even a lot uncomfortable than feel that somebody else was just sitting there all the time sacrificing themselves for one. Lydia remained silent, almost surprised at the acuteness with which their youthful crudities could vex her. I must say, Jenny added to Valentine, as though she disliked the silence following on her outburst, I do thoroughly sympathize with your sister. Did your mother always go on sitting up for her? Oh, by Jove, no, said Valentine cheerfully. My mother's a dear, really, and we made her understand that really and truly that sort of thing is only a form of self-indulgence. Just keeping herself out of bed for nothing in the world except to make poor Dorothy feel herself the worst kind of selfish pig 
whenever she went out to a party and came in late the old lady quite saw it after a bit and just left the spirit lamp and the milk and things in the hall and toddled off to bed herself at ten o'clock or so every word that the bold self-assured young voice was uttering jarred upon lydia and his phraseology no less than his sentiments struck her as being in the worst possible taste and oh how bad for jenny to hear that was what really perturbed lydia the most the spirit that roland valentine had epitomized in slangy spontaneous speech gratitude is such a beastly feeling must have been latent since babyhood in the modern essentially unsubtle jenny but lydia knew very well that the very circumstances of her upbringing had precluded the possibility of her child's ever formulating definitely such dicta as those so unsparingly delivered by the young man who sat there calmly eating lydia's cherry pie and cream and junket she decided that they better not be left alone together after lunch what time would you like me to order the pony cart mr valentine we can easily drive you to the station i think my daughter told me that you wanted to catch the three thirty from ashloo thanks very much i wish i could have stayed around a bit longer there's quite a good train at six but everything is so dislocated one daren't risk it and i must get to london before tonight look here i'll send you a wire to say how things are up there oh yes do oh thank you said jenny ardently evidently gratitude was no longer an intolerable sensation when applied to a contemporary reflected lydia not without humour a rather strained quarter of an hour ensued in the shade of the small pleasant garden conversation reverted to the war has anything been heard of your young cousin billy de merrill his mother may have had a letter this morning i shall see him tonight i expect only son isn't he yes said lydia briefly of course he'll join the army at once said jenny excitedly would they send them out to belgium immediately do you suppose just as quick as they can get them across i should imagine silence fell again and lydia felt both constraint and a certain hostility vibrating in the atmosphere she had not any doubt now that jenny and jenny's barefaced admirer resented her presence but what in heaven's name could he want to say to the child they had only met twice Lydia did not waste wonder over Jenny's only too evident predilection for common, good-looking Mr. Valentine. He was that romantic and mysterious being, a flying man. He might be sent to his death within the next week. He gazed at Jenny with boldly admiring blue eyes, and he was young. That, in Lydia's opinion, was enough for any girl. She could remember that in her own girlhood the few attractions that she had felt had primarily been based upon grounds no more solid. Even her first inclination towards Clement de Merrill had been merely an instinctive conviction that here was breeding superior to anything that she had as yet known, and a candid admiration for his good looks. In common with many women of her nationality, her class, and her passionless temperament, Lydia honestly believed that love should come after marriage if it were to be enduring. Quite lately, vague suspicions of other and more volcanic forces latent in Jenny had begun to render her uneasy. Please, ma'am, Miss Quinch is here and says you wanted to speak to her, ma'am. Oh, Lydia was momentarily startled. She had quite forgotten her summons to the little village dressmaker. I must see her a minute. I'll come, Susan. Roland Valentine and Jenny had both risen almost before Lydia had stirred from her chair. Jenny was looking down at the ground, but Valentine's face showed an almost blatant triumph, and there was no longer constraint in the air. I shan't be a moment, Lydia repeated, and was unable to resist adding, It's about your new frock, Jenny. You said you wanted Miss Quinch to make it, and I've got the stuff you like. Do you want to see it? No, thank you, Mamma. I saw the pattern. Uh, I'd rather you arrange it all with Miss Quinch. Lydia's smile was finely ironical as she turned into the house. Miss Quinch was slow and also talkative, and it took time to dispose of her. 
When Lydia came back to the lawn at last she was vexed, but scarcely surprised, to find the encampment of deck chairs deserted. Exactly what she should have expected, not only from young Valentine's offhand lack of manners, but from Jenny's schoolgirl love of an escapade. Lydia looked at her watch. In less than half an hour's time, the pony cart, in reality a hired jingle from the village that always served them when required, would arrive in order to convey Mr. Valentine to the station. Not very much could be said or done inside half an hour by two young people who knew one another so slightly, surely, Lydia endeavoured to assure herself without much conviction. However, it would be altogether too undignified to go in search of them and might encourage jenny's foolish and youthful tendency to look upon her mother in reality her best friend as an unreasonable tyrant to be outwitted whenever possible heaven knew lydia reflected sadly she had sympathy enough and to spare for jenny's youth had she not striven to shelter and protect and save jenny as she herself during her girlhood had never been sheltered and protected and saved nor would she refuse to let the child try her own wings some day, though Lydia was conscious that therein lay the effort, as the thought brought its accustomed pang. But when Jenny should love and marry, her choice must fall upon such a man as her father had been, such a man as the Demerals had mated with from time immemorial. Lydia's inward insistence on the point dated from Jenny's birth, and before, and was stronger in its intensity from her own never-spoken but never-forgotten realization of the strange and intangible gulf that had been crossed when clement de merrill had married lydia raymond it was a pity that jenny and billy de merrill were first cousins a clock struck in the little drawing-room the chimes audible through the open window and lydia looked again at her watch in ten minutes the jingle would come was there or was there not a faint occasional murmur of voices somewhere within the house it might be susan and miss quinch in the tiny sewing-room that was only an offshoot from the kitchen or it might be another conversation proceeding from the old schoolroom upstairs but what in the world could they be doing there lydia would not look up at the window knowing moreover that a curtain of ivy and climbing roses would probably make it impossible for her to see inside the room even if she did so but in another few minutes she went into the house and upstairs to her own room to put on her hat and gloves preparatory for driving if jenny should resent the enforced chaperonage as she certainly would lydia sincerely regretted it but there must be no more tete-a-tetes with a third-rate young man from canada Lydia suspected that there had been too many such already. From her room she heard the jingle's arrival at the front door. Jenny! Lydia stood on the stairs, her shady mushroom hat already on her head, drawing on a pair of brown gauntlet gloves. Jenny! she called in a reasonable and moderate summons. Susan appeared in the hall below. The pony is at the door, ma'am. Thank you, Susan. Do you know where Miss Jenny is? the door of the old schoolroom one flight of stairs higher than that upon which lydia stood was wrenched open with an effect of violence i'm here mamma said jenny is it time to go quite time if you don't take more than a minute to put on your hat is mr valentine there jenny turned round to the schoolroom again in the shaded gloom of the narrow staircase lydia had been unable peering upwards to see her face distinctly she wondered if she should go up herself i do hope i haven't kept you waiting said the voice of mr roland valentine suave and yet indescribably casual i'm awfully sorry he came downstairs two steps at a time you mustn't miss your train said lydia coldly she walked downstairs followed by the young man be quick jenny jenny hung over the banisters i don't think i'm coming mamma her voice sounded rather uncertain, and Lydia was for a moment entirely nonplussed. Was it a childish display of pique provoked by Lydia's intention of accompanying the expedition? Or had Mr. Valentine made some ill-bred demonstrations of admiration that had offended and perhaps frightened Jenny? Lydia felt a certain relief as the idea crossed her mind, 
In any event, the point could not be debated now. "My daughter has a good many little jobs in the garden and the village that take up her time," she said in smiling but purposely formal apology for Jennie's capriciousness. "It's very good of you to drive me yourself, Mrs. Damerel," said Valentine, and they got into the jingle, and Lydia took up the reins. End of Chapter 24 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter 25 of The Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lydia was not destined ever to forget that expedition to Ashloo Station in the Jingle, nor the sense of shock with which she heard Mr. Roland Valentine's first level pronouncement, delivered before they were out of the short, steep approach that led into the lane outside. I suppose you've realized, Mrs. Damerel, that I was clean bowled over at very first sight. So much astonished was Lydia at the rapidity with which had come a crisis that she had as yet barely foreshadowed, even to herself, that she could only gaze at the young man beside her in silent dismay. He seemed heated, but not at all discomposed. Do you mean Jenny? said Lydia at last. I do. From the very first minute I saw her, repeated Mr. Valentine emphatically, I knew that there was the only girl I should ever marry. The only question was whether she would see it too. That is very far from being the only question, Lydia began severely, but the young man went on unheeding. However, it's all right, thank God. You may say that with the country on the eve of the most appalling war that this world has ever seen, it's no moment to think of such things. But on the other hand, it's every man's instinct to get what he can while he can, and the opportunities of the younger generation will be curtailed a bit from now on, I fancy. It's just a case of cramming into a few weeks or days, maybe, what you older folks have had all your lifetime to enjoy. Lydia, Beyond a sense of indignation at the youth's assumption of his ability to enlighten her knowledge as though she were already outside the full current of life, had hardly heard his earnestly spoken speech. She was aware of only one preoccupation. You haven't said anything to my daughter yet, surely. Why, yes, Mrs. de Merrill. That's the very thing I came down to do, though I don't say I should have had the nerve if it hadn't been for this war news. But it's every man's duty now, in my opinion, to fix himself up, and the duty of every healthy young woman to help carry on the race. I didn't put it that way to your daughter, Mr. Valentine admitted, but I guess there wasn't any need for arguments. She and I understand one another, Mrs. de Merrill. After meeting three times, or is it twice, said Lydia ironically, I assure you, Mr. Valentine, that things are not done like that in this country whatever they may be in Canada. I don't at all understand your having spoken to Jenny, who is a very young and inexperienced girl, without first obtaining my leave to do so. But in any case, you must see that I can't discuss the matter with you until I've spoken to her. She thought you might say something like that, observed Valentine thoughtfully. What do you mean? Why didn't she speak to me herself, if she had anything to tell me? Mr. Valentine looked straight in front of him. You see, you've made Jenny a good deal of fright of you, Mrs. de Merrill. The pang of grief and mortification and anger that shook Lydia from head to foot kept her silent from its very intensity. Her shaking hands gripped one another. I saw that, of course, the very first evening I met you together at Quintmere, went on the calmly judicial young voice, and I've had some talk with Jenny since, you know. I can't discuss with you either Jenny or my relations with Jenny, Mr. Valentine. You seem to forget that you are practically a stranger to us both. The young man turned and looked at her with something that was almost compassion. I suppose it must seem that way to you. But I'd like you to realize, he said gently, that Jenny and I really do mean to get married. Now don't say anything for a minute or two. Just let me put a few facts before you. I know I must seem almost like an adventurer to you folks down here, tearing about the country on a crazy flying machine and talking with what you probably take for an accent. 
but that isn't so. You ask young Billy Damerel, who brought me down here anyway. He'll put you on to the track of quite a lot of Oxford people who can tell you about me, and I've a respectable old aunt up there, too, a sister of my dead father's. She's all right, born in England, married an Englishman, never left England in her life. Now I'm quite sure that you'll want to ask a lot of questions about me, and I'm willing to answer you, or anyone you may appoint to ask them for you. But time is short, Mrs. Damerel, and may get much shorter. I don't know what they'll do with me up there. He jerked his thumb in a direction that vaguely indicated London and the war office. But I don't suppose, anyway, it'll be so very long before I'm over at the front. If England won't send me, then France will. And I want to get this business fixed up right away if it can be done. But it can't be done, Mr. Valentine. Lydia rallied the courage that, after all, she had never lacked in all her life. Even if I, who am Jenny's sole guardian, were to consent to a provisional engagement between you, which would depend entirely on the result of those inquiries which, as you rightly say, must be made, even then I should be doing quite wrong in allowing my child to marry yet. You must remember that I know Jenny through and through. She is quite undeveloped in every way, and even supposing that her first love affair has taken her fancy, that would be no reason for letting her rush into matrimony before she's ready for it. Marriage is nature, said Mr. Valentine bluntly. Why shouldn't a healthy girl of eighteen be ready for it when she cares for the man who offers it to her? I shouldn't take Jenny to poverty, Mrs. Damerel. Of course, I quite understand that any assertion I make must be verified, and you'll find that's easily done. But I may tell you, right here and now, that I have a small private income, about four hundred a year, left to me by the old man. My mother is not dependent on me, and my sister, there are only two of us, is married and provided for. And besides that, I have the offer of a job as chief assistant engineer in the experimental department of Messrs. Gletthill and Swan, the big engineering firm in Toronto. This war may scotch that for the time being, but I don't think I should have any difficulty in finding something else of the same sort after the war. And if Jenny didn't like the idea of Canada, I'd be willing to stick to England but I think personally she'd love the life out there and just do fine in it. But I thought you wanted to go to Belgium with your aeroplane, Lydia said quickly, as though convicting the young man of idle boasting. Why, yes, that's quite right. So I do. And so I mean to. So you see, if Jenny marries me and then I get a German bullet through me, she'll be left provided for under my will and probably receive a pension as well as my widow. Thus, cheerfully, did Mr. Valentine dispose of Lydia's challenge. They drew up before the small station, and Lydia fastened the pony's head to the painted white rails after the country fashion. I hope the train hasn't gone. But the train was not even signaled. She'll be forty minutes late, said the porter with gloomy importance. Tis the same all along the line, Miss Damerel. Do we sit down in the shade and have patience now? Tis the war, as they say when I'm coming to. Lydia and Mr. Valentine looked at one another. That philosopher is just about right, I guess, said the young man. If you needn't hurry back, we can sit here and finish our talk. Lydia assented. She felt that in the first moment of shock she had probably failed to express herself with sufficient decision. Mr. Rowland Valentine should return to London under no misapprehension. There really is very little more to be said, Mr. Valentine. Apart from everything else, this is not a time for insisting upon one's small personal affairs. If England really is going into this war, no one knows what may happen. Values will be all turned upside down, and nothing will ever be the same again. Why, the country might even be invaded as poor Belgium has been. It doesn't bear thinking of. You can see for yourself that this is no time to take risks. Now why do you say that? I'm quite sure that you took risks in your time. Why do you grudge Jenny the experience of taking hers? The question made Lydia very angry. 
Do you realize that you are adopting a most offensive attitude in speaking as though I was Jenny's enemy? As though I were anything but the best friend she has in the world? You said just now that I'd made her afraid of me. If Jenny has said or implied that to you, then it shows most heartless ingratitude. But I can't believe it. Bitter though it is to me to own it, she and I have not always lived in peace together. But Jenny has never heard a harsh or unkind word from me since she was born. Lydia could hardly go on speaking for a moment. Her passionate self-justification made almost as much to herself as to Roland Valentine was vibrant with intense sincerity. It seemed to her that she was at last putting into words her own inner knowledge. The knowledge that loyalty to her disloyal child and the old habit of reticence had never before allowed her to formulate. Jenny was nine years old when her father died. I was a young woman, but I lived quietly in the country for the child's sake. I devoted myself to her. You understand that I'm not saying this as though I were boasting of it, but your attitude forces me to put the facts before you in so many words. I watched over her health. I worked for her, mended for her, did everything for her, and now I'm told by a stranger who hasn't known my child a fortnight that I've made her afraid of me? Well, that is so. Mr. Valentine's tone was impersonal, although he poked with his stick at the soft red gravel beneath the bench on which they sat, as though he wished to look at that, and not at Lydia. Jenny is very young, and perhaps undeveloped, as you say, Mrs. Damerel, but you don't need me to tell you that she has a very strong individuality, and that's just what the trouble is. She's afraid all the time, whether she knows it or not, of your swamping that. Jenny very much resents your working for her, and mending for her, and doing everything for her, the way you say you always have. I guess she feels it's just about time she shouldered some responsibility for herself. But she's not fitted for it. You don't understand. Jenny can't do the simplest practical thing for herself. She couldn't undertake any real responsibility yet. Why, she knows that right enough. And you see, it makes her feel that the sooner she buys her experience and learns, the better. It's just your care and your protection that she's afraid of, Mrs. Damerel. And because she's just a child, and undisciplined, her instincts for asserting her own individuality take an ungracious form, that's all. She hasn't analyzed her own feelings the way I'm analyzing them now, because she isn't the introspective kind. She just feels she's up against it and doesn't quite know why. No, she doesn't, said Lydia bitterly, and I may add that in my opinion neither do you. Do you quite realize, I wonder, Mr. Valentine, the absurdity of this, that you, a very young man and practically a stranger to both of us, should be endeavoring to explain to me my own child, whom I've been studying ever since she was born. As to that, said Mr. Valentine, still without heat, your studying hasn't led to any very great success, if I may point that out. It looks as though the result had only been to make you and Jenny fret one another considerably, and make Jenny think herself a wicked, ungrateful girl, when she's only a perfectly natural one put into a false position. Now in Canada, a girl like Jenny would have been independent if she'd wanted to be some time ago. She'd have gone to school, for one thing, and she'd have been helping in the household work for another, and taking her due share of responsibility all the time. That's the privilege as well as the duty, after all, of every human being, isn't it? And she might have taken up school teaching or worked as a stenographer or a secretary in some business in the city, and just been home for her vacations. I guess if that had been so over here, she'd have been glad enough to be waited on and made a fuss of when she did come back to you in holiday time. But as things are, it just seems as though you were refusing her the natural right of the individual, the right of experience. And these are the thanks that I get for sacrificing myself for my child, cried Lydia, almost involuntarily letting the words break from the sharpest pain that she had ever known. 
Well, it's only another kind of sacrifice that's wanted, that's all, said Mr. Valentine calmly. If you want to sacrifice yourself some more for Jenny, Mrs. Damerel, it seems to me the way you can do it best is just the way that'll hurt you most. Let her take her own risks and shoulder her own responsibilities. It's the lot of parents, I suppose, to watch the children for whom they would lay down their lives, spurn the help and tenderness that sheltered their childhood, and rush ignorantly and foolhardily to try their own wings. See here, said the young man earnestly, Jenny isn't going to be alone. Jenny's going to marry me. I don't say much about that side of the question, because I feel I've kind of butted in too much already, and you'd most likely rather not hear any more about me for quite a while, or, at any rate, until you've heard what Jenny has to say. But I'll make her a good husband, Mrs. Damerel, as God Almighty hears me say it now. He bared his head for a moment with a curious, reverent simplicity. I'm not the romantic sort, and Jenny isn't either. But I kind of knew right away that she and I are just meant for one another, and I've never felt that way before. Although in Canada we've a great deal more freedom than boys and girls over here, and get to know one another pretty intimately. Lydia's strained mind turned instinctively to what already seemed to have become a side issue. Do you mean that you've already asked Jenny to marry you? That's what I came down to do. I'd have asked her that evening at Quintmere, that wonderful evening when she came to the field to look at my old machine under its tarpaulin. Only I was kind of afraid it might scare her if I was too quick, somehow, said Valentine with a slightly apologetic laugh. That old house and the old lady there and all the old servants that seem to have grown up there made me feel like a sort of mushroom sprung up in the night. But Jenny didn't seem part of it altogether, not the way that young Billy does, who'll own it all some day, I suppose. Jenny's outgrown it all, Mrs. Damerel. She's just crying out for the new order of things, and I'm going to see that she gets it. As though to enhance the effect of ultimatum with which the words were spoken, a sudden stir traversed the sleepy little station. The porter came up again to Lydia. Signalled now, Miss Damerel. She'll be in directly. Lydia and Roland Valentine both rose. She looked at him with challenging eyes. I shall write to you, Mr. Valentine, when I have heard what Jenny has to say. And don't consider, please, that I can give you any encouragement whatever. The very way in which you have precipitated things shows a want of real respect for my daughter. I guess the war isn't going to wait for any of us, said Mr. Valentine. This card has my address. The club will always find me. But it's only fair to tell you that Jenny has it too, and I'm expecting her to make use of it. I'm sorry things have happened this way, Mrs. Damerel, and I wish I had more time to try and put my viewpoint before you. But if I can fix things up in London the way I expect, and get leave to come down and fetch my machine away from Plymouth, You'll be seeing me around again very shortly. Meanwhile, good-bye, and thank you. The train came into the station, and Mr. Valentine, unhampered by luggage, gravely raised his cap to Lydia in salutation and got inside. Neither made any movement towards shaking hands. Lydia turned away with the despairing sense that she did not know what to do next. She felt unable to face Jenny. Jenny who had given her no confidences, who had told the stranger with whom she thought herself to be in love that she was afraid of her mother. Lydia thought that later on perhaps she might be able to talk to Jenny. For the moment, she wanted only to assuage her own desperate pain. As she turned out of the station, she came face to face with Natalie's husband, Colonel Kennedy. For an instant, her first fear was lest he should notice the misery in her face and ask her what had happened. But the colonel only said abruptly, London papers not come. I suppose you came on the same errand, Mrs. Damerel. But what's the use? We shall be kept without news till tomorrow now, I suppose. My boy has promised to telegraph from Greenwich. You know, his brother has had to rejoin his ship. Alec? Telegraphed for. We don't even know where he is. He seems so young, sighed Lydia. Well, anyhow, your little Charlie is all right. 
He'll be out of it all at his age. He's only thirteen, said the Colonel gruffly. They'll rush em through like anything, though. I'm glad now that they neither of them had a fancy for soldiering and chose the Navy instead. They can be made use of right away, young as they are, if they're wanted. Lydia looked at him with involuntary admiration. How's Natalie? Come along and see her, said Colonel Kennedy. Lydia accepted with a certain relief. She wanted to postpone her return home, hardly able to bear the thought of speaking to Jenny, and reflecting also that delay would give her daughter time for thought. She felt, too, with a sudden and most unwanted sense of dependence, that Natalie was her earliest friend, one of her own time and generation, who would assuredly understand and comfort her. For the first time she consciously felt need of that quiet, stable affection and friendship of Natalie's that had always been there, waiting in the background of Lydia's whole existence. She raised her tired eyes. "'I'll come with you now,' she said to the Colonel. "'Poor Natalie, she must be frightfully anxious, and though one can't do anything, it may be a comfort to her to have someone to talk to.' Involuntarily she put forward Natalie's possible need of her, not hers of Natalie. "'Thank you, yes,' said the Colonel. And when he took Lydia into his wife's drawing-room, Natalie exclaimed gratefully, "'Oh, Lydia, how dear and good of you to come! I knew I should see you soon!' Natalie showed Lydia the telegram that had recalled their elder boy, the sailor, and speculated vainly as to when they might hope to know where he was, and she recapitulated with a mixture of wistfulness and pride the chances that little Charlie, too, would be sent to sea before the war was over. Her husband, she said, would try to rejoin his old regiment. Because, of course, it's war, Lydia. Jack says the Germans have been working for this all along, that they're mad enough to want to fight us. Oh, doesn't it all seem like a nightmare? And a week ago we were all so peaceful and happy. What is Billy Damerel going to do, Lydia? He's in London. He told Joyce that he should enlist the minute the war is declared. Of course they'll give him a commission. Of course, his poor mother. Lydia let Natalie go on talking and listened almost as though she were in a dream. It seemed to her extraordinary that now, when she was suffering as she had never in her life suffered before, this supreme preoccupation should have come over the whole world, absorbing all attention, all speculation. It even struck her as remarkable that she should presently be having tea with Natalie in the small porch overlooking the garden, and that Natalie should still have made no reference to the topic that absorbed her own thoughts. But, of course, Natalie knew nothing about it. If she were to know, Lydia must tell her. It had never been Lydia's way to make confidences about her own affairs. Grandpapa's lesson had been too well learned for that, and she had preferred other people to guess or infer it when trouble overtook her. She had often noticed, even whilst showing herself sympathetic and interested, how very ready others were to talk about themselves and make their confidences, in curious contrast to herself. But Natalie evidently had guessed nothing. She talked on and on about the war, about her own two boys and the sons of the neighboring families in the county, one or two young soldiers she knew had already received peremptory orders to rejoin their regiments. That young Scotsman the bishop's daughter is engaged to has had to go, Lydia. They may even have to put off the wedding. I do think it's hard on the girl. If I were her, I should get married as quickly as possible, I think. Why? said Lydia sharply. They'll have had something anyhow that way. If they were married, she could be with him up to the last minute and perhaps go and look after him if he's wounded later on. I've heard lots of people say that. Oh, Lydia, it's going to be dreadful for all these young people. Look at your own Jenny. She's not begun life yet, and there she is in the midst of tragedy and horror. All the boys of her own age going off to fight and be killed, perhaps. She's had none of the innocent enjoyment that we had yet, and heaven knows if they'll any of them enjoy anything any more now. This nightmare won't last. It can't last, said Lydia, 
they're young they'll recover from all this and have their lives before them it's we who know what it all means that are the worst sufferers i think look at you natalie having to let alec go and perhaps little charlie natalie shook her head her eyes were full of tears and she did not speak presently her father came and joined them mr palmer was a very old man but he didn't seem to lydia to have changed a great deal since the early days of her own married life when he had lived his gentle unobtrusive life beside her and clement at the rectory and treated her now as though she were his daughter it was he who gazed at her with his mild good blue eyes that needed no glasses yet even though they had lost their brightness and said gently you've come to share this anxiety with us lydia my dear that's very good of you but you look tired and troubled there is no fresh news is there nothing that i know of lydia overwrought and resentful of natalie's blindness could not withstand the kind anxiety with which mr palmer still looked at her i am worried though i hardly know if i ought to say anything about it to any one yet but i'm afraid little jenny has been reckless and silly i've not been taking proper care of her oh lydia jenny's not ill is she poor child said natalie her voice all genuine concern at once no no she's embarked on a uh i don't know what to call it except a sort of flirtation with that canadian friend of billy's the young man who came down here in a flying machine the other day i remember said natalie isn't he nice lydia rather third rate and besides they don't know each other they just met that once at quintmere when i'm sorry to say that i let jenny stay there without me just for one night and then they seem to have arranged that he should call on us here on his way from plymouth i remember you told me said natalie did he come he came to-day lydia paused and her mouth tightened she could never bring herself to speak to any one of the things the unpardonable things that young valentine had said to her she did not wish to recall them to her own mind when they stabbed her afresh with every involuntary recollection well said natalie placidly you'll have heaps of things of that sort to reckon with lydia now that jenny's grown up i've always thought the girls must be more trouble than boys especially if they're attractive jenny will marry young i'm sure she won't marry this young man said lydia natalie said something about canada being a long way off and then her face changed again but poor little girls of this generation there may not be any one for them to marry who knows what is going to happen the rector's eyes had never left lydia's face is this young canadian undesirable in any way my dear his manners are not good lydia declared really i know very little about him her tone was quite purposely light as though by treating the subject casually she were relegating mr roland valentine and his proposal to the negligible value of a mere episode and little jenny is in love with him he is conceited enough to think so said lydia she even laughed with a curious sense of relief at being able thus trivially to present the canadian's declared certainty that his love was returned it was as though while convincing the rector and natalie she was also convincing herself jenny and i haven't had our talk about it yet he stole a march on her when i drove him to the station this afternoon i should let them be engaged if i were you lydia natalie said wearily if we're all going to war heaven knows what will happen to any of us and she'll anyway have a man to take care of her i suppose he'll go back to canada i suppose so i don't know said lydia stiffly she did not want to proclaim the canadian's intention of taking his aeroplane into the zone of war aware that the knowledge would only strengthen natalie in her unconsidered advice to let the young generation snatch at its desires of the moment i must go natalie the child will be wondering what has happened to me if you get any news you'll let me know at once oh lydia what shall we see in the papers to-morrow lydia went away with the speculation still ringing in her ears she felt unreasonably resentful that natalie had taken no serious interest in the individual problem centering round jenny 
and the decision of her future that lay in Jenny's mother's hands. But she realized that the resentment was unjust, and that she herself had purposely spoken as though the affair were of no account. How could she do otherwise, when the real hurt lay in those phrases that Lydia so passionately denied and repudiated, in which young Valentine had arrogantly taken upon himself to epitomize her mental and moral attitude towards her child? End of chapter 25 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter Twenty Six of the Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The country had been at war for over a month, and the epidemic of war marriages had already set in. Engaged girls bought special licenses, bought their own wedding rings, held everything in readiness for an immediate marriage whenever he should get leave, and every day fresh engagements were announced. What are they all thinking about? said Lydia, half impatiently, when they heard at Ashloo that the bishop had taken his daughter to London himself, at twenty-four hours' notice, to marry her Highlander. She said it only because it seemed to her that everything was conspiring to the ultimate achievement of an immediate marriage between Jenny and Roland Valentine. It would come to that. Lydia knew it quite well, had known it with absolute certainty ever since old Lady Lucy, the conservative, the tradition-bound Lady Lucy had said to her very gently, I'm very sorry for you, my dear, but poor little Jenny, let her be happy while she can. We hear nothing against this young man, quite the contrary, and this is a new world we're going to live in. The old traditions mustn't be made binding on these young folks who are giving up everything. And I think he is a good young man, said Lady Lucy emphatically. Valentine was at Ashloo again, with three days' leave before departing with his aeroplane to the front. He's not a gentleman, said Lydia, her mouth hardening. She remembered how once upon a time Lady Lucy had begged her son Clement to wait, before asking in marriage a girl who was indubitably not of his own social standing. Colonial manners are never the same as ours, declared Lady Lucy, my dear, I think that in all the essentials, Mr. Valentine is a gentleman, and somehow the little rule of thumb by which one always had measured things up to now doesn't seem to hold good any longer. We must go back to essentials in these terrible times, the old primitive things. Supposing I let Jenny marry him, and he is killed in a week, what has she gained? Supposing you don't let her marry him, and he is killed, what then? asked the old lady gently. Would Jenny ever forgive you, Lydia? At Jenny's age, though it would be a brutal thing to say to her now, one's first love is not one's last. She would almost certainly come to care for someone else. Lydia's mother-in-law did not point out to her that the argument applied as much to Jenny prematurely widowed as to Jenny unwedded. Instead, she put into words an insistent intuition of Lydia's own that she had tried strenuously to stifle. My dear, forgive me, but have you altogether taken into consideration Jenny's temperament? She might, as you say, come to care for someone else, but will it ever be like this again? Lady Lucy's old face flushed delicately. It was love at first sight on both sides, Lydia, and they are madly in love. The change in little Jenny is one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. Lydia winced. To her lifelong instinct of repression, that ardor of Jenny's, unrestrained as unconcealed, came as something almost shocking. It was true that Jenny was changed. Lydia had seen traces of tempestuous tears on her face on the very evening of the day that Roland Valentine had gone up to London, driven to the station by Lydia. And Jenny had said, I'm crying because I'm so madly happy. I didn't know anybody on earth could be so happy. I can't help crying. She cried, but her eyes said, as her lips had said, that it was because she was so madly happy. When the war was declared and Lydia, white-faced, had bidden Jenny try to realize what it might mean for all of them, for England, for Billy Damerel, for Natalie's boys, for thousands of other boys, 
Jenny had said recklessly, "I know it's all true, and that I don't realize it. I can't even realize Roland is going out there, and whatever happens, nothing can ever, ever take away what I've had." What Jenny had had. In those early days, she had had less than half a dozen meetings with Roland Valentine, one impassioned declaration of love, a brief imperative farewell, and then only long daily letters, of which Lydia knew nothing but that they sent Jenny, radiant-eyed, to the indicting of blotted, scrawled replies to be sealed and taken to the post office in her own clasp. Now, six weeks later, by degrees that seemed to Lydia in the retrospect sometimes almost imperceptible, and sometimes tempestuously sudden, Jenny had had, as she put it, a good deal more. Roland Valentine's claim as to his modest income, and the considerable salary that he would be in a position to obtain when he chose to apply for it, were triumphantly verified. Other inquiries, of which Jenny, so far as Lydia was aware, had been told little, but which were stringently made through Billy Damerel and Colonel Kennedy, met with unimpeachable reassurances. And so the young man came down to Ashloo once more, wearing the magic uniform that still excited a display of enthusiasm all over England whenever it appeared. Lady Lucy capitulated. The Kennedys, Natalie eagerly and her husband more cautiously, advocated the cause of the lovers. Joyce Damerel had always unwaveringly, if hitherto almost silently, supported Jenny's claims against her mother. Of course they're engaged, said Joyce. He's asked her to be his wife, and she's promised. The only question is whether you'll let them marry at once, Lydia, and I don't see how you can refuse in times like these. Lydia was making her last stand. She knew herself defeated. She knew that Jenny and Roland Valentine would marry in the course of his first leave from the front. She even knew clearly and inexorably that her position to the marriage was based upon no objection that could be made valid in the eyes of the Damerels, the Kennedys, her other friends. She argued with them, not because she thought for a moment that argument would convince them, but in a desperate last effort to cheat herself into believing that her attitude was what she represented it to be, and not the mere manifestation of an impassioned resentment that the man to take Jenny from her should be a man who saw her, and would encourage Jenny to see her, with the hard, defiant gaze of youth in judgment. She never liked Joyce Damerel, but in the new and overwhelming sense of loneliness that had come upon her, Lydia appealed to Joyce. Can't you understand, when all the objection as to Canada, and his not being altogether quite, and Jenny's youth and all the rest of it, when they've all been disposed of, there's still something else, Joyce. Roland Valentine doesn't like me. How can you expect him to? He knows that you're against the marriage. It was before that. A sort of antagonism. Don't you remember that very first evening of all when we all dined at Quintmere? I remember that he took Jenny's part every time, said Joyce bluntly. Surely you wouldn't want him to do anything else, Lydia. If he loves her and is going to marry her, how can you possibly want him to take anybody's part but hers? Ever. Why must there be parts to take? Joyce shrugged her shoulders. Now you're raising another issue altogether. Yes, that's quite true, said Lydia, collecting herself. My point is this, though. An older man, one of more experience and wider sympathies, would have understood my position, my whole attitude in regard to Jenny, and would have brought her in time to see it, too. This boy, with his crude, colonial ideas of independence and his young, arrogant, heartless verdict, gratitude is a beastly feeling, he actually said that to me, Joyce, quite naively. Everything that is defiant and ungrateful in Jenny, he will exaggerate. I don't think Jenny is ungrateful to you, exactly. Do you think I want gratitude from my own child? cried Lydia illogically. Yes, said Joyce, you do. You want unquestioning gratitude from her the whole time, and unquestioning acceptance of everything that you do for her. 
And it's absolutely against nature that you should get it, Lydia. Jenny is sturdy and independent by nature. If she hadn't been, by this time you would have made her into a helpless, selfish, boneless weakling. As it is, of course, she's in a state of constant rebellion. She wants to be generous and to give, and to take care in her turn, and so she ought. But you want to arrogate all those rights to yourself. What you are accusing me of, said Lydia bitterly, is of having loved Jenny too well and sacrificed myself too much for her sake. I? said Joyce slowly. If you want to know, Lydia, I think you the most monstrous egotist that I have ever known in my life. Not only the shock of hearing herself so described, but also the amazement of hearing so trenchant a personality from Joyce Damerel, who was never personal and seldom vehement, kept Lydia absolutely silent. She looked at her sister-in-law without a word. Joyce faced her unflinchingly and without any compassion or hesitation in her gaze. Perhaps I've no right to say these things to you, but for once I'm going to. While Clement was alive, I shouldn't have said a word. It was for him to say it, if anyone did, only he never would have. Oh, I know he was your husband, but I knew Clement and his brother in their nursery days. We were all more or less brought up together and he never would have spoken for fear of hurting you. He'd only have kept Jenny more and more with him. Do you remember when Clement died, how you kept on telling me that Jenny was too young to understand, that she wouldn't really feel it? You didn't want her to feel it, because you wanted to have the sole prerogative of grief. Clement's mother is old and a saint. Even you couldn't grudge her her sorrow but you knew very well that she wouldn't claim any pity or sympathy, and the very old are too near eternity to get the compassion of the multitude. You wanted it all for yourself. You grudged Jenny her share, and you wouldn't admit that she had any right to suffer at all. And it's been like that all along. Jenny may have the nice little happy, easy, trivial things, especially if she owes them all to you, and everyone knows it. But the real experiences, the things that hurt and teach one, and are the privilege of the people that are to be worth anything, those she must leave to you. And you try to believe, and make everyone else believe, that because you make Jenny's clothes, and live economically, and are a wonderful manager, and save money for her, and do the tiresome things in the house yourself, so that she can enjoy herself in the garden, because of all that, you love Jenny as no daughter has ever been loved before, and it puzzles and pains everyone that she doesn't seem grateful and loving in return. Well, it isn't Jenny you love at all. It's yourself. I don't believe you ever loved anyone, Lydia. A very faraway echo of the past came dimly to Lydia's stunned perceptions. A little pale-faced cockney girl, Rosie Graham, the cashier at Alina's, had once said something to her like that. I know very little about your life before you marry Clement, said Joyce ruthlessly. Perhaps there was someone then. But you didn't want any friends or relations to come and stay with you as most girls do when they marry and have a house. Natalie told us you had cousins and an aunt and uncle who brought you up and friends in London, but we never saw any of them. Your aunt came when we were all away, and after you had been married for years and years. Clement wanted her to come while he was alive, and it was you who didn't want anyone. It was our home. Why should I want other people? Lydia attempted to justify herself mechanically and without conviction. Joyce laughed contemptuously. That cock won't fight, my dear. The old rector came to you at your own suggestion before you'd been married a year. Clement's mother loved you for that, and thought it was a sacrifice you were making so that Natalie could get married and go to India, and so that Clement could come down here and live near her. It wasn't a sacrifice, Lydia. Nothing matters to you so much as having the bow roll. You can't bear anyone else to be in the foreground, and no sacrifice costs anything if it'll get you there. 
you sacrificed even clement over and over again how dare you speak like that lydia was choking i've watched it for nearly twenty years joyce declared recklessly and i've not spoken once you told us do you remember that your grandfather had given you a rule and that you'd kept it all your life always to let the other people talk about themselves and you did you let the people that did love you clement and good simple natalie kennedy and little jenny at first you let them all talk about themselves and you listened thinking all the time how superior you were to be able to keep your own counsel and never give yourself away in return and when you were sympathetic and said kind things about what they'd told you they were grateful and that pleased you because it put you in the position of giving while they only took but that sort of thing won't go down forever with sensitive and loving people do you suppose that clement didn't come to know that there was nothing real behind all your patience and your sympathy and your listening you liked to feel that he was dependent on you for something that was all you didn't really care for his little fiddling jobs about the garden that jenny loved instinctively you didn't really care about the parish and the people although you liked being the parson's wife and having them come to you for things clement found out what your sympathy was worth and that his in return that he would have given you so lavishly wasn't what you wanted or ever would want he fell in love with your pretty face and your quick wits and with what he thought was your courage in going to work as a young girl in london and he helped you when i suppose even you for once in your life were frightened and in want of comfort when you found yourself an ignorant and helpless child on the verge of being mixed up in the divorce scandals of your employer you'd got down to bedrock that time i imagine and needed someone human and warm-hearted like clement to come to your help don't mention his name to me again cried out lydia suddenly no i won't i've said my say and if it's hurt you lydia i'm glad not because i hate you i don't know though i came very near it once when i saw clement first bewildered and not understanding what it was that you lacked and then gradually realizing what i'd realized long ago that you care for nothing and nobody on earth except as it affects yourself joyce as she had told lydia had said her say the two women faced one another in dead silence for another moment then joyce damerel turned and left the room lydia sitting huddled in a chair beside the window with eyes that conveyed hardly any message to her stunned mind saw her sister-in-law's tall figure walking away swiftly across the garden she was left alone jenny and young valentine were out together the house was curiously silent so that was what joyce thought of her did it matter joyce and she had never liked one another and joyce's opinion did not really count for very much only gradually was lydia's inner vision able to focus the real point at issue were these accusations true falteringly and very very slowly in its deepening anguish her mind took a long journey back through the years through a dim childish era when she had proudly resented her mother's widowhood to which her own orphanship must be subordinated she had hardly regretted her mother's death at all partly because it had freed her from the capricious tyranny of weakness principally because it had left her undisputed the first right to consideration and compassion through the inauguration of her life in the little regency terrace household she had known all the time even as a little girl that aunt evelyn was silly and snobbish aunt beryl limited and provincial uncle george pedantic with his perpetual mr barlow monologues on uninteresting subjects their old friend mr monteagle almond a pompous and narrow-minded little bank clerk who had never made any success of his life they had been very kind to her had admired and praised her cleverness without stint as without discrimination and had trustfully displayed their real characteristics to the little daniel come to judgment 
who had always listened and responded so intelligently and gently she had taken what they offered keeping her own counsel all the time and inwardly criticizing and despising them grandpapa but grandpapa had known all the while one could not doubt for an instant that grandpapa's shrewdness had penetrated through all the good behavior and proper deference of the little girl lydia to the acute self-interest that had actuated the good behavior and the deference grandpapa had known perhaps at first it had amused him his teaching had not been of tolerance or humility but of bracing self-repression and self-advancement there's no such thing as can't don't give everything a personal application it bores people but later on he had been less amused and more contemptuous was it of lydia's methods slowly her thoughts took her through the long ago school days at miss glover's ambition had made her work and the stimulus of admiration but there had been human relations there too surely across lydia's memory flitted a long half obliterated procession of mollies and doras who had walked up and down the gardens with her arm in arm pouring out the stories of school quarrels school adventures school tragedies that filled the horizon for them you won't repeat this to a soul lydia ever will you i can trust you oh yes lydia could be trusted never to repeat the long involved histories repeating only meant trouble for the tale-bearer natural shrewdness and fastidiousness combined had prevented her from making any return confidences always let other people talk about themselves then they were in the weaker position at once and forever lydia had tacitly accepted the obligations of these implied friendships but she had felt herself all the time to be vastly superior to them through the school years still to the arrival of natalie palmer the girl from devonshire manners dress accent all slightly different from those of the town girls at the school making friends with natalie had been eminently worth while and her whole-hearted admiration pleasant and natalie was so generous in her recognition of lydia's infinite superiority of brain and personality that it was possible to indulge from time to time in the occasional luxury of self-expression with her the friendship with natalie had survived their shared school days given fresh impetus on lydia's side by the consciousness that the grey-headed distinguished-looking rector the devoted father of natalie had approved of her clever schoolmate and suggested that later on she should come and stay at the devonshire rectory the end of school and a catastrophe that still loomed large on the skyline of lydia's memory illness on the very verge of the examination that was to crown so many minor honors even the pitying attention so lavishly bestowed upon her had not atoned for that calamity especially when so much of it unprecedentedly had diverged from herself to aunt beryl a sudden rival claimant to illness on and on through those old past times the visit to wimbledon and the intolerable bouncing boisterous senthovens even lydia had only been able to endure garnering what profit to herself was possible from their slangy elliptical instruction more than mere endurance would have been impossible and after all no need to assume sympathy or admiration in the case of the loud and self-satisfied senthovens they took tribute to their prowess for granted wanted no demonstrations no nonsense about us they cried nevertheless the senthovens had been ready enough with shouted congratulations and boastings and had made ungrudging jubilee over lydia's success to them so incomprehensible and unattainable in the great school examination lydia remembered quite well how the news had come and rescued her from her humiliating standing as the spoil sport of the party who had clumsily contrived to hurt olive senthoven in a game of cricket it had also distracted all the attention from olive and her bruised face and focused it upon lydia rescuing her once and for all from the ignominy of her position amongst the senthovens after school days and the senthovens her bid for independence and london 
backwards still through the days of that early bewildering experiment from elena herself that peroxide blonde of such astute experience to the pallid young ladies in the millinery lydia's personality had made conquests of them all how freely they had giggled and gossiped before her and eventually poured out their confidences just as recklessly as the little schoolgirls at miss glover's in those days lydia really had admired her own diplomacy that had so quickly established her as general favourite in a community with which she really had so little in common shrewd pale-faced rosy graham didn't matter one had thought she did at first because she had brains and acumen and something in her very scornfulness itself was oddly alluring a certain attraction about miss graham until measured by the standard of importance applied to one's first affair with a man margoliath his oily and uninspired pawings there was no other word for them in the retrospect had certainly roused no ardour in lydia it had merely been agreeable to feel herself the centre of speculation amongst the matrons and spinsters of miss nettleship's boarding-house and competent to take care of herself in the accepted sense of the words lydia had discreetly permitted the greek's advances conscious all the time of the prestige accruing to her from theatre expeditions handsome cab drives gifts of violets and boxes of cadbury chocolates she had viewed as a safeguard her own perfectly distinct inward determination that margoliath should never be allowed in return for these favours to overstep the limits set by lydia's careful sense of discretion disaster and humiliation had threatened the termination of that episode the first hint of which had been miss nettleship's plaintive and nervously spoken warning of the greek gentleman's inability to meet his bills a worse revelation then and a more public one had been that of mrs margoliath's unexpected existence pain had really threatened then had hung like a descending cloud above lydia's humiliated head but her secret boast had been that after all she had turned that defeat into victory the victory of a fine attitude that had won her a great deal of admiration and a pity that was not condescending from all the spectators of the little sordid drama it had also brought her an odd revelation that she remembered still the conviction that there was no calamity without its available compensation in the shape of a not at all discreditable notoriety through the phases of her youth still the writing of her story and the introduction that it had brought her through voluble miss forster to the unforgettable lady honoret certainly her wit and determination had made the very most of that introduction aided by the curious success that her novel had achieved a side issue lydia envisaged also the fact that she had ceased to write when success in writing had ceased to have any value for enhancing her position amongst her surroundings the writing like everything else had only been a means to an end backwards through that faraway summer holiday that she had manoeuvred to obtain at natalie's home in devonshire gratifying at once her love of gratitude and her desire to justify her own careful schemings by inducing aunt beryl to receive miss nettleship in her stead at regency terrace then the delight of making a success in her new milieu of knowing that admiring natalie and the simple-minded rector were full of praise and thanks for the able help that she had so soon learnt to give them certainly they had had the assistance that her quick brain and nimble fingers could bestow but the things they had given her were things of the spirit affection and trust and loyal admiration and for these they had met with no return in kind was it that lydia was incapable of them joyce said that clement had come to recognize it with the remembrance came shudderingly and reluctantly but with relentless inevitability the linking up of the past with the present clement who had puzzled and almost angered lydia by his gradual transition during their married life from eager confidences and ardent demonstrations to strange apathetic reticences clement lived on in his daughter jenny 
that which she had never acknowledged to herself for the sake of clement for whom her love had been a tepid thing undeserving of the name lydia was coming to recognize for the sake of clement's child jenny was the first person whom lydia had loved and as rosie graham had predicted long long ago she had not known how to set about it loving jenny she had yet as joyce damerel said taken all the greater things for herself and left jenny only the less for herself the beau role for jenny that of foil across her ravaged perceptions tore yet another recollection one that this time seemed to summarize them all she heard again grandpapa's thin old voice with its cynical intonation you're a situation snatcher lydia that's what you are a situation snatcher grandpapa had known end of chapter twenty six recording by c j plogue chapter twenty seven of the heel of achilles by e m delafield this librivox recording is in the public domain mamma the telegram has come Rowland has ten days leave he'll be in london to-morrow jenny's voice held a kind of awe in it as though the unbelievable had come to pass i'll take you there said lydia curtly the concession had been made on the evening in september when jenny coming in from an afternoon spent with her lover had found lydia huddled in a chair by the window of the drawing-room with fixed vacant eyes and chilly hands but although lydia had in no sense nor smallest degree revoked that half-spoken sanction of jenny's engagement that had been inwardly forced upon her in the midst of the hour of truest misery that her life had ever known she could derive no comfort from jenny's sudden unregulated outbursts of jubilant gratitude oh mamma you'll take me to london i told you i would when he got leave he wants the wedding immediately of course jenny nodded if he has ten days you can be married quietly in town by special license and and see him off when he has to go back i want to be married from here said jenny quickly just go up with you to meet him and do perhaps one day's shopping or two while he gets the license and the rings and things and we go and see the old lawyers and people and then come back here for my wedding and go somewhere in the country for a tiny honeymoon till the last possible minute lydia was surprised it'll be much more tiring for you a lot of rushing about like that her instinct was always to shield jenny from jenny's self Rowland wants it to be like that too the defiant gleam of one who expects opposition had come into jenny's eyes again don't jenny take that tone i'm not saying you shan't have it your own way why do you want to be married here and not in london which would be so much simpler it's my home cried jenny and besides i want to have all the people i can even if i have got to be married in a travelling dress and without proper bridesmaids or anything i may as well have some fun we don't know any people in london she spoke like a child lydia reflected and yet when they met roland valentine in london twenty-four hours later jenny no longer spoke like a child she was quite different infinitely more reposeful gentler more womanly was this the real jenny lydia's perceptions were far too acute for her not to know that it was with roland not with herself that jenny was at ease and therefore was absolutely natural roland valentine himself pleased lydia better than on any former occasion he too was graver and more quiet and he thanked her very earnestly for giving her consent to an immediate wedding then went to lawyers to banks to jewellers and innumerable other shops and roland procured the special license and jenny's strong sunburnt finger was measured for the wedding ring the ring was to follow them to devonshire by post something was to be engraved inside the gold circlet but lydia was not told what it was to be jenny had never been secretive or even reserved but it never seemed to occur to her to give her mother her confidence now any more than she had ever given it to her in the course of the last seven or eight years lydia although she had been aware of this before 
had never suffered from it as she suffered now. Formerly, she might have told herself that Jenny had no confidence to bestow, that nothing lay beneath the surface. Now, she was slowly, and with infinite pain in the recognition, forced to concede to Jenny the existence of a definite and individual personality. Jenny, the potential woman, as distinct from Jenny, Lydia Demerel's child. On the day before that of their proposed return to Devonshire, Jenny unexpectedly demanded whether they could not look up Aunt Evelyn and Aunt Beryl. I've seen Rollins' relations, the only ones in England at least, and I think he ought to see mine. So he has. He's been at Quintmere, and he knows your grandmother and Billy. Lydia had not the slightest desire to look up the Senthovens, and once more there was the instinctive conviction that what Jenny suggested for herself could not be the best thing for her. That's just it, said Jenny. He says they all make him feel like an adventurer down there. It's so old and sort of traditional. I know just what he means. So I want him to see what awfully ordinary sorts of relations I have, as well as people like Granny and Aunt Joyce. The recollection flashed across Lydia's mind incontinently of the care with which she, engaged to be married to Jenny's father, had avoided any such display of relatives and their ordinariness. However, Roland Valentine, the Canadian mechanic, would scarcely prove critical. Lydia sent a prepaid telegram to Regency Terrace and received Aunt Beryl's laconic reply. Delighted. The short, familiar journey was thronged for Lydia, in her new mood of painful introspection, with such memories as it seemed to never have held before. Jenny and Roland Valentine sat opposite to her in the train. They talked to one another in low tones, and every now and then looked into one another's eyes. It seemed to Lydia that, even in the gaze of the young man who had already been at the front for more than three months, there was no apprehension of parting, only the ecstatic recognition of an immense bliss. She felt herself overwhelmingly lonely. Regency Terrace, as usual, looked astonishingly unchanged. One almost expected to see Grandpapa's head at the bow window of the dining room behind the lace curtains, to hear Shamrock's shrill, eager barking on the steps. Aunt Beryl wore a dark blue skirt and a flannel blouse with a high collar, just as she had worn every winter ever since Lydia could remember her. Come in, dear. I'm ever so pleased to see you. How do you do, Mr. Valentine? I'm quite well, thank you. Well, Jenny, I declare... Aunt Beryl looked at Jenny with an open adoration that she had not conceded even to Lydia in Lydia's younger days. Aunt Evelyn is in the drawing room, and Olive. It's a great piece of luck having Olive here. She's doing V.A.D. work at our Belgian hospital in King's Road, and she's got the afternoon off. Tell Aunt Evelyn that you think Olive's looking better, Lydia, if you get the chance. She's awfully down on the poor girl for wanting to do this work. She says she isn't strong enough and will knock herself up. It's only because we know the matron that Evelyn let her go there at all. Aunt Beryl shook her head and conducted them into the drawing room. If Jenny wanted Roland Valentine to appreciate the fact that she possessed relations who might be described as ordinary, Lydia reflected that she must surely be satisfied now. Never had the Regency Terrace household exhibited such a perfect apotheosis of the commonplace. Olive, in a dark blue uniform that made her look extraordinarily flat-chested, sat on a stool crouched over the fire, her face unbecomingly heated. Aunt Evelyn was in the armchair that had been Grandpapa's, but it, too, had been drawn close to the narrow grate, behind which burned a pile-up mound of coal constantly replenished by Olive from the scuttle. Mrs. Senthoven had visibly aged, although her sister had not. Her increasing deafness compelled her to carry an ear-trumpet that gave her an air of infirmity, and she wore a cap over her thin, parted white hair and a little knitted shawl across her shoulders. With a sort of shock, Lydia realized that Aunt Evelyn must be past sixty. They had to shout at her, for she would not always make use of her ear-trumpet. "'Mother does hate that old trumpet of hers,' said Olive in explanation. I tell her she ought to see some of the things our men in the hospital have to put up with. Artificial legs, 
glass eyes, and goodness knows what all. Olive could talk of nothing but the hospital. She had only been working there a month. This sister, I can tell you, Sister McGregor, as she calls herself, she's a terror. A great big woman she is, and wears the scarlet and grey uniform, you know. Well, what do you think men call her? She's a thumping great piece, I must tell you, as broad as she's long, and that's saying something. Well, the men call her the thin red line. Isn't that great now? <laughs> Roland Valentine shouted with laughter, and Jenny laughed too. Even Aunt Beryl, to whom Lydia felt sure that the story could not be new, displayed a sympathetic mirth, and Olive's mother inquired querulously what the joke was. It's an old one, mother, screamed Olive. You've heard it already. But what was it? persisted Evelyn suspiciously. It was Roland Valentine who picked up the trumpet and loudly repeated it into Olive's successful anecdote. Soon it became evident that the introduction of Roland to Jenny's family was to be crowned with success. The young man talked about Canada to Bob's mother, and was shown the photograph of Bob, and Bob's wife, and a fat boy in a kilt, who was explained as my daughter-in-law's only child by her first. She was a widow when Bob met her, but the boy is a nice little fellow, I believe. No second family, I'm sorry to say. But mother has plenty of grandchildren, Olive announced half proudly and half aggressively. Have you seen this one of poor old B's young hopefuls, Lydia? It was a large group, six, seven swains, raging from the ages of fifteen to eight and a half. The girls had frizzed out hair and wore cheap lace collars over their stuff dresses, and the two youngest, both boys, were in velveteen suits, and one grasped a spade and the other a bucket. The photographer had indicated a seascape behind the group. Regular swains, aren't they? said Olive discontentedly. Not a cent even amongst the lot of them, at least not in appearance. Why hasn't this fine little fellow here got a look of his auntie? inquired Roland Valentine, indicating the least unattractive of Mrs. Swain's progeny. Olive looked gratified. Funny you should say that. He's my godson, Horace, and he is a good bit more like our side of the family than any of the others. Not that the others take after their father in anything but looks, I will say. Don't you like him, then? inquired Jenny innocently. Lydia had not thought fit to enter into any details before Jenny as to the little she knew of Beatrice Senthoven's disastrous alliance with Mr. Stanley Swain. She had indeed systematically evaded all Jenny's inquiries about her contemporary cousins. Like him, said Olive explosively, hark at her, Lydia. Why, he's a bad lot, Jenny, that's what he is, a regular scallywag. He, you know... An expressive pantomime of a tilted-up arm and hand, and a motion as of swallowing, completed Olive's terse description of her brother-in-law's failing. "'Ah, a lot of good fellows get their lives spoiled that way,' said Valentine sympathetically, but quite matter-of-factly, thought Lydia. "'Him and Beatrice ought never to have been allowed to go about together the way they did,' said Aunt Evelyn suddenly. "'I blame myself.' "'Now, now, now. Tell us all about this wedding of yours, Jenny,' said Aunt Beryl, violently tactful. "'A regular war wedding, isn't it?' said Olive. "'One of our nurses at the hospital the other day got a telegram just like that to say that her fiasco was coming on leave, and that they were getting married straight away. So this girl I'm telling you about, this nurse, she went straight off with twenty-four hours leave. That's all they'd give her, if you please, and simply came back married.' "'Only twenty-four hours?' exclaimed Jenny. "'What did the husband do?' "'Oh, came down with her, of course, and stayed at the hotel.' "'Well, I think it was too bad,' Aunt Beryl remarked with finality, "'only giving her twenty-four hours like that. Poor thing!' "'One's got to think of the work,' said Olive, shaking her head. "'We're fearfully full up just now. "'I wonder you don't take up nursing, Jenny, "'but perhaps you mean to after you're married.' "'I don't know,' said Jenny calmly. Then she had had some such idea, although Lydia had definitely stated that she was not fitted for such work, and had taken it for granted that Jenny would come home to her after Rollins returned to the front. Lydia had far too much self-command to risk a betrayal of her thought by looking at her daughter, 
but she knew by intuition that Jennie had shot a half-frightened, half-mischievous glance at her in a schoolgirl fashion. "'I'd like to have Jennie doing work in London somewhere,' declared Roland Valentine. "'It'll be handy for my leave, or if I get sent into hospital.' "'We might find a flat in town,' said Lydia quietly. "'There are all sorts of hostels for women workers being opened everywhere,' said Jennie. The implication was obvious enough. At four o'clock, Olive rose importantly. She had been glancing surreptitiously at the clock for the last ten minutes. "'Well, I suppose I must be toddling. What a bore,' she said with an affection of reluctance. "'It's as much as my place is worth to be five minutes late in going on duty. "'I told the girl to put a cup of tea for you in the dining-room, dear. "'You've plenty of time.' "'The girl I've got now,' said Aunt Beryl in parentheses to Lydia, "'is the best I've had since Gertrude left. "'You remember Gertrude, who got married. "'How are you going, Olive?' "'By tram, I suppose. "'Perhaps you and Jenny would like to walk with her "'as far as the tramway centre,' suggested Aunt Beryl, "'with a kindly gleam of rather pallid mirth "'directed at the Canadian. "'Sure. Will you, Jenny? "'Come on, then. Goodbye, Auntie. Goodbye, Lydia, old girl. Awfully glad to have seen you, especially in these busy days. Ta-ta. Olive clattered from the room, quite in the old breezy St. manner. She won't be back till ten o'clock tonight, as likely as not, moaned her mother. She's looking very well on it, declared Aunt Beryl stoutly. Lydia, don't you think Olive looks ever so much better for the interest? Lydia agreed with complete sincerity. Aunt Beryl sat down by the fire and there was a certain relaxation as from a long strain in her bearing. Those are the lucky ones, those that have a job. There's poor George eating his heart out because he's past the age for even the volunteers. It does seem hard, too. All he can do is to stay overtime at the office doing the work of young fellows who've gone to the war. Lydia, that's a fine young chap that Jenny's got there. I'm glad you like him, Aunt Beryl, said Lydia gently. Her tone held no hint of disagreement. To disparage her accepted son-in-law would have offended her taste, besides mitigating her claim to self-sacrificed motherhood. Dear little Jenny, she's full young, but you weren't much older when you married yourself, Lydia. Nearly three years, and Jenny is such a baby for her age. Lydia held tenaciously to the theory of Jenny's tardy development because it seemed to exonerate her from some of the charges that she could not forget, brought against her successively by Roland Valentine and by Joyce de Merrill. She'll mend of that fast enough in these days, poor dear. Besides, said Aunt Beryl thoughtfully, I don't know that she's so much of a baby, Lydia. This engagement will have steadied her, too. I could see a great difference. Evelyn, don't you think Jenny much less of a child, more grown-up-like? What, dear? "'Tell Lydia whether you don't think Jenny much more of a woman since she's been engaged,' screamed Aunt Beryl. "'Oh, yes, poor little Jenny. The world's all being made over in this awful war. It's only the young things who count for anything now.' "'She hasn't heard,' said Aunt Beryl to Lydia, shaking her head. But the observation of the deaf woman had not been so irrelevant, at least to the thoughts that surged into Lydia's subconsciousness. Only the young people counted now. It was they who, in every sense, stood in the forefront of the battle now. Oh, said Lydia, in sudden overwhelming need of a vent for the intolerable misery that was surging within her, I can't bear to think of my little sheltered Jenny suddenly rushed into the realities of life like this. If only I could bear it all for her. Ah, yes, I expect you feel that, said Aunt Beryl with a strange matter-of-factness. I would so gladly take it all for her. Even as she spoke, Lydia realized the full truth of the words. How much easier it would be, how far less costly to herself, to know Jenny ignorant and happy, while she herself, a recognized victim, faced a suffering that would be rendered entirely bearable by that very fact. I'm sure it's very hard to sit by and see others suffer, said Aunt Beryl tritely, and added in the same rather monotonous voice, I was very fond of your mother, Lydia, and I remember quite well thinking how much easier it would have been when your poor father died, if I could have had the pain of it all to myself, instead of having to feel for her, and Aunt Evelyn there as well. 
There was a sort of selfishness in it, like, I dare say. Aunt Beryl, said Lydia suddenly, should you say that I was selfish with Jenny? How do you mean, dear, exactly? There was nothing in Aunt Beryl's voice that showed her protesting, as Lydia inwardly craved that she should protest at the mere suggestion. Then you do think so? No. Oh, no, Lydia, I shouldn't say that, dear. They both glanced at Mrs. Senthoven. She had fallen into a doze and was nodding over the red fire. Lydia's misery drove her to a form of self-revelation utterly foreign to her. I... I've been worried lately. Joyce, my sister-in-law, who has never liked me, began to talk about Jenny the other day, and she sounded as though... as if... She thought that my very love for Jenny was something selfish, had always been selfish. It upset me very much. And she wasn't even logical, Aunt Beryl. She said I'd never cared for anyone but myself, and in the same breath accused me of caring for Jenny selfishly, as though I hadn't lived my whole life for Jenny since her father died. After all, I was quite a young woman when I was left a widow. I, I might have married again. I have sometimes wondered, dear. Of course, living quietly in the depths of the country, I practically never saw anyone, but all the same, I could have married. I dare say that would be so, dear. But don't you see, that would have meant that Jenny could no longer be my first consideration. And I've always put her first, Aunt Beryl, always. She's grown up a very dear girl, I'm sure, said Aunt Beryl expressionlessly. If she were marrying someone we'd all known and liked, and there wasn't this horrible war hanging over it all, if I could only feel that she was going to happiness naturally and normally, then I could bear losing her. It's the lot of parents, and I'd face all my loneliness gladly, if only I didn't feel that some awful loss or grief may be coming to her that I shan't be able to take in her stead. Well, of course you know, dear, Jenny has to live her own life. Aunt Beryl had spoken, colloquially, without emphasis. She had repeated the verdict already voiced crudely by young Valentine and vehemently by Joyce. They thought that Lydia grudged Jenny, had always grudged her, the right of experience. Lydia had never held Aunt Beryl's opinions in high esteem. Indeed, there were very few opinions so to hold. One talked with Aunt Beryl of the people one knew, of household difficulties and of clothes, never of abstract questions nor of inner perplexities. One knew instinctively that for such she would have no solution to offer. And yet Aunt Beryl's simple statement that Jenny had to live her own life carried with it to Lydia an altogether disproportionate dismay. To see one's own child suffer, it's far worse than suffering oneself, she reiterated helplessly. I'm not saying it isn't hard on you, dear. Aunt Beryl softly picked up the little knitted shawl that had slipped from Mrs. Senthoven's shoulders and replaced it without waking her. I'm sure it isn't good for Aunt Evelyn to sleep in the daytime the way she does, Lydia. It isn't what I call wholesome sleep, either. Hark at the way she's breathing. Aunt Beryl reseated herself. About what we were saying, dear, no doubt you'll say me being an old maid, I can hardly enter into a mother's feelings, and probably it's the case. But I always remember that time years and years ago, Lydia, when you went off to London to that Madame Alina's, that shop. I always remember what a way I was in about it. Feeling you were too young, you know, that someone ought to stand between you and the world, and so on and so forth. You know the way one goes on, dear. And then something or other set me thinking, and Mr. Monteagle Almond and Uncle George and I got talking one evening, I remember, and it seemed as though it would be more myself I was thinking about than you, really if I insisted upon you being kept under my wing, as they say, instead of letting you learn for yourself. Of course, said Aunt Beryl apologetically, I'm not saying it's the same thing as being a mother, you understand, but it does seem as though one ought to be ready to let the young people suffer for themselves, so to speak, if that's the way they're going to learn. But I want to see my Jenny happy, said Lydia piteously. I suppose there's no real happiness without there's been sorrow, too, said Aunt Beryl simply. 
Her speech had never been free from provincialisms such as Lydia had instinctively known all her life how to avoid. If you can reach the bell without getting up, Lydia, I wish you'd ring, dear. I'm trying to train the girl to be a bit more punctual with tea of an afternoon. She's very bad that way. She could start laying and then wait the teapot for Jenny and Mr. Valentine. I said tea up here this afternoon so as to save a fire in the dining room. I thought you'd understand, dear. Of course, said Lydia, hardly hearing. I suppose they'll be back in a minute. Oh, Aunt Beryl, if only I knew what was best for Jenny. I should let her judge for herself, dear. Truly I should, said Aunt Beryl placidly. It may hurt you more just to stand by and watch, but it'll be better for her in the long run to have been let learn her own lessons. There was a curious stability about Aunt Beryl's point of view. Lydia did not feel that she could hope to modify it, however mildly it might be reiterated in homely and uneloquent phrases. You mean that I've got to sacrifice Jenny for Jenny's own good? The door of the drawing room opened. You can start bringing up the tea things, Gladys, said Aunt Beryl. Don't make the tea until the young lady and gentleman are in. They've left the door on the jar. But in case you don't hear them, I'll ring. Yes, Miss Raymond. Gladys went away again. She's quite a smart-looking girl, isn't she, Lydia? said her mistress complacently. And one doesn't have to keep nagging all the time. She's thoroughly willing. You were saying, dear, that you ought to sacrifice Jenny for her own good, but I don't know that that's exactly how I'd put it myself. It's more sacrificing yourself that I meant sacrificing your own feelings, like. Another echo. Roland Valentine had said, It's only another kind of sacrifice that's wanted. The way you can do it best is just the way that'll hurt you the most. Let her take her own risks and shoulder her own responsibilities. Yes, it was just the way that hurt Lydia most. No doubt of that. That's the hall door. If the water's boiling, really boiling, mind Gladys, you can make the tea and bring up the hot toast. And Evelyn woke suddenly. Tea? Already? She said eagerly. I must have closed my eyes. It's a shame Olive couldn't stop for a nice cosy tea by the fire before going out. She had a cup in the dining room, dear. Gladys had it all ready. And a piece of cake. I don't like this mad way of scamping her meals, said Aunt Evelyn dejectedly. Fancy that now, Lydia. A bitter wind like today, and there's Olive will come home on top of a tram, as like as not, with her chest and all at nine or ten o'clock tonight. Aunt Beryl firmly picked up the ear trumpet, adjusted it, and spoke through it with vigor. Olive's all right, Evelyn. You know the doctor said she could try for a bit, and she was wild to do something for the war. She'd have fretted herself to fiddle-strings if she hadn't got this job. They both of them spoke, Lydia thought, with a little amusement, as though Olive were quite a young girl instead of a middle-aged woman. As Aunt Beryl's shrill voice ceased, her sister nodded her head reluctantly. Well, well, it's a terrible war, and I wish I were good for anything besides knitting. Though they say the boys out there can't have enough woolies, but it would be easier to go out and do the hard work oneself, if only one could, and leave the children safe at home like when they were little. I expect you are beginning to feel that, Lydia. It's the way of the world now and we must just make the best of our shelf now we're on it. Aunt Evelyn even laughed a little, but Lydia felt as though the whole world were in league against her. End of chapter 27 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter 28 of The Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. They did not go down to Devonshire until the middle of the following day. Lydia had the whole morning to herself, even after she had finished packing up her small suitcase and Jenny's. This time Jenny had made no protest when her mother began to pack for her. She and Roland had gone out together quite early, and although Lydia thought that they had told her of their destination, she seemed able to remember nothing but the essential fact that they were to meet her at the station at one o'clock. In the meantime, she felt an urgent need of occupation, and remembered an apologetic request of Aunt Beryl's. I don't know whether you could ever recommend poor Maria Nettleship's rooms to any of your friends, Lydia, but it would be a real kindness. 
The boarding house has been giving her ever so much trouble lately, and then this war coming. One doesn't know how things will be, and she hasn't got much put by, I'm afraid. I never hear from her without she asks after you in the letter, you know. She's never forgotten you, and if ever you're up that way, I know it will give her real pleasure to see you. But of course she understands you're busy. So far as Miss Nettleship was concerned, Lydia had been busy for many years. Now, however, half curious and half listless, she found herself in the old Bloomsbury neighborhood. Looking up at the tall house, Lydia supposed that it was unchanged, but such a lassitude had crept over her perceptions that she seemed to herself utterly incapable of summoning any vivid recollection to her mind. Should she go in? She felt little inclination to do so, but it would please Aunt Beryl, and anything was better than to remain alone with one's thoughts and expose oneself perhaps to a more active realization of certain apprehended truths. Europe was at war. Jenny was going to be married, a mere baby, to a young Canadian who cared nothing for the traditions in which she had been brought up, who upheld her ungrateful defiance of her mother, and would, if he lived, take her right away. No one left. Natalie thinking of her husband and her boys, Lady Lucy thinking of her young grandson, the only male de Merrill left, gone into the fighting line, no one giving a thought to Lydia, save Lydia's racked and bewildered self. She shuddered involuntarily and rang the doorbell. Miss Nettleship? Will you step into the drawing room? said the maid. She preceded Lydia upstairs, pulling down the sleeves of her dress as she went. I'll tell Miss Nettleship if you'll take a seat. Lydia heard her clattering downstairs again. No doubt Miss Nettleship was in the basement, supervising the activities of a successor to someone whom she had invariably alluded to in the old days as poor old Agnes. Lydia actually smiled a little as her surroundings recalled old, forgotten details of the boarding-house life. The drawing-room was still furnished in yellow. The heavy gilding of the mirror over the mantelpiece seemed only slightly more chipped and tarnished. There was no fire, although it was cold. The smell of distant, greasy cooking still hung in the air. On a small shelf in a corner were some very dirty and tattered numbers of the ladies' realm, Molly Bond, devoid of the cover, and the novel written nearly twenty years ago by Lydia herself. Time worked very few changes at Miss Nettleship's house in Bloomsbury. Lydia looked up when the door of the drawing-room opened, feeling sure that she would have no difficulty in recognizing Miss Nettleship, although it was nearly six years since they had last met, on one of Lydia's infrequent expeditions to Regency Terrace. But in effect they were strangers to her who entered the room, although a curious sense of familiarity seemed to indicate that the type was not new to her. Both ladies were middle-aged, both looked pinched and cold and shabby, and both gave Lydia the same furtive, hesitating bow as they passed. They took their seats on either side of the empty grate and talked to each other in low, discontented murmurs. It's too bad not to have a fire a day like this, with the dining-room smoking so that one can't stay in the room. She said she'd have the fire in here lit after midday dinner. I thought I'd tell you, Mrs. Morrison, knowing how bad your chest has been, so that we could slip out of the dining-room early and get two nice chairs and keep warm all afternoon. Otherwise, we know who will get the best places. Oh, yes, it's always the same. Selfish, I call it. Thank you for the hint, Miss Perry. I shall make the most of it. I suppose it isn't anywhere near dinner-time yet. Oh, no, only just gone twelve. Is that all? I thought breakfast very poor this morning, didn't you? Downright robbery, considering the money we pay. It isn't at all the sort of thing I consider one has the right to expect in a residential private hotel, either. The porridge burnt. And all the toast finished if one's so much as five minutes late. Old Mr. Kinch thinks nothing of helping himself to two pieces at once. I've seen him do it. And one doesn't like to say anything. Certainly not. It isn't the food one cares about, but it's the principle of the thing. Miss Nettleship ought to stop it, you know. But, of course, there it is. He's a permanent let and doesn't care what he pays. Naturally, she won't risk losing him. Oh, naturally. Why, they say he thinks nothing of ordering in wine for himself and fruit out of season. 
Of course, it's good for the house, I suppose, seeing things delivered at the door like that from West End shops. Miss Forster, Mrs. Clarence, ancient Miss Lillicrap with her heart disease, the old forgotten ghosts all crowded back upon Lydia's memory. The dingy walls of the drawing-room had encompassed the same conversations about food and lack of warmth and grasping fellow boarders year in and year out. They say this war is going to affect the price of food, and there will be things we shan't be able to get any more. Ah, things we've been getting from Germany, I dare say that would be, vaguely, said the spinster Miss Perry. I should have thought we could make anything here that the Germans could make, I must say. Not at the price, though, said Miss Perry sagely. They've been making a regular business of cheap trades, you know. That's part of their cleverness. Ah, I dare say. They say the Kaiser had all this war planned out as far back as the old Queen's death. How he can sleep in his bed at night, I can't imagine. Perhaps he can't, said Miss Perry darkly. I couldn't, in his place, I know that. Oh, nor could I. The ladies fell silent, perhaps each imagining herself in the unenviable position of the potentate under discussion. Lydia felt sure that such a flight of fancy was well within the humorless capacity of each. When the door opened again and Miss Nettleship came in, very fat and panting a great deal, but otherwise unchanged, Miss Perry and Mrs. Morrison watched with furtive eagerness her enthusiastic greeting of Lydia, whilst pretending to conceal themselves behind the loose sheets of an illustrated paper. The uncertain movement made by Mrs. Morrison towards the door was forestalled by Miss Nettleship, however. Come into my room for a little chat, she begged Lydia. I've a sitting room now, besides the office. The sitting room was a small back bedroom hung with cheerful red twill curtains and almost entirely filled by an armchair and an old-fashioned sofa designated by its owner as the couch. Take the couch, won't you? It's a nice comfortable seat, and I'll have the room warm in a minute. Miss Nettleship knelt down upon the floor, not without difficulty, and applied a match to a small gas fire. A fierce yapping sound ensued, and then a pale blue flame appeared gradually extending the length of the grate, and began to glow, sending out an amount of heat that seemed to scorch up the air in the tiny room, in spite of the shallow pan of water standing just in front of the gate. Lydia, in a strange, detached way, reflected that it was a long while since she had sat in the dry, odorous heat of a gas fire. At Regency Terrace they made use of smoking coal. In Devonshire most of the hearths that she knew burnt sweet-smelling wood. Miss Nettleship assailed Lydia with a flood of eager and interested questions. She seemed to know by name and reputation everyone belonging to the family of Damerel, and inquired solicitously for Lady Lucy, anxious for news of her grandson and compassionately for his mother. At Lydia's reply, she nodded her head, fixing upon her round, absorbed brown eyes, and saying from time to time, "'Of course one sees how it is, Mrs. Damerel. I quite understand.' It all seemed curiously unchanged, even to Miss Nettleship's old phraseology. And Miss Nettleship's memory, she recalled names and incidents that seemed to Lydia to have been delved out of some other life, and all with a comfortable assurance that Lydia would remember even as she herself did. You'll want to hear of the people who were here in your time. Let me see now. Well, Miss Forster, then, of course. Did your auntie tell you about her? I remember I wrote to her about it when the accident happened. What accident? Oh, poor thing. She got run over in the street and died in hospital. About five years ago, it must have been. She'd left here, you know, and gone into rooms. But I went to the inquest, of course. Naturally, I did, said Miss Nettleship with mournful pride. She'd put on a lot of flesh, poor thing, and it was quite a shock to see how stout she'd grown. She often asked after you, you know. Lydia had not known. It surprised her again and again to hear of the extraordinary fidelity with which so many of these people, in their limited circles of interests, had remembered her. There was that old lady who had a weak heart, Miss Lillicrap. What happened to her? Poor Miss Lillicrap. She was old, you see, and ill, and one couldn't say much, but you know how it was. She lost me some very good boarders, said Miss Nettleship, shaking her head. It was always the same thing at the dinner table, you see, grumbling at the food and yet taking more than her fair share. 
I had to tell her that her room was wanted at last and she must leave. I never heard what happened to her, but she went away very angry and left a lot of extras unpaid. You wouldn't believe the way people think nothing of leaving their extras unpaid, Mrs. DeMerrill. Miss Nettleship sighed, and Lydia wondered if she was thinking of Margoliath. Let me see. Who else did you know? The Bolteels. Oh, yes. They went out to B.C., and I heard from Mrs. Bolteel once or twice. I believe the son, Mr. Hector, did very well out there. Mr. Bolteel died about ten years ago, but the widow and Mr. Hector stayed on in B.C. And talking of the colonies, there's someone you used to know gone out to Australia. Time does fly. It must be nearly five years since she was here. Who? A Mrs. Prince she was with a little boy. But she told me she'd known you before she married. It was remembering you that sent her here when she wanted rooms in London for a bit. Graham, her maiden name was. I don't remember. She was at a place of business on the West End. Elena's, it used to be called. It's changed hands now. Miss Nettleship delicately refrained from recalling Lydia's own connections with the shop. Rosie Graham, the little cashier. Lydia remembered well enough now. Of all those elusive figures that peopled the forgotten past, Rosie Graham had remained by far the most vivid. Oh, did she go to Australia, really? Why? She was married to an Australian. Ever such a nice fellow, said Miss Nettleship, her kind face beaming. They'd only been married a couple of years, and she wasn't very young by any means, but they were so happy together. It was a treat to see them. They'd a dear little child, too, and another one on the way. I got a card from her after they'd gone to Sydney, saying the baby was a girl. I never heard any more after that, but I'm sure they're happy. He was such a nice fellow, and they were so fond of each other. I'm glad she's happy, said Lydia, rather to her own surprise. I never imagined she would marry, though. I never knew she was engaged. Oh, she told me they hadn't been going together for very long before they got married. Quite well to do, he was, and she wouldn't have to go out to work, though I believe women in Israel do all their own housework always. But Mrs. Prince was as pleased as anything at going off to Sydney. I must say I do like to see what I call a real love match, said Miss Nettleship in a tone of satisfaction. Lydia looked at the stout, overworked woman with her graying hair and the wrinkles round her brown eyes. Those inexpressive, kindly eyes that actually seemed to look out with pleasure and interest still on a world that was narrowed to the dimensions of the Bloomsbury boarding house. As though in answer to her unspoken thought, Miss Nettleship turned to the eager expression of her own solicitude for Lydia and Lydia's concerns. Of course I've heard about your daughter going to be married. She does seem young, but that's the way nowadays, this war. But I hope you're pleased, Mrs. Demerell. He's a colonial, too, a Canadian, Lydia replied indirectly. So your auntie told me. Well, I'm sure he's very lucky, but he's out at the war with this machine of his, isn't he? It'll be hard for her to see him go off again after the wedding. Yes, for both of us. I've so wanted little Jenny to be happy. Miss Nettleship made a clicking sound with her tongue, expressive of sympathy. It is sad for these young people to start life like this. When one thinks of all the boys killed and wounded and the girls working so hard and losing their brothers and sweethearts and husbands. Oh, Mrs. Damerel, said Miss Nettleship earnestly, sometimes I've thought it hard to be all alone the way I am and just have myself to work for. But when I think of what the wives and mothers of our soldiers are going through, I realize that I may have been spared something I couldn't have borne, and I'm thankful to have things the way they are. So that was Maria Nettleship's unsubtle, uncomplicated point of view. She could be thankful because she was out of the swirling current of life's deepest emotions, safely set aside in undistinguished security upon the bank. Not for her the strange, twisted anguish with which Lydia resented the sight of even pain and renunciation in which she had no share. Not for her the envious craving to be once more in the grip of dramatic circumstances, to hold the center of the stage once more and garner experience wholesale, 
that might only be doled out grudgingly to a younger, more trivial generation. Lydia left Miss Nettleship feeling that she had received only one more proof that her own spirit stood in a very desert of isolation. They none of them understood, could ever understand. It seemed to her that she lacked even the words in which to make her misery clear to them. They none of them spoke the same language. For them, sacrifice meant personal suffering. For Lydia, it meant standing aside, being denied the importance of personal suffering and the exploitation of it. They thought that those were to be pitied who were bearing the brunt of pain and privation. But Lydia knew that the pity and the pride and the sympathy made up for all the pain and the privation. She clenched her hands and sweat broke out upon her forehead. In the losses of her childhood, the struggle of her girlhood, in her premature widowhood, had she ever suffered as she was suffering now, when no one recognized her claims to impassioned pity any more? Lydia knew that for the first time in all her life she was really suffering. She felt as though something within her were being killed by agonizing inches, something that would not die. If once it died, the suffering would be over, and she herself left shattered, no longer keenly sentient, but it would not die. She met Jenny and Roland at the station, and they got into the train together. On the journey, it penetrated to her understanding for the first time that the marriage was to take place on the next day, but one. Monday? That's the day after tomorrow. But Mama, Jenny gave her a quick alarmed glance, we always did say Monday, if it could be managed, and I asked Aunt Joyce to see if it would be all right about the church that day, and she wired back yes. I showed you the telegram yesterday evening. I'd forgotten, said Lydia. She saw Jenny look at Roland Valentine with a piteous, scared expression, and presently they began to talk in very low tones together, carefully avoiding a glance in her direction. She understood that something in her looks or her manner was making them anxious. Mama, Jenny whispered when they had at length reached Cliss Milton, and while Roland was in search of a missing suitcase, he won't come home with us. He's going straight to Quintmere, and we'll only meet at the church tomorrow, and when we go to Granny's for lunch, you and I will have the evening all by ourselves tonight. Jenny was trying to make up, evidently, for what she thought was her mother's pain at losing her. She was very gentle and quiet when they parted from Roland, who came with them no further than the threshold of Lydia's cottage. They'll put up the pony in the Quintmere stables for tonight, and we can drive it back after lunch tomorrow. The man will understand. We'll see you at church. Jenny slipped her hand into his. Lydia realized that they were foregoing some of their few hours together in order that she might have Jenny to herself for one evening. Good night, she said curtly, and then abruptly into the house, leaving them alone for their brief parting in the winter darkness. Jenny that evening seemed tired, and Lydia, in her own immense fatigue that was so infinitely more of the spirit than of the flesh, half unconsciously resented the slight, unwanted shadows beneath her daughter's eyes and the pallor of her young face. Why should Jenny, the invariably robust, elect to look tired tonight? Then Lydia remembered how much shopping and walking and traveling and interviewing had been crowded into the last two days for the girl unaccustomed to London, and her heart smote her. If Jenny's fatigue was physical, there was nothing to resent. She was entitled to it. Lydia followed her usual methods and said gently, Would you like your dinner in bed? I can bring it to you myself and sit with you afterwards. You are tired too, Mama, said Jenny quickly. Much more tired than I am, I think. Let's just have dinner early and then sit in the drawing room over the fire, all quiet and comfy, just you and me. She looked at her mother wistfully, as though seeking to make instinctive amends for she knew not what. During dinner they spoke of the wedding arrangements, of Jenny's hastily selected trousseau, and of the rooms secured by Lady Lucy at a North Devon fishing village for a brief honeymoon. Jenny grew excited. The slight look of strain left her round childish face, and she talked eagerly about her plans. I'll telegraph to you, Mama, what day I'm coming back here. Of course I shall go to London with Roland to, 
to see him off. Jenny's lips suddenly quivered at the allusion, and she talked faster than ever. And in the old, rather arrogant strain, as though to reassure herself by a display of great self-confidence. I don't know exactly what I shall do eventually, you know, Mama. I think I ought to find some war work, and Roland would like me to be in London, and, of course, it would be the best place in case he got wounded or when he gets leave. If you were working, you would be tied down to certain hours, I suppose, like your cousin Olive, said Lydia. You remember what she told us about her hospital. Oh, said Jenny airily, I'd stipulate all about that beforehand. There must be other work besides hospital work. Lydia could not help wondering for what work untrained, inexperienced Jenny thought herself fitted, and she knew that something of that wonder was showing in her face. I must learn to do things now, said Jenny, as though in an answer to Lydia's look and colouring hotly as she spoke. The defiant note had crept back into her voice, and the vexed consciousness of that animated Lydia's reply. Certainly. Up to now, I don't think you've been very willing to be taught, have you, Jenny? But you know that you can attend classes even down here, now that they're getting up so many of these Red Cross and other things. And if you want to learn practical, everyday usefulness, I could at least teach you housekeeping. Lydia was perfectly aware of forcing an issue, and some imperative desire to lessen the sudden tension of the atmosphere made her rise from the dinner table as she spoke. They went into the drawing-room in silence. When they were seated on either side of the fire, Jenny with empty hands, and Lydia stitching at the embroidery on some of Jenny's new underwear, Jenny suddenly spoke. She was never diplomatic, poor Jenny, and a far less acute hearer, and one much less familiar with her every intonation than was the observant Lydia, would have known that her hasty, nervously spoken speech was premeditated. Wouldn't it be rather fun, in a way, as I can't have a proper home of our own with Roland until the war is over, for me to find a tiny flat or something in London, and make it all nice, and live in it, and... And you could come up and stay with me, Mama, when you want a day or two in London. Is that your idea, or his? I suppose both of us planned it together. I wouldn't let Roland say anything to you about it. I wanted to tell you myself. Jenny looked at her mother with unconsciously imploring eyes that beseeched her to receive, at least in silence, a decision which both of them knew to be epic-making. But Lydia herself could no longer control the bitterness that had been swelling within her for many weeks. You'd rather live by yourself in London, in fact, and cope with difficulties of which you haven't the slightest idea, whilst I stay alone down here, then let us be together during these miserable times of anxiety? Naturally, with the understanding that I shouldn't dream of being there when there's the slightest chance of your having Roland at home. Is that it? Oh, Mama. But isn't that what you mean to tell me? Oh, don't, said Jenny miserably. Don't go on making exclamations that mean nothing. What you're really saying is that you don't want me to have anything to do with your new life, isn't it? Lydia's voice was iron. With every word, she was lashing at her own pain as well as at Jenny's, but some inner force beyond her own control was driving her on. I didn't say not anything to do with it, burst childishly from Jenny. But if it wasn't wartime, Roland and I would be going to Canada most likely, and then I'd have to leave you, and everybody would think it perfectly natural. You know they would. The cases are not parallel. I am not suggesting, and never should suggest, making a third in your married life. Those are not arrangements that can ever succeed from anyone's point of view. But you know perfectly well that the circumstances are not normal. Roland will be away from you until the war is over, and your natural home, the home of your childhood, is still here. I am still here to receive and care for you until you begin your real married life. However, you say you don't want that care and that shelter. You prefer to be alone in London and to let me be alone down here. The expression of Jenny's face whilst her mother was speaking had hardened from the pleading apprehension of giving pain into a sullen self-justification. 
The tone of her voice corresponded to her look when she spoke. "It isn't fair to talk like that, as if I was deserting you. I can't stay always tied to your apron strings, mama. In fact, even if I wasn't going to be married, I'd practically decided to go away and do some war work somewhere, whatever you said. Oh, can't you understand? When you were my age, you went away to London and worked, and there wasn't a war or anything then. The circumstances were very different, said Lydia coldly. I was living with an uncle and aunt, and expense was a very serious consideration to them. You know very well that everything I have in the world is yours, and that my only wish has been to take care of you and keep you good and well and happy. Then, said Jenny swiftly, you ought to be glad for me to do what I like, and, and what Roland and I both think is best for me. I've got to develop into a responsible grown-up person some time or other, I suppose, and how can I ever do it when all the time you're shielding me from everything, and only wanting me to be, as you say, good and happy, like a little baby? The irrepressible gibe sprung to Lydia's lips. That's what Roland Valentine has taught you to think? Jenny looked straight at her mother. He's given me the courage to say it she retorted in a voice as hard as Lydia's own. But I've been thinking it, and feeling it, for years and years, and I've been miserable at home. The unforgettable words that could never be unsaid had been spoken between them. In a flash of unutterable misery, Lydia knew that it was too late for the self-control, the pity, the abnegation, that might have saved the final open contest that never now could be as though it had not been. As though the veritable physical abyss yawned between them, the mother and daughter stared at one another aghast, with wretched, incredulous unhappiness. The lines of Jenny's young face broke first, and she burst into pitiful, tempestuous sobbing and crying. Mama, Mama, forgive me. I didn't mean it. Oh, don't look like that. I was wicked and ungrateful. I didn't mean it. I'll do anything you like. But Lydia knew that her belated victory held for her no promise of good. All night long she lay open-eyed and tearless, and, for a long while she could hear at intervals from the bedroom next to her own, the muffled sounds of Jenny's unrestrained, childish crying. End of Chapter 28 Recording by C.J. Plogue Chapter Twenty Nine of The Heel of Achilles by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What have you been doing to Jenny? asked Joyce Damerel next morning, in her manner that so oddly mingled disagreeableness with a sort of friendly interest. Lydia was not in the least surprised by the question. Her own wakeful and wretched night had left no such traces as were plainly to be seen in the unaccustomed rings around Jenny's eyes, and the heavy, swollen look of young eyelids unused to tears and to vigils alike. Jenny must have been crying almost all night. She got overtired in London, Lydia said unemotionally. She was thoroughly upset last night. Poor little thing. Joyce sought for no further explanation. It was evident. But Lydia knew quite as well as though she had been within earshot of the lovers, what had been Roland Valentine's first startled inquiry when he and Jenny met outside the church porch. And after the two had walked across the fields together to Quintmere, whither Lady Lucy drove Lydia, she was aware of a new hostility in Roland Valentine's manner to herself. The words of the night before, Lydia told herself with a strange apathy, were destined to echo long and far. She wondered dully how they had come to speak them. Why she, with her lifelong instincts of self-control, had madly, at this eleventh hour, brought about a crisis that Jenny, the child, had so obviously tried to avert. Her perceptions were so dulled by the suffering of the last few months, culminating into the breaking point of yesterday, that she heard hardly anything of the conversation at lunch and herself took part in it quite automatically. 
It seemed to her that Lady Lucy looked at her compassionately once or twice. "This is a trying time for you, my dear," said the old lady kindly, when they found themselves alone together in the drawing room later on, "but you must think of dear little Jennie's happiness, and trust that the Infinite Mercy will bring her husband back to her at the end of this cruel war." Lydia smiled faintly, listening to the gentle plati tudes that were the means of expression most natural to Lady Lucy's spirit of quiet fortitude. She thought that the turbulent depths of her own wretchedness could never be even apprehended by her mother-in-law. Without being aware of it, however, Lydia had reached those last outposts of endurance when mental anguish must have the relief of speech or plunge into the abyss of madness. Because she could bear Lady Lucy's kindly, simply commonplaces no longer, Lydia announced a sudden intention of walking home. Before tea, protested Lady Lucy, I couldn't hear of it, my dear. Besides, the Kennedys are coming up this afternoon, and the dear old rector. Quite suddenly, the remembrance flashed across Lydia of the day that she had first told Natalie and her husband of Roland Valentine and his pretensions to become engaged to Jenny. The Kennedys had been thinking only of the war then, and of their own two boys. They cared little enough for Jenny's romance, but still less for Lydia's state of mind on the subject. But the rector had looked at her. Lydia remembered the look with odd distinctness, and the impression of an understanding almost apprehensive in its completeness that it had produced upon her. She had hardly seen the rector since that day. Had he perhaps understood? I should like to see Mr. Palmer and Natalie, she murmured mechanically. Oh, yes, and besides, you must drive back. The pony and cart are ordered for five o'clock, as I thought you would want Jenny to be early. Poor little girl. She looks pale and tired today, but I'm sure that's very natural. Even in ordinary times, a girl is apt to look worn out with all the excitement and the preparations just before the wedding. Lady Lucy talked on, and Lydia stared out of the window. It was a bleak, windy day, with scudding clouds flying across a dark sky. Perhaps they would say it was too cold for the rector to be out of doors, and Natalie and her husband would come alone. If so, Lydia felt that her last hope would have failed her. She looked at the clock. It was not quite yet three, and they would probably not arrive before four o'clock. Waiting had become unendurable. Where is Joyce? she asked, wondering if it could be borne where she obliged to sit tete-a-tete -tete for another whole hour with the old lady, who would resent any pretense at reading when she was desirous of talking about the morrow's wedding. I think she went to see about poor little Solomon, my dear. You know Solly feels the cold weather now he's getting to be an old dog. Joyce has had his basket put by the fire in the housekeeper's room. We've got some stuff for his poor eyes, and he can't bear anyone but Joyce to put it on. The placid old voice rambled on and on. It seemed to Lydia ages and ages before she ventured again to look at the clock. It must have stopped. The hands didn't even yet indicate three o'clock. That clock is fast, my dear, said Lady Lucy. It isn't more than a quarter to three, I feel sure. This new man comes up from the village on Saturdays, now doesn't seem to understand the clocks in the same way that young Davy did. You know young Davy is actually at the front now. His mother had a field postcard last week. Everything crossed out except I'm quite well. You've seen those curious printed field postcards, I suppose, haven't you? The sound of Colonel Kennedy's newly acquired two-seater was heard outside quite early in the afternoon, long before four o'clock. Nevertheless, it seemed to Lydia that she had lived through a lifetime of waiting that afternoon. The quivering nerves of her mind, wrenched to the point of uttermost tension, had with almost irrational intensity fixed upon speech with old Mr. Palmer as the one forlorn hope of relief. She clenched her hands upon the arms of her chair while the sounds of arrival in the hall outside penetrated to the drawing-room. "'How nice and early they are,' said Lady Lucy. "'Will you ring the bell, my dear? Natalie will be glad of some tea after that cold drive. I'm sure her father won't have ventured out of doors in such an east wind.' Lydia cast upon her a look of affrighted anguish. 
What did her mother-in-law mean by so calm a prophecy of a disaster that now presented itself to Lydia's disordered perceptions as one of almost incredible magnitude? The door opened and Natalie came into the room with Joyce Damerel. Colonel Kennedy alone followed them, and the door shut behind him. The rector had not come. Father was disappointed, but we didn't dare to risk it. The wind has gone right round to the east. He wanted so much to see Jenny, too, Lydia, but he wouldn't run the chance of catching cold before the wedding. My dear, the church looks lovely. They've decorated it all. Where's Jenny? They're both in the library, said Lady Lucy with a significant smile. Oh, well, we shall see them presently. I suppose all the preparations are finished, Lydia? You look very tired. Was there a great deal to do? Quite a lot, said Lydia, and smiled faintly. They went on talking all around her. Colonel Kennedy spoke about the war news, and the others listened to him anxiously, with the deference accorded to the opinion of an old soldier. News of Billy Damerel and of Alec and Charlie Kennedy was exchanged between Joyce and Natalie. Old Lady Lucy talked about the family of Belgian refugees installed in the village. Poor things! One was so dreadfully sorry for them, and still is, but they are very difficult to please. The mother and the aunt quarrel terribly, and the aunt wants to be sent somewhere else. How do you find yours, Natalie? Not at all easy to manage, either. They grumbled so at having to drink tea that the committee has had to arrange a special supply of coffee for them. And Monsieur Mertens came up the other day and told us it was such a bad coffee that it was making his wife ill. He said she was an arvia passable, but Dr. West couldn't find anything wrong with her. That's just it. One of ours, that young chemist from Antwerp, says he spits blood up every night and is going to die but he seems as well as possible. I suppose, said Colonel Kennedy tritely, that we have the worst specimens over here. The decent ones, the men, at all events, are fighting. Lydia heard it all without attending to it. So many similar conversations had been held at Quintmere and elsewhere since the war. Tea was brought, and Jenny and Roland Valentine came in together, and the talk was then altogether of the wedding. It seemed that, for Jenny's sake, everyone was anxious not to recall the war by the mention of anything connected with it. It's so nice that you should have it here, Jenny, and not in London. Everyone's so pleased that you've decorated the church. We looked in as we came up to leave some flowers. Have you any more presents, Jenny? Some lovely cut glass from Rollins' aunt in Oxford. It's in the library. Grandmama is letting me have everything sent here. I can pack it all up myself and send it anywhere you like afterwards, said Lydia, almost from force of habit. She saw herself toiling over the wearisome task when Jenny had left her, gone away to her new life. We can all help, said Joyce Demerel briskly. Or perhaps Jenny would like her things to stay here until she comes to fetch them herself. With the faintest possible start, Lydia realized the intention, hostile to herself, of the little speech. Joyce had never liked her. I think we ought to start, she said suddenly. Natalie, will your father be in if I go round that way? Natalie looked rather surprised. Oh, yes. Shall I take a message, Lydia, if it's anything about tomorrow? Lydia heard herself utter a disagreeable laugh. No, it's nothing to do with Jenny, or with Jenny's concerns. I want to speak to the rector. She could not herself have told when the wish had crystallized into a determination. "'Will you ring Roland, if you please,' said Lady Lucy quietly, "'and order the pony-cart to be brought to the door?' When they left Quintmere, the old lady solemnly kissed and blessed her granddaughter, and Joyce, most undemonstrative of women, put her arms around the girl for a moment. Natalie, her soft blue eyes full of ready emotional tears, let them fall unabashed, as she said, smiling, Till tomorrow, Jenny, darling. No one gave a thought or a look to Lydia, except Roland Valentine, and his eyes were like steel. You can drive, Jenny. The girl took up the reins. Do you really want to go all that way round by the Kennedys, Mama? She asked presently. Yes, I do, Lydia replied with a stubborn inflection in her voice that she herself heard with surprise. 
It was as though any questioning of that decision would rouse in her a veritable frenzy, but Jenny made no attempt to question it. They drove almost in silence. I'll wait outside with the pony, or shall I come in? Jenny asked rather timidly. Wait? No, don't wait. It's cold. Drive on, and leave the pony at the inn, as usual, and go home as quick as you can. I'll walk. Oh, Mama, What's the matter? Lydia asked sharply. Won't you be tired? No, said Lydia inflexibly. She always disliked any display of thoughtfulness or anxiety on her behalf from Jenny. It seemed somehow to minimize her own self-abnegating maternity and to assert on Jenny's part an unfounded claim to maturity. Then please come back fairly early. It'll be our last evening, at least the last before tomorrow, Jenny pleaded confusedly. The personal claim Lydia could not only tolerate, but it touched her strongly and suddenly. Yes, yes, my darling, go home now. The words seemed to break up some constriction that had hitherto bound her, and even as she watched Jenny turn the pony's head obediently and heard the sounds of the wheels recede, Lydia became aware that a violent rush of uncontrollable tears suddenly threatened her. Is the rector in, Alice? She asked the maid, and heard with horror the quivering of her own voice. The rector was in the study. Lydia had only to cross the hall and open the familiar door, but before she entered the little lamp-lit room her face was drenched with tears. She pulled down her veil in desperation. Lydia! said the old rector in pleased surprise. Then his face altered pitifully. What? Who is it? He stammered. Not Natalie. Not one of the boys. No, no, only myself. It's nothing. I mean, nothing has happened. Only I can't bear things any longer. I thought perhaps you'd understand. I had to speak to someone. The sound of her own incoherence by its very unfamiliarity served to destroy Lydia's last defences. She sank into a chair and wept, wildly and bitterly, as she had never in all her life wept before. The rector stood still for a moment and looked at her, and then walked slowly with a careful gait of age and obesity to the door. "'Alice!' Lydia heard him call. "'Alice! I am engaged with Mrs. Damerel, and do not wish to be disturbed. Please tell Colonel and Mrs. Kennedy when they come in.' Thank you, Alice. He closed the door and came slowly and carefully back again to his seat in front of the writing table. His attitude was one familiar to Lydia, and indeed to all those who knew him. One knee crossed over the other, his hands lightly joined together, his chair turned sideways to the light that fell from the little reading lamp, upon his thin gray hair and kind, simple face that held little of learning or of great shrewdness. Lydia had never looked upon him as a very wise old man. He had lived in her house for a number of years, had been often unpunctual and untidy, and always apologetic for both failings, and also always grateful to her for letting him remain on in his old home after it had virtually become hers and Clement's. He had spoiled Jenny and his own grandchildren when they came home from India, and his weakness and lack of judgment had often made Lydia's work with Clement in the parish unnecessarily difficult. Lydia, in common with everyone else, had often said of him, The rector really is a saint, too good for this world. She had only meant that the old man was unpractical, behind the times, and yet too well-meaning and conscientious to be unkindly criticized by anyone. She had never sought spiritual counsel of him, it was not in her nature to feel any need of such a thing, and although she would have thought it wrong, without analyzing wherein the wrong would lie, to omit any of the customary religious exercises to which she had been brought up, it never in her life occurred to her, and would not occur now, to connect what she supposed to be religion with such an emotional crisis as she was at present passing through. As to many another before her, the one was a poignant and present reality, the other a meaningless convention that slipped away with all other conventions when the bedrock of life was touched. It was not for the possible comfort or guidance to be found in religion that she had come to the rector, whose halting, 
in eloquent sermons she knew almost as well as she did himself she had come merely because the breaking point had been reached there was no one to understand and her wild forlorn last hope centred on this old man from whom she had never heard a word of condemnation of any one end of chapter twenty nine recording by c j plogue chapter thirty of the heel of achilles by e m delafield this librivox recording is in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org poor child poor dear child said the rector i'm so miserable cried lydia like an unhappy child yes yes is it about little jenny she answered brokenly and with incoherent vehemence the accumulated suffering of the past months finding vent in disconnected words and sobbing elliptical phrases she scarcely knew what she said jenny was going away from her marrying a man who hated her mother and who thought and was teaching jenny to think that all her life she had been tyrannized over roland valentine had said outright that lydia had made jenny afraid of her joyce had been cruel too she had accused lydia of not knowing what love meant and having disappointed clement and done her best to spoil jenny's life no no my poor child she said i wanted the bow roll for myself always that i would only let jenny have little trivial things that i grudged her the experience of reality lydia broke off and gazed at the old man with terrified eyes seeing no protesting denial in his face it's the tendency of us all he said dreamily we grudge the young folk the privilege of suffering and learning we seek to shelter them for the sake of our own peace of mind and call it devotion but but stammered lydia to love any one is to want to protect them to save them from pain to bear it instead i have loved jenny god knows i do love her my care for her and over anxiety and perhaps over solicitude have all been love love said the rector in the same dreamy monotonous voice as of one voicing a conviction too intimate for vehement upholding love is suffering whether it is love for man or woman or child for husband or wife little child or dear friend always remember that lydia love is suffering in this life it is only afterwards when we have mastered the truth and accepted all that it implies that no doubt there is some further stage undreamed of by poor humanity when the suffering is all transmuted and love becomes joy slowly a dim understanding of the words seemed to come to lydia oddly and not irrelevantly she remembered once more the pronouncement of the little girl who had worked with her in a london shop twenty years earlier you've never cared for anyone when you do love somebody you won't know how to set about it was she learning now for the first time no longer wrenched by the hard sobs of her despair she continued to gaze at the old unlearned man so much less well equipped for life than she had seemed to be herself do you know my dear said the rector in a tone of gentle narrative what always strikes me as the most sublime illustration of the true love that is suffering one has seen it reproduced in roman catholic churches although i do not know if they give it any special significance it is generally only one of many little pleasures placed around the church and it represents the virgin mary's meeting with her son on his way to mount calvary lydia felt bewildered and almost disappointed did the consciousness of his profession oblige the rector to try and turn her thoughts thus here was no revealing formula such as she had half hoped might throw a new light on all that perplexed and tortured her but merely the old allusion to the great figure of christianity that for lydia held no real relation to the problems of life it isn't religion i want she said dully i believe in it all of course but it doesn't seem to help me now in this lydia my dear child said the rector in a tone that seemed to hold a little surprised admonition i am not in the pulpit i am not speaking as a priest 
nor at this moment am I urging upon you the consolations of religion. Later on you will seek and find for yourself, perhaps. I am not asking you to look at the Divine Lord, but at the human Christ, and at his human mother. Think of them as two figures of mythology, if you will, or as two figures in some great tragedy of which we have all read and ask yourself if there could have been such suffering without such love such love without such suffering he looked at her fixedly for a moment and then went on speaking very slowly as though giving her time to form to herself some mental image from each of his halting phrases think of that meeting between mary of bethlehem and her son to her he must have been still the little child of nazareth for whom she had no doubt done everything that other mothers do for their little children whom she had loved and guarded and cherished whom she had lain in the tiny poor little manger at bethlehem whom she had carried before her on the back of the ass during the flight into egypt safe in her arms during the three years of his ministry no doubt they were much separated said the rector in the same simple narrative manner but there must have been many times when he came back to her for instance they were together for the festival at the marriage of cana she knew about his work and i feel sure that they talked about it all together think my dear what it must have been to a mother to meet her son like that on his way to be tortured and put to death like a malefactor the blood and the sweat all streaming down his face and carrying on his shoulders that heavy cross she must have felt then that it would be a million times easier to suffer it all herself don't you think it would have hurt her far less surely and she went up the hill too my dear and stood by the cross and saw it all i trust that there is nothing irreverent in the idea that her suffering must have surpassed christ's one knows very well said the old rector that it is less painful to endure bodily anguish than to watch it endured by one's beloved lydia uttered a stifled startled cry but that is love to find it easier to endure one's self than to let one's beloved endure it is a stage of love the rector acquiesced gently and beyond that asked lydia fearfully beyond that there is a greater immolation that of relinquishing the privilege of suffering to another and accepting the pain of watching that suffering there is a certain strong sense of inner conviction that strikes with a pang as that of birth through the very soul and which is experienced but once or twice in a lifetime such a pang struck through lydia now it was this then that they had all been trying in their varying degrees to tell her jenny with her inarticulate struggling rebelliousness that held all the blundering ungraciousness of a young blind thing still unaware of its own objective roland valentine with his strong personal resentment on behalf of his love and his hard new world standards of independence joyce damerel with her narrow inflexible judgments and personality antagonistic to lydia's old lady lucy with the conventional shibboleths of her creed and her generation that yet stood for selflessness and high courage aunt beryl with her simple matter-of-fact statement of a truth evidently accepted by her without question jenny has to live her own life it's more sacrificing yourself that i meant sacrificing your own feelings like they had all meant the same thing even silly ill-advised aunt evelyn grumbling at the tardy independence of her middle-aged daughter and yet acquiescing in it with the rueful finality we must just make the best of our shelf now we're on it even when incredibly enough poor forgotten unaltered maria nettleship with her uneloquently expressed realization of having been spared the strange paradoxical immeasurable suffering of love that in the ultimate analysis meant the relinquishment of suffering to the beloved that is all my dear said the rector gently lydia had heard nothing of what he had been saying although she had been aware of the kindly monotonous old voice talking on and on in careful halting sentences her every faculty had been absorbed in the tardy revelation that was at length hers 
as her mental equilibrium slowly swung back to its habitual poise once more the fundamentally practical outlook that would always be lydia's asserted itself but it's too late now jenny is going away from me tomorrow tomorrow repeated the rector almost maunderingly voices became audible in the hall outside and lydia knew that the kennedys had returned she could even conjecture from the murmur of the maid alice's voice that the rector's message had been given to them the sounds dispersed and ceased altogether i must go said lydia you have been so good to me i was nearly mad when i came i think i can be braver now i can be brave tomorrow tomorrow said the rector again let tomorrow be jenny's day some glimmering of his meaning brought a flash of irrepressible resentment into the inquiry of lydia's gaze my dear child my dear lydia said the old man apologetically let little jenny have the foreground tomorrow let hers be the bravery and the sacrifice and the sorrow and the gladness it need matter to no one what anybody else feels or has to undergo it need distract no attention from the child let it said the rector pleadingly let it all form a background lydia understood there was a conscious relinquishment a displayed self-abnegation that would infallibly attract the sympathy and the compassion of all and the compassion of all but the ultra critical that might not be hers very tentatively perhaps guided more by instinct than by full awareness the rector was pointing out to her the infinitely subtle atonement that might yet be hers tomorrow her wedding day to be solely jenny's after all lydia reflected with that strange clarity of mind that sometimes follows upon the extreme physical exhaustion induced by violent and unaccustomed emotion those tomorrows when her daily life would be linked with jenny's might be few indeed now if the future was to hold crisis again for jenny as who could doubt it might well be that she would choose to encounter her experiences alone let tomorrow be jenny's as nothing in her young life had yet been hers and again another echo of words long since uttered by a more cynical less kindly voice than that of the rector brought a shadowy smile that held no mirth to lydia's lips as she walked home through the darkness grandpapa who knew had called her a situation snatcher again and again the strange expression grotesque to the verge of anticlimax haunted lydia she thought of it as she entered her own house and heard the exclamations of the servant susan oh ma'am we've been wondering where you was miss jenny been in quite a way it's past dinner time and knowing you were walking i was detained at mrs kennedy's said lydia briefly jenny ran out of the drawing-room oh mamma i'm glad you've come i was getting so worried thinking of you out in the cold jenny stopped nervously and Lydia knew intuitively that she was remembering her mother's old, implied claim to be the sole prerogative for all such expressions of concern. I stayed longer than I meant to with the rector. He sent you his love. Did he? Shall we have dinner now, Mamma? Or are you going to change? I'll change, said Lydia, and went slowly upstairs. She carefully removed the traces of weeping from her face before she came down again the short evening was a very quiet one in the drawing-room jenny sat with her cheek resting upon her hand gazing into the fire once she said rather timidly the packing is all finished susan and i put the things into my dressing-bag when i came in this afternoon it's a beautiful bag said lydia absently the dressing-bag had been roland valentine's gift she remembered that she herself had been secretly disappointed at the time of her marriage because no one had given her such a thing and she possessed only the plain wooden hair-brushes and clothes-brush and the celluloid comb that had figured upon her makeshift dressing-table at miss nettleship's boarding-house and then uncle george had given her a cheque 
privately and almost shamefacedly explaining that it had nothing whatever to do with the three-tiered silver cake stand that was to figure at the wedding as the joint offering of himself and aunt beryl it was merely a trifle that he could well afford with which to supplement her trousseau and lydia remembered that in her estimation the word trousseau had immediately become stretched as to include the smallest and neatest of silver fitted dressing bags the very next day she had successfully found and purchased the treasure she generally had succeeded lydia reflected dispassionately there's no such thing as can't had been another of grandpapa's aphorisms and his descendant for many years of her life had triumphantly proved the axiom in her own person she had made people like and admire her she had profited to the full of educational advantages she had found work and successfully achieved it had extricated herself unscarred and unblemished from various minor encounters had made a marriage such as might well have seemed unattainable to lydia raymond working in madame elena's shop and even greater achievement had adequately filled the place open to her by that marriage the record was to end there it seemed lydia felt as utterly incapable of envisaging the rest of her life the complete aloneness that seemed suddenly to have revealed itself to her as of speaking aloud her thoughts to jenny motionless beside her they talked very little and it seemed to lydia only of trivialities although it was evident that jenny attached some importance to her speculations as to the morrow's weather the seating capacity of the little church the extent to which choir and organist would do credit to the parish i do want it all to be perfect was jenny's candid aspiration i hope it will be said lydia tonelessly are you very happy jenny yes said jenny simply her gray eyes ecstatic then she looked at her mother and added wistfully i should be perfectly happy if if only you were too lydia smiled faintly she thought that she could appraise at its true value jenny's obvious afterthought her fatigue was almost overwhelming and to her own surprise she slept heavily all through the night then it was jenny's wedding day a clear gray day without sunshine and without wind surprisingly enough lydia felt one went through it with very little feeling of any kind the emotion that struck most sharply at her consciousness was one of surprise that so long a waiting so many preparations should have culminated only in so brief an apotheosis the wedding was over before she had adjusted herself to the expected paying of it and actually very little impression of it all remained with her the odd epithet that had rung in her ears since the day before rang there still meaningless and yet strangely expressive situation snatcher it even mingled senselessly in the farewells that rang all around her when jenny jenny valentine took her leave of them all with her husband good-bye good luck good-bye dear aunt joyce grandmamma everybody i'll see you all again in a little while good-bye roland take care of her i will ma'am you may be sure of that roland was bending over old lady lucy's hand look here dear i won't want to hurry you but you've only just time colonel kennedy of course always a victim to train fever oh the bride flung her arms around her mother's neck it's only for a week mamma she whispered consolingly thank you for giving me such a lovely wedding the chauffeur started the engine of the waiting motor car and its throbbing broke on the air and caused jenny to detach her clasp from her mother but she still faced lydia with a pleading puzzled look her eyes tearful but lurking in their gray depths an unconquerable joyousness i must say something lydia reflected desperately dully astonished at her sudden inability to find any words at all a situation snatcher no no the foolish term was an obsession she had not been that not now she bent forward and kissed jenny once more good-bye my child you'll write the chauffeur held the door of the car open and jenny's foot was on the step she was within it and her husband was beside her 
leaning across him her fresh face at the lowered window her bare hand with the new wedding ring gleaming upon it grasped the door a sense of wrenching open as of vistas of finality suddenly dispersed lydia's apathy and at the agonizing glimpse of her own bereft and isolated future she found as the car began to move slowly from the door the habitual instinctive self-expression that alone could drug her misery good-bye jenny i'll see to everything don't worry about letters or packing i'll do it all for you whilst you're away jenny is still waving cried joyce damerel and waved back again vigorously but at the same instant lady lucy laid her tremulous old hand upon lydia's gazing at her compassionately and natalie kennedy exclaimed aloud turning towards her oh poor lydia the scattered groups of relatives and friends coalesced surrounding her end of the heel of achilles by e m delafield recording by c j plogue